Hey guys, it's been a while since we've added to this particular series because this series of uh, Free Grace Your Studies Lordship Salvation is the one that began with uh, us evaluating MacArthur's Gospel According to Jesus because that was the first paper interactive critique that I had to write for class. Uh, that was the first book I had to write over. And then after that, it was Ryrie. And then after that, it was Bean's Lordship Salvation. And then now it's Zane Hodges' Absolutely Free. Well, while I've been in the process of writing this Absolutely Free paper, uh, you know, we've been doing the readings as well. I uh, started thinking about how Zane Hodges responded to MacArthur in the Gospel According to Jesus. Let me turn the beat down a little bit. It kind of sounds loud. So, I uh, was thinking about, you know, what he did to respond. And Zondervan, at the time, wanted him to do a point-by-point a -point response to MacArthur. But Zane Hodge didn't want to. He wanted to uh, make something more lasting. You know, rather than just refuting MacArthur, he wanted to take on the bigger issue of Lordship Salvation. And so... So when Zane Hodges wrote, as I'm writing my critique on Zane Hodges, I'm thinking about, okay, what was he reacting to? What moves did he make? What did, what route did he choose not to take? And then what I'm thinking about is the book Gospel uh, of Doubt that Wilkin wrote that was a point-by-point -point response to uh to uh, uh, MacArthur's Gospel According to Jesus. However, from what I'm seeing, that structure of that book was a response to um, the 2008 anniversary edition of Gospel According to Jesus. So in other words, the structure was different than what Zane Hodges had. So I'm like, okay, well, whenever I was doing my paper on the Gospel According to Jesus, I initially started out with the Logos edition. And the Logos edition is basically like the second revision. So what that essentially means is that it didn't have the structure that Wilkin later on responded to. Even though I had read uh, the 2008 edition, probably around 2010, uh, I didn't have it when I was writing my paper initially. But I ended up getting it in, in uh, Kindle. So what I want to do to try to help myself write my paper with the absolutely free Zane Hodges is I want to immerse myself in how MacArthur started out his book and how Wilk encounters the book. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to primarily focus on Wilkins' contribution. Uh, but I just want to show you all some things, why I'm actually saying the structure is different. And, and it'll be clearly apparent to you all. So if, if you look at the gospel according to Jesus, right? Let's go to the table of contents. You got these four words. Packer, voice, revised edition, first edition. Okay. And then you got these chapters. Part one, a look at the issues. Part two, Jesus, heralds the gospel. Okay. Now I'm going to put in, the, see, I noticed I got the word slave point, put it in here or put in here. And nothing's showing up except further on in the book. But watch what happens whenever I pull up the 2008 edition. Of how MacArthur uh, starts out his book. So he's got the cha his chapter. I'll show you the contents again. So you got the preface, you know, and all that. And he's updating. He's got the first chapter. What does it mean when he says, follow me? Well, in this one. We go back up to here. See? It starts out with a look at the issues. So, what you'll notice is in this, what does it mean to follow me section? 
he starts out talking about Jesus is Lord. Uh, and shortly after, he starts talking about Lord. And the opponent starts talking about that. And then he starts using Dula, slave. Okay? None of this is in the first edition. So, um... Watch how Wilkin and them respond to this. Okay, it's going to give you a little bit of introduction up front, and uh, you can actually—I'll go ahead and show you this. If you go to YouTube and type "Gospel of Doubt." You'll see this playlist right here. Gospel of Doubt, a chapter by chapter response to John MacArthur's Gospel According to Jesus. So you notice all the way through. So what we're fixing to do has has already been done by them in a more succinct form, okay? But that's not going to help me write my paper. But this is more information you can go into and study yourself, comparing it to what I'm doing. Okay? Now, for their book. So they title it The Gospel of Doubt, The Legacy of John MacArthur's Gospel According to Jesus. The Mac is back. Yeah, The Return of the Mac. <laughs> um... Legacy of John MacArthur's Gospel According to Jesus. So let's let's see how they start out. The Legacy of John... Here we go. This was written in 2015. See? Book and cover designed by Sean Lazar. Notice it follows chapter by chapter the same structure that uh, it... That MacArthur's book. In fact, you'll see in a minute they say that it's expected that um, you have gospel according to Jesus in your hand when you're reading this. So look at this. This book is dedicated to the partners of Great Evangelical Society. I'm gonna put my rapper voice on, guys, or at least my cadence. Like getting in small band, we are not a large group. However, we're united in our commitment to the real gospel according to Jesus. Special thanks to Brad Jusco who spent untold hours editing the proof of the manuscript. Though he's a CPA, he's also a gifted theologian and editor. He helped improve the tone, style, and readability of the book. Sean Lazar made terrific suggestions and was excellent in the editing and proof of uh, rates. Kyle, Kyle Meyer, two caught lots of errors and improved the style of the book significantly. Pastors Paul Carpenter and Joe Lombardi all, also both carefully reviewed the entire manuscript and made many helpful suggestions. So, you know... Writing's hard, guys, and so you need people reviewing and critiquing your stuff to make it harder, to make it better. I also dedicate this book to... Check this out, guys. This is pretty cool. Uh, you know, I also dedicate this book to John MacArthur and his many ministries. Grace Community Church, Grace to You, the Master's College, and the Master's Seminary. While I disagree with you strongly on the gospel of the Lord Jesus uh, preached, I very much approve of the conservative stance you take on inerrancy, the role of woman, verse by verse, exposition, creation, and the young earth, the lordship of Christ, and much more. All right. So imagine this: you're dropping a diss track against an argument, and you say, "This this is dedicated to my opponent." <laughs> you know what I mean? That's pretty deep. Um, my this is what he says. My hope. Is that you will return to the faith you had before you studied the Puritans in 1980. I also hope those in your church and schools will come back to the actual gospel. One second, I got. Uh, all right, come back to the actual gospel according to Jesus. Regeneration by faith alone in Christ alone, apart from works before or after the new birth. Introduction. David versus Goliath, Auburn versus Alabama, Ali versus Foreman, Coyote versus Roadrunner. If you're expecting this book to be an all-out take no prisoners competition with MacArthur, then think again. It's first and foremost a search for truth. 
This book is a written to smear John MacArthur. He holds biblical positions on many important issues such as inerrancy. I either view the Bible has no errors or any kind in it. Traditional marriage. First by verse, expository preaching, cessationism, the view that sign gifts are not operating today, young earth creation, i.e. the view that the earth and man were created around uh, 4,200 years, the universe, uh, 40, I'm sorry, 4,200 BC, the universal noic flood, not regional flood only, male leadership in the home and local church, elder rule, etc. So he's starting out like you should, uh, a critique that we were taught to write in seminary with given the things that you like, the things that you commend a person for. Hey, Josie, this is off topic. Do you know what the significance of Jacob Flatter is to wisdom for us? Uh, okay, so when you're talking about Jacob's ladder, it's referred to the fact that there's angels ascending and descending. If I remember right, it, it shouldn't be translated as ladder. It's more like a slope, like sort of like how they had like with ziggurats. And uh, uh, basically, it indicates access to God, provision, and all of that. As far as wisdom, it sounds like you're getting exposed to some Kabbalah stuff. The Kabbalah tree, the, the word Hakma and Bina, understanding, and, and all of that. Hopefully, you're not exposed to some of the other stuff that mixes it in with the chakras and, and all of that New Age type stuff as well. But... The answer is, go look at Nathaniel uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John. Nathaniel was underneath the fig tree contemplating about the kingdom. And he was an Israelite in whom there was no guile, which is a pun on Jacob because his name means deceit and all of that. And so just like the Jacob's Ladder story idea there, hey, Asavoko, just like the Jacob's Ladder idea, you have that idea there. And so you... Nathaniel was underneath the fig tree contemplating. Um, some people believe that's where you would go to think about the kingdom. So if you want to make a principle about wisdom, you could say this, that if you desire wisdom, you must meditate on the revelation of God's word, what, what it says and what the implications of it, what might be, because that's what he was doing. And specifically... I did that. I was wondering if the teacher was sound. Uh, uh, it's Hakma, not Chakma. That sounds like you're mixing chakras with Hakma. But yeah, um, we'll talk more about it offline. But yeah, we we fixing to hit five thousand. Um, very soon. So I thank God for that. All right, so. What is Sawako? You can debate him soon. Yes, oh, Charlie Michaels. And you know what's funny? In his video, he made a video response today. And he's trying to say, if I really have 5,000 subscribers, they're probably just Filipinos looking for romantic relationships. And think about this, Sawako. <laughs> Why are you saying that? <laughs> Cause he, cause he thinks that I got the Filipino audience. So let the record show before we go any further. Right, right. Did you see that? No, not yet. See that only, is only, only Indian. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. So I'm going to take a moment. Charlie Michaels is lordship, so we are studying him and his dumb arguments. Before we get back yeah, to this, Josie said, Tell us, this is off topic. Do you know what the significance of Jacob's? I, I've already, I already, I've already addressed it, Asawako. Thank you. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Janet's still waking up. Okay, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna uh, just just a little bit because I'm 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 doing a lot for today because kids were coming today this yeah. afternoon, so I still have little uh, time for you this time. A little time for me this time. Got you. All right. So, guys, what you're looking at right now are <laughs> Janet Mitchell, right? Wait, wait, wait. Beloved Joseph said, in a Philippine looking for love. <laughs> yeah. All right. Meet your mic. It, it is funny, but please meet your mic because there is an echo. Okay. So, 
guys, it was really interesting because whenever Charlie Michaels uh, challenged me to a debate, well, he didn't challenge. We we've had back uh, history and everything, but then he made a video saying, you know, even if someone does not have the baptism of the spirit and speak in tongues like how he wants them to speak. And even if they don't go to an accredited seminary, according to his standard or whatever, he'll still debate anybody that has at least 5,000 views. And uh, um, I prayed. And I told praise this a long time ago. I think I told SFT. I said, I'm praying that I reach 5,000 views. Because... Because I uh, that way Charlie Michaels doesn't have an excuse why not to formally debate. The reason I want to debate Charlie Michaels is because he holds the Matthew Bates' views of things. Which that system is a challenge that needs to be taken down. And so anyway, regardless of that, I prayed. And then shortly after, I, just got, I think it was got a notification from uh, YouTube talking about promotion and uh, uh, I never thought about that before because I um, you know I got my channel monetized and we're you know uh, I'm all new to all of that right so anyway I looked into this promotion thing and I was like okay I'll try it because I, I, I actually talked to Mahler and I and he told me so I was like, okay, I'll try it. So the first one that I did was I spent $25 and uh, uh, did an after show for Donnie and AK Richardson, right? It's a long form content. So that didn't get me much. You'll see right here, it only got me 12 subscribers and it got 230 views. But that was my first experience. It's like, okay, next time let's do it on a short. So I did it on this short because this short performed real well. Free Grace needs a real challenge. Same thing, $25. So it's $25 a month, right? That got me 462 subscribers, okay? And 195,000 impressions and 4,000 views. So like, all right, that went well. So let's go with the next most popular short video. And that's this one, Challenging Gideon and... Uh, Brother Josh, where, uh, where uh, true free gracers know this, it was called. That one got 488 subscribers, right? And same amount of money and everything. It's like, okay, great. So then my other most well performing video uh, short was Sam Shamoon. So it's like, okay, let's try that one. So we tried this one for this month. And so far on the $25 cap, I've only spent $13 and I already picked up 305 subscribers. Okay. Now, what I'm showing you with this is if you have successful shorts, it's very easy to promote them to bring in new subscribers. The difficulty is though, is that when you bring people in on your shorts, if you don't, you have to be able to transfer them to your longer form content audience. And, you know, the debates and the free grace stuff helps with that. But now we're going to go into Charlie Michael's accusation. Okay. All right. So right now we're sitting at 4,966, right? So let's click on audience. Okay. All right. So right here. Notice, uh, I don't want this one yet. I'll come back to this. Okay, right here. You see this? What, Janet? Now I'm just saying that you are so often yeah, to the people, to your audience. But I think I don't think that your uh, opponents doing that to, sh to share their YouTube, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, being, I'm being transparent. So in the last 28 days... According to this, looking at all content, 43% is coming from the United States. Look, guys, now this is what shocked me, because this is what's coming in with the shorts, is 37% of my growth in the last 28 days is in India. And this is significant because 
The reason I know Janet is because an Indian Christian named Simon introduced me to her. I was teaching him in India over Yahoo Messenger in 2012. And then by 2013, I knew Janet. By 20, uh, the beginning of 2014, February basically, uh, Valentine's, I was in a relationship with Janet. So I have a deep gratitude, you know, for that brother. And over the years, we've interacted and uh, n things have not ever failed the way I would like for me. But I told him about this growth that we're having in India. And so he's going to be working with me about how we can connect with the Indian office. Uh, but the other day when I was showing Janet this, right, I told her, I said, my plan is to shift at some point to shift in uh to reach in the philippines because janet's filipino simon has a wife uh, that's filipino that's came in you know there's others uh john the calvinist is wife's filipino uh there's another john mark that goes on praises channels filipino and so uh just god's been drawing that and that's not something we monopolated on a uh, monopoly monopolized on not monopolated that sounds like monopoly we're manipulated on but anyway um we uh monopolized on now the thing the reality is is that as we're broadcasting right now we're broadcasting to janet's channel on on facebook and other things like that we're broadcasting over her channel and yeah there is a filipino audience but the Filipino audience I have is very organic. I've been teaching behind the scenes and even in my older videos for years, teaching the Filipinos, you know, um, Janet and I both team teaching for years. So Charlie Michaels is right about the influence of the Filipinos, but he's wrong about where my most of my audience is coming in. Look, Philippines is not even showing up on here. Hong Kong's not even showing up on here. Now, this is the last 28 days, so let's drop it back to the 90 days. Okay? In the last 90 days, 64% is from the U.S. Thank you, Brian Reader. Thank you. Uh, so, in the next 90 days, it drops down to 14.6 in India. Okay? And then the U.K. That's probably uh, the other Simon. <laughs> All right. So, let's drop it down to a year. So there it is right there. Still, over a year ago, before I ever promoted anything, I was already having traction in India. 7.3%. Okay? Now let's take it to lifetime. Even with lifetime influence, still, United States is predominant. Then India second. Then Canada. That's SFT and his crew. The UK. Look, once again, Philippines are not mentioned. So let's find out where the Philippines are in the lifetime ministry of my channel. Let's switch to uh, bar chart. Let's do India, Canada, United States, Australia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Germany, Brazil. Hey. I got all these countries. All right. So, boom. Compared to, here, let me reduce one. We'll take Russia off for right now. All right. So, this means uh, view wise, 153,000 have come from the United States. View wise, 12,000 have come from India. Okay. Only 817 views have come from the Philippines. Hong Kong, 698. That's counting Janet. All right, let's take United States off the board. And let's just go ahead and add Russia. So, yeah, definitely India is the audience we're tapping. But the thing is, is we're in the next promotion, Janet already wanted me to switch to the Philippine audience. And I just thank God that this fell out this way because as you see, Charlie Michaels is wrong about the reason my channel's grown so much is because 
of Filipinos looking for romantic relationships. You might want to say Indians are looking for romantic relationships. But you know what? The people from India are not interacting too much. So uh, we want to get that interaction more. But regardless of that, we're going to be shifting to the Philippines. And yeah, I have no doubt that through Janet's network and our connections, how people relate to us, it's going to grow. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but I'm thankful that, that we didn't target the Philippines in promotion yet. Mahler already targeted the Philippines, uh, but we didn't do it. Okay. So there's the information. There's the statistics. And so that goes to uh, refuting that lordship person. Okay. All right. So lifetime, while we're already here, guys, lifetime, and uh, this channel has brought in in its entire lifetime six hundred and eight dollars in the last year. That it was six, what? Yeah, I think he forgot Matthew twenty eight nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The Great Commission. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the whole thing is that look, just think of that. We've brought in six hundred dollars in the last year, and with twenty five dollars a month, we're able to grow this fast. You know, if we look at the subscriber count, look at this guy. This is amazing. All right, so let's take it back. Lifetime. So this is whenever I finally got, you know, I think, what is it? You get 100 subscribers, then you gain traction. That was 2018, right? And then, you know, it's going slow. I'm teaching at my church. Normal thing I've been doing all these years back here. I married Janet in 2019. That gains more traction, right? But it isn't until... See, there's 1,000 views. We start getting close to 2,000 at 2022, which is around the time that I started debating. Okay. Let's do this. Let's take it back to 2022. And we'll make this 01. What are you trying to, to do? I'm setting the date. Watch. So from about... So what you're seeing is from... This is from 22. 1,000, right? When you get to 23, still 1,000. Okay? We hit 2,000. Where is it? Yeah, we, we hit 2,000 around... That just recently, you know? Yes, right, yeah. So, if we take this to 23, make this December, watch what happens. So, this is January of 23, right? And and you're, you're, getting, you're getting a lot of traction here. But look what happens. Boom. And we just start flying right here. Right, March 11, 2024. Let's narrow it down. Last year, so you can see just this. Just one, just month, just one month and few days, and then you just got four uh -huh. four thousand. Yeah. So maybe so tomorrow we, you you already <laughs> five thousand. Yeah. You can debate yeah. Michael. <laughs> so here's the last ninety days. Two about about ninety days ago, Janet, mute your mic, Echo. Sorry. The uh, so this was about ninety days ago. We were at twenty one hundred, okay. And then now we're almost at five thousand. So then, this is the last twenty eight days. So we were at two thousand seven hundred twenty nine twenty eight days ago, and now we are at almost five thousand. So you I do the math. Grace, 16, 11, King James only. 
So, as you see, YouTube promotions works. But remember that YouTube is working with uh, the information they have from your channel and from previous subscribers. So one reason they probably push stuff out most to India is because we were already reaching India, you know, before. Okay. And uh, so well, we will be switching things to the, uh, the Philippines soon. And I'm excited for that because I know we will connect the Filipinos very well, you know, and with the Phil Lamb people very well. But, uh, all right. So that's one way to deal with uh, Lordship Charlie Michaels is show statistically why he's wrong. <laughs> but anyway, back to the lecture at hand. All right. So remember, uh, Wilkin is commending MacArthur here. MacArthur graduated school. The Master Seminary is a fine school. It takes conservative stands on all the issues just mentioned. Faculty like Robert Thomas, retired, David Farnell, Dick Mayhew are well known for the defense of the scriptures. There are many important ways. John MacArthur is a champion for biblical truth. However, in the gospel according to Jesus, MacArthur champions a view called Lordship Salvation. It is this view that in order to have everlasting life, one must turn from his sins submit to Christ's lordship, obey him, and persevere in faith and good works unto death. In other words, cops. Commitment, obedience, perseverance, submission. Lordship salvation is not a minor issue. It's a major issue. The question of what one must do to have everlasting life is more important than any other. Proclaiming the right message is a matter of life and death. So while this book isn't a competition, we should be like the Bereans who search scripture to evaluate what is true. If we are, we will be able to discern what is true, what is false, and what we read in here. This is especially important when it comes to the message of everlasting life. MacArthur has not always held to Lordship salvation. The reason the first edition of the Gospel according to Jesus was not published before 1988 is because he did not embrace the view until 1980. Y'all hear that? MacArthur wasn't Lordship until 1980. At that time, MacArthur went on a sabbatical and studied the Puritans, the English branch of Calvinism. The reason why the title for the response to gospel according to Jesus is a gospel of doubt is because MacArthur's lordship salvation produces doubt in those who accept his teachings. According to MacArthur's gospel, one cannot be sure of where he will spend eternity until after he dies. It is true, however, that MacArthur, like the Puritan theology he follows, urges people to search their works in hopes of finding reasons to believe they will end up in Jesus' kingdom. But according to MacArthur, that very search produces doubts that one is born again and secure because no one works so perfect. A gospel of doubt advocates the same basic Hi, thing that MacArthur... Hi, Hi, who? Smith Nix. Hello. Hello, Smith Nix. Already. A I gospel know, uh... doubt... And Noah, a gospel of doubt advocates the same basic view that MacArthur himself held before 1980. Before the time MacArthur, so that's all we're trying to do, guys. We're trying to we're trying to roll MacArthur back to what he used to believe, right? Is it possible that MacArthur could repent of lordship salvation before he dies? Well, he better do it soon because he's getting he's getting up there in age. Before the time, MacArthur said that a certainty could be found simply in believing the promises of everlasting life, not in looking at one's work. If you appreciate John MacArthur and his views, you should consider the biblical evidence cited in the Gospel of Doubt. As he himself says, no man is a perfect expositor of God's word. No man infallibly proclaims the word of God. That includes MacArthur and me and any writer and preacher. Only scripture is without error. I hope you all prayerfully read this book asking God to show you if your understanding that God's words and his condition for receiving everlasting life are correct. The first edition of the gospel according to Jesus was published 27 years ago. It was so popular that a second revised and expanded edition came out six years later in 1994. It continued strong sales led to a remarkable 20th century anniversary edition that was released in 2008 with an additional chapter added. More books are lucky if they, uh, most books are lucky if they sell 5,000 copies and remain in print for six months. Okay? Keep that in mind. 
Let's find out how many books D David Benjamin sells when they come out. The importance of MacArthur's book on the gospel, i.e. the saving message, the message of everlasting life, is evident in that it has had massive sales and it's still in print 27 years after its release. After Zonovan first published the gospel according to Jesus, they asked St. Hodges to write a reply. One responded to MacArthur directly chapter by chapter. Hodges was not willing to write a direct response to gospel according to Jesus because he felt such a book would be limited in scope. Instead, he wanted to write a timeless response to Lordship Salvation. The book Hodges wrote was called Absolutely Free, a biblical reply to Lordship Salvation, 1989. Not once did Hodges mention MacArthur in... What, Janet? Read, please, the comment from Nova. Yo, Brother Charles, what book are you reading? This is Wilkins' Gospel, uh, uh, Gospel of Doubt. It's a oh, point, point. He have a video one, right? Is that is that the video one? Yes, yes. He has a video series on these. Yes, on each every chapter summary. I showed those a while ago. All right. Let's see. Not once did Hodge mention MacArthur in the main text. He only mentioned him in the end notes. MacArthur is mentioned occasionally in the text of the second edition, since longer end notes, many of which referred to MacArthur, have been moved to the text. So even when Zane Hodges wrote the book, he wasn't he wasn't focusing on on mentioning MacArthur's name. A Gospel of Doubt fulfills the original assignment given to Hodges to write a response to MacArthur. Section by section, chapter by chapter, this book is a labor of love. The evangelistic message is a matter of life and death. Hence, clarifying the evangelistic message which our Lord proclaimed is of utmost importance. It was difficult to keep this book approximately the same length as the gospel according to Jesus, but we did. A gospel of doubt has to lay out MacArthur's arguments and then respond to them. Consequently, the summary of these arguments was brief in many places. Since readers of the gospel of doubt are expected to have the gospel according to Jesus. In other words, you're supposed to be reading both books in hand. There was no need for extensive quoting or restatement except where it's especially important. The reader is able to verify the summaries of what MacArthur said making sure they accurately represent him. I held no animosity toward MacArthur. I met him on several occasions and I found him to be a cordial person. A cordial person. He is obviously a gifted speaker and writer. My aim in writing is to clarify the message of everlasting life, not to win a debate. Yeah, he'll win a debate uh, this Saturday when he debates Sean Griffin. But anyway, I hope you find that oh gospel uh, uh, that a gospel of doubt causes you to think more deeply about scripture. But as we meditate on God's word, good things happen. Bob Wilkin, 2015. Okay. What does Jesus mean when he says, follow me? Kute Kinte. So we're talking about roots here, guys. Yes, that's so true, Smith, uh, Smith Next. And I'm even writing about that right now. What is Sabaco? Yeah, I just replied to that. Kuta Kinte was abducted from the village in Africa, sold into slavery in the United States. He was treated horribly by his master. Hey, Janet, we need to watch that movie sometime. I've never sat down and watched it all the way through. Roots. Um, what? what? We'll watch. Huh? Which one? It's Anybody called Roots. Watch? Roots. Oh. It's about slavery. But anyway, after running away several times, his master disabled him. Alex Haley's famed TV series Roots was a jarring introduction to the evils that often accompany slavery. When you think of slavery, what comes to mind? Is it millions of men, women, and children kidnapped by fellow American Africans and sold to Europeans to work the colonies? Or may you think of the Hebrews escaping across the Red Sea from the Egyptian masters? Or Spartacus leading the revolt against Rome? Or modern-day Christian women being sold into slavery by the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq? Whatever image of slavery comes to mind is most likely a grim one. What, when we think of slavery, we think of the very worst kind of human existence possible. But when the Bible describes us as slaves to Jesus Christ, is that what we should think? In the first chapter of the Gospel according to Jesus, remember he's going chapter by chapter, John MacArthur argues that the Bible's description of Christians as slaves tells us something about the nature of saving faith. 
in some. Slaves were subservient to their masters. Hence, MacArthur believes that to be born again, one must surrender to Christ as Lord. Is MacArthur right? A word about words. And they even, their subtitles, the sub, uh, subtitles, it's the same in the book. So like, let me, well, I'll show you in a minute because I'm using both of them or Kindle. MacArthur begins by examining two words, Lord, Perios, and Slave, Dulos, and rightly sees the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus in the former term and our status in the latter term. He suggests that many New Testament translations have de-emphasized the word Dulos by translating his servant rather than his slave, which he thinks minimizes its impact. However, as is his practice throughout Gospel according to Jesus, MacArthur makes pronouncements that are not backed by Scripture, such as this one. Dulos speaks of slavery, pure and simple. It is not at all a hazy, uncertain term. It describes someone lacking personal freedom and personal rights, whose very existence is defined by his service to another. It is a sort of slavery in which human autonomy is set aside and an alien will take precedence of one's own. This is total unqualified submission to the control and direction of a higher authority slavery not merely service as one's own uh, discretion okay so that was the quote from macarthur i'm gonna change my voice when macarthur's talking so that we know what's going on on the other hand macarthur's right that doulas sometimes refers to a common slave on the other hand he fails to mention that it often refers to a king's official or to people who are officials for god himself the leading dictionary in new testament greek List two main senses of doulos. One, male slave as an entity in a social economic context, slave, and two, one who is solely committed to another, a slave, a subject. That's in the badag. But under the second definition, badag lists two types of usage, a pejorative sense and in a positive sense. All right, so let's just do that real quick. Let's pop the badag open. I hate to brag, but I got a badag, so don't get mad and let this culture lag. Gonna do the best, gotta give it a stat. Some other people looking really bad. All right, so let's type in slave. Good, let's click Dulas. Dulas, I got you all in chat. All right, so this is the badag. Le uh, the standard lexicon. So here's the first one. Male slave is an interesting social uh, context. That's what Wilkin was just saying. Then he goes down to the second entry. One who is solely committed to another slave or subject, right? And then you see in a pejorative sense, meaning it could be used as a negative, as in slaves to humans and uh, other examples, right? But it can also be used in a positive sense. In relation to a superior human being, uh, here the perspective is Oriental, not Hellenic, of humble service, according to Oriental's king's official. Uh, point B, especially the relationship of humans to God, gives examples like Moses and the prophets. Okay, so that I'm just showing you, this is what Wilkin is doing. Wilkin is using the badag to show where where. Um, MacArthur's tripping. He wants to pick certain definitions of slave because he wants you to deny that you have freedom. Or, or at least freedom in the sense of what what free grace typically views. He wants you to assume Calvinism, basically. But so it says, in a positive sense, under the positive use, do loss, but that glitz, in relation to a superior human being of a king's official, and especially in the relationship of human beings to God. When MacArthur talks about being a slave, his explanation explanation does not appear to have any positive sense at all. Yet Badag lists slavery to God as a positive thing. Just being one of king's officials certainly a positive thing. Indeed, Badag lists being apostles of Christian prophets as positive examples of being a doulas. Doulas, okay? MacArthur's interpretation of what it means to be a slave does not fit with many texts of scripture. For example, MacArthur says the Christian lacks personal rights. However, Paul asserts that he and Barnabas, which are both slaves of Christ, had rights. Do we have no right to eat and drink? 
do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to retain from working? Also, MacArthur says that since believers are slaves, they lack personal freedom. But contrast, Paul spoke of the freedom that believers in Christ have. Is any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go? Eat whatever set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. Accepting or declining the invitation certainly sounds a lot like freedom of choice for believers. And don't believers also have freedom in the manners of marriage? Aren't believers free to choose whom they wish to marry? Paul says they are. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she's at liberty to be married to whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7.39 when MacArthur says the Christians have no personal freedom or rights, he is misstating the meaning of doulos while ignoring contexts that do not support his explanation. MacArthur goes on to mention five passages, Matthew 6, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Peter, and Revelation 5, 9, evidently thinking that they prove that believers have no freedom and no rights, but none of these verses he cites support what he's saying. For example, MacArthur says, we have a master who bought us. Of course, it's absolutely true that Jesus is our master, despotates. Despotates is used four times in the New Testament of our Lord Jesus as our master. And it's certainly true that the Lord Jesus bought us, agarazzo. The word agarazzo is used four times in the New Testament in reference to redemption, yeah, from marketplace, whether for all mankind or for believers. But the verse MacArthur specifically cites is 2 Peter 2, 1, which doesn't refer to the redemption of believers at all. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. When MacArthur says we have a master who bought us, he's referring to believers, not false teachers. Yet Peter's talking about false teachers. MacArthur misses the distinction. The fact that the Lord bought, a, bought false teachers does not in any way prove that believers have no freedoms or rights. None of the other passages MacArthur cites indicate that believers lack freedom or rights either. Matthew 6, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 6, Revelation 5, 9. He is simply citing verses that use the word master, despotes, or bot redeem agarazzo without examining whether they prove his point. See, MacArthur, um, Wilkin is getting MacArthur pretty well right here. Why such a revolting concept? The title of this section shows that MacArthur thinks being a slave of Jesus Christ is a revolting concept. It is true that being a slave of doulos in the ancient world was a bad thing. No one would want to be in such a position, especially modern people who enjoy a wide range of personal freedoms. But MacArthur's arguments are misleading. While the New Testament does describe us as slaves, there isn't an exact equivalence between being the slave of a pagan and being Jesus' slave. It's a metaphor, and all metaphors have their proper limits. The truth is, following Christ can involve hardships and sufferings, but to call it revolting may be good rhetoric, but poor exposition. On the contrary, being Jesus' slave is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's not revolting. It's an honor and a great responsibility. For the person who understands who Jesus is and what is to come, being a slave is a wonderful concept. Indeed, it's the very best thing you can be. To say they understood far better than we do what a menial position he was calling them to is another exaggeration of the slave metaphor. Yes, Christ's apostles would experience debasement, but the kind of a debasement they experienced was less like a Roman doulos and much more like what Jesus himself experienced. Remember that his first coming, the Lord Jesus himself came as a slave. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it should not be among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. MacArthur fails to point out here that Jesus first came to serve, though he does later on 34, which is an important omission. In his first coming, Jesus came to serve others, not to be served. In his second coming, the Lord Jesus will come to be served. Will serving him be revolting? Absolutely not. In fact, if we're faithful in our service for him in his life, he will actually reign with him in this life to come. 2 Timothy 2.12, Revelation 2.26. Jody Dillo entitled his book on eternal rewards, The Reign of the Servant Kings, which is now Final Destiny, that captures this idea well. Christians are slaves to Christ. 
But that kind of slavery is not a revolting concept. The problem with a feel-good gospel. So now this is the next section of MacArthur's book that he's addressing. Give him a drink. MacArthur hopes his emphasis on slavery will help counteract what he perceives as a major problem today, namely a feel-good gospel. And what is that? He identifies it what he calls a no-lordship message and a no-lordship doctrine, the most disastrous form of the feel-good gospel. He says that the whole gist of the no-lordship message is as follows. You can have Jesus to save you and free and here and now and decide later whether you really want to be submitted to his authority or not. It is hard to imagine more disastrous twisting of what it means to be a Christian. It is unfortunate that MacArthur chose pejorative labels like the no lordship message when the people he is criticizing call our view free grace theology. We believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and call for people to submit to him and live for him. The very name, No Lordship Doctrine, is offensive to free grace proponents, and it is misleading. Free grace teachers say that only by following the Lord can anyone have meaning and significance in life. Believers who do not yield to Christ are miserable. Why would anyone want that? But it's true that free grace proponents, unlike MacArthur, do not make submitted to Christ a condition for receiving eternal life. Submission is a condition for discipleship and for the full fulfillment of for full, uh, fullness of life, which God wants us to have. Free grace preachers call MacArthur's view that he called it Lordship Salvation. If we were to call his view the no grace doctrine, the no grace message, or the feel bad gospel, we would be using pejorative language that would offend people we hope to reach. MacArthur does believe that the grace of God is essential for anyone to be born again. His church is called Grace Community Church. His radio ministry is called Grace to You. He speaks a lot about grace. He differs from free grace people and they, in his view, the grace of God motivates and enables the elect to repent, submit, commit, obey, persevere, so that they may gain kingdom entrance. In his view, the grace of God must be wedded with our works in order for anyone to escape eternal damnation, condemnation. Since the debate between Lordship Salvation and Free Grace Salvation will be discussed throughout this book, there's no need for a lengthy discussion of the differences here. Instead, a few observations about the basic differences follow. First, to the decision to submit to Christ, which MacArthur says one must make to be born again, is just that, a decision. But the new birth is not a decision. See, um, this is a, there's two views within free grace about faith. One is that it is a decision of the will. Another one that it's not. It's persuasion. Decisionism is wrong in terms of the new birth, as MacArthur himself says elsewhere. Of course, an unbeliever can and should decide to submit to Christ. See, that wasn't even the issue at that time whenever this book was written. But submitting to Christ won't save anyone. Second, MacArthur points people inward for assurance. He wants people to look at the implicit obedience of his commandments, which MacArthur says is a telltale mark of authentic saving faith. But the Lord Jesus pointed people away from themselves to himself. In John 3, 4, 5, 6, 11, believing in Jesus' promise of everlasting life is a true basis of assurance, not pointing inward, but pointing to Christ. Third, salvation, according to MacArthur, is hard work. It's a work that does not end into death or the rapture, but salvation, according to Jesus, is not hard work. It's a free gift received by faith alone, apart from any works. John 3, 4, 6. Fourth, the message of justification by faith alone is not a feel-good message. Contrary to MacArthur's claim, if it were, there would have been 1.2 billion Catholics, 3 million Eastern Orthodox, and 25 million Mormon and Jehovah Witnesses who reject the free grace message and instead of believe in salvation by grace through faith plus works. And most of the 8 million Protestants okay, hope to be saved by a mixture of faith and works. Clearly the message of Lord's salvation is a much more popular message than the free grace message. I would like to update those statistics when I get a chance, but it's still good. Slavery and true liberty. MacArthur ends the chapter by saying the gospel is the invitation to slavery, and it's impossible not to see that he makes everlasting life depend upon a mixture of faith that works. How else can you understand the following? The gospel, according to Jesus, calls sinners to give up their independence, deny themselves, submit to an alien will, and abandon their rights in order to be owned and controlled by the Lord. Does the law require anything more or less than such complete submission? A bit later, MacArthur adds, 
but remove the spirit of submission and the most profound kind of abernation for Christ is not even true faith at all. Yielded completely to Christ's lordship is that vital element of true saving faith and therefore the proclamation of his lordship is an absolute necessary component of the true gospel. Aside from the serious problems that rises from Paul's argument about justification in the law, a more fundamental question is, what evidence is there that the call to follow Christ is the same as the call to be born again? MacArthur offers no such evidence. Conclusion No doubt the Bible teaches that believers are Jesus' slaves, and MacArthur is right to call attention to the ne neglected subject and preach it, but he also takes things too far. He exaggerates the analogy between grueling pagan slavery and slavery to Christ and wrongly makes submission to Christ as one's master a condition for receiving everlasting life without a shred of biblical proof to support his claims. Okay, let's take a look at the footnotes also. MacArthur uses the term gospel to mean saving message. The message of what one must believe or in his case, do in order to have everlasting life. I have chosen to use the term in the same way, even though technically it is rarely if ever used that way in the New Testament. It actually refers to the good news that the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, became a man, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of the world, rose bodily from the dead, ascended to heaven, and is coming back soon to establish his righteous kingdom. The good news is the proof that Jesus' promise of everlasting life to all who simply believe in him is true. See my book, The Ten Most Misunderstood Words in the Bible, Chapter 9, The Gospel. Okay? And let's see. I'm looking for any anything more additionally. Uh, he don't like the term feel good gospel. He's just talking about selling of the books. Okay, I look at the issues. So you see now we're tracking with, this is the second edition. I look at the issues, right? But look, so listen to today's typical gospel presentation. Okay. After the first edition of the gospel according to Jesus came out, I heard MacArthur give a message on the radio entitled Truth, the Boundary of Love, and the Test of Loyalty, 2 John 5 8. In the message, he said the following I was sitting here in the church, I told you some years ago, with the leaders of the religion department of Brigham Young University, Mormon leaders, the ones who were responsible for all the training of the students at the BYU and are responsible for writing books on the Mormon theology. They said they wanted to meet with me for a day because they had so much in common with me. And so they came and enjoyed the discussion very much and my heart went out to these very uh, uh, two very fine men and they said you know we use your book the gospel according to Jesus as a textbook of BYU and I was so stunned I thought to myself what did I leave out I've got to go back and edit that book are you kidding well they said we're very very concerned because there isn't a love for Christ and there isn't a submission to his lordship among our students and so we found that book helpful and so they launched our discussion and they said we we just came down to talk to you and ask you to come to BYU and speak to our students and our faculty because we feel like, you know, we have so much in common. So get that, guys. The Mormons are using MacArthur's textbook uh, to teach, and they want MacArthur to go speak at, at Brigham Young University. MacArthur assured these Mormon leaders that they had misunderstood what he was saying in the book, but had they? Do Mormons believe in lordship salvation? MacArthur? Cole, if you're out there, I know you can weigh in on this. MacArthur does not think that Mormons are regenerate. He rightly sees Mormonism as a cult that is ter terribly distorted view of the deity of Christ, the Bible, special revelation, etc. But that does not mean that there are not so significant areas of agreement between MacArthur and Mormons on the question of what one, one must do to be born again. Now, this is interesting that he makes this comparison. Uh, Wilkin has drawn this comparison between Mormonism and Lordship Salvation. The reason I say it's interesting is because whenever I debated Kelly Powers, Kelly Powers tried to say free grace theology was a cult. But if this argument is correct and this information is correct, then by this definition, it's Lordship Salvation that should be compared to a cult, at least in some sense. Phil Johnson is MacArthur's right-hand man and the editor of the Gospel According to Jesus. 
In a September, uh, September 7, 2005 blog entitled Peddling Mormonism as Mainstream Christianity, Johnson tries to rebut the efforts of Mormons, and particularly the BYU professor Robert Millett, to present their views as the same in MacArthur's. In the blog, Johnson writes, Tuesday, I read an internet forum where a Mormon missionary was attempted to convince some naive evangelicals that MacArthur's Lordship Doctrine asserts the very same sociology as Mormonism. The Mormon guy claimed that the Bible is full of verses that deny the principle of solo for day and make salvation a cooperative work between God and sinner, just the way the Mormon gospel teaches. That, he insisted, is also John MacArthur's view. Millet's book itself strives to leave the same impression. Although Millet hasn't really grasped the first principle of what MacArthur actually teaches, he quotes frequently but selectively from MacArthur apparently attempted to give the impression that MacArthur believes that sinners' own works are instrumental in justification. Does MacArthur teach that salvation is a cooperative work between God and the sinner? Yeah, if you mean compatibilism. Oh, another coffee. One second, guys. Let me get, take some cough medicine for my throat. I just took the daytime medicine and not the nighttime, but sometimes the daytime medicine messes me up too. So I'll I'll drive until I get too, um, too tired at the wheel, so I don't crash the plane. Does he teach the sinners own works or instrumental in justification? Johnson doesn't think so, but Miller is right. This is precisely what MacArthur believes and teaches in chapter two. Ooh. Does he teach that the sinner's own works are instrumental in justification? Yeah, because he's a neonomian. He doesn't just believe that the um, the works are, are a result, but they're also the condition for final just, justification. All right. MacArthur begins chapter two by lamenting the fact that evangelistic presentations often call for people to accept Jesus, invite him into your life, or make a decision for Christ. He rightly says that those are misleading the biblical ways of evangelizing. Nowhere do we find such calls in scripture. Next, MacArthur identifies what he considers to be the core truth that is missing in the deluded gospel of popular evangelicalism, i.e. the truth that the gospel of Jesus uh, proclaimed was a call to discipleship, a call to follow him in submissive obedience, not just a plea to become a decision or pray a prayer. Think about that statement. Phil Johnson adamantly denies that MacArthur believes that works are necessary for justification. And yet here MacArthur is plainly saying that discipleship and submissive obedience are conditions of salvation. Don't submission and obedience require good works? If good works like submissive obedience are necessary for salvation, the contrary to Phil Johnson, the impression that MacArthur believes the sinner's own works are instrumental in justification is absolutely spot on. The Lord Jesus did not say that submissive obedience is necessary to be eternally saved. He said that whoever simply believes him has ever everlasting life. The abandonment of Jesus' gospel. MacArthur points out that some evangelicals speak about a conversion to Christ that involves no spiritual commitment whatsoever. He mischaracterizes his views and promises that whoever believes the facts about Christ can claim eternal life. MacArthur isn't entirely wrong on that point, but he's not quite right either. The Pharisees of Jesus' day believe many facts about Jesus, so do Mormons, Catholics, and Muslims today, but they aren't saved. The facts about uh, Jesus' life and identity are important, of course, but believing them won't save you. The reason is because one can believe a number of important truths about Jesus and also believe in salvation by works. That isn't saving faith. What is? A person is born again when he believes Jesus promised to give everlasting life to one who simply believes in him. Just as Abraham believed in the coming of Messiah for everlasting life and was justified, so too we believe in Jesus' promise of everlasting life to all who simply believe in him. No one facts about Jesus. His sinless life, his death on the cross, and his bodily resurrection from the dead give us reasons to believe his promise. So there's the three Ps, but they're saying 
the person and the provision are reasons to believe the third P, the promise. But many people believe the facts about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and yet do not believe that by faith in them they have everlasting life. MacArthur says that some evangelicals claim that no one can have everlasting life without having to turn from sin or without experiencing a resulting change in lifestyle. He disagrees. In other words, he believes you need to turn from your sins and have a resulting change in lifestyle to be saved, i.e. you need to do good works. How do we get eternal life? By faith in Jesus or by doing good works. Do we believe in justification by faith alone from works or something else? That is the heart of the Lordship debate. Faith in Christ, not commitment to work for him, is the sole condition of justification and of eternal life. The words commit and commitment do not even appear in John's Gospel or Galatians in relation to men, nor do they appear in Ephesians. There are two uses in John and one in Galatians, but these refer not to the commitment of men, but the commitment of God. And while the word commit and commitment do occur in the synoptic gospels in relation to men, there are never used as conditions of everlasting life. MacArthur thinks the reason why many church people are unregenerate is because they have not been sufficiently committed and obedient to God. However, the real reason why multitudes of people from within Christianity will end up in the lake of fire is because they never believe the simple promise of John 3.16. The problem of assurance. MacArthur's emphasis on works inevitably leads to a view of assurance that is likewise entirely dependent on our works, as MacArthur writes. Genuine assurance comes from seeing the Holy Spirit's transformation work in one's life. So for MacArthur, if you want to be sure that you're saved, you need to look at your behavior. There are two problems with this approach to assurance. First, looking at one's work for assurance of salvation only feeds the delusion that salvation depends upon our works. and entirely man-centered. Instead of looking to Jesus' work and promises, MacArthur wants to see how we're living. The only way to have, when he said how we're living, I thought, in living color. Anyway. The only way to have assurance, according to this view, is if you think that you're basically living a good life. The further deludes people and they're thinking they're good enough to be saved when they are not. Second, looking at one's work for assurance of salvation is absolutely demoralizing and to anyone convinced that even the best works are like you feel the rags before God. Calvinist David Engliensma calls the Puritan view of assurance, which is MacArthur's view of assurance, a gospel of doubt. Mm. Engliensma shows that only the promise of life in scripture to the believer, not in the perfect life, can provide assurance that we're born again, wrongly dividing the word. MacArthur accuses free grace dispensationalists with wrongly dividing the word, especially when we distinguish between Christ as Lord and Christ as Savior. He criticized Livingston Blavant for suggesting that one is born again by believing in Jesus as Savior, not by committing himself to the Lord of his life. MacArthur adds, it is astonishing that anyone would characterize the truth as unbiblical or heretical, but a grown chorus of voices echoing the charge. Maybe it is astonishing to someone who believes in salvation by works. The doctor of the soul of a day would obviously be heretical to anyone who believes that one must work his way into the kingdom by repentance, submission, commitment, obedience, and perse perseverance unto death. The real tragedy is the growing course of labels are non-biblical, heretical. The truth of justification is by faith alone apart from works. There are two verses in particular that MacArthur argues teaching the necessity of works for the new birth. The two clearest statements on the way of salvation in all the scripture both emphasize Jesus' lordship. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised over in the dead, you shall be saved. All right, Janet, you still there? I know you're there, but I mean, are you listening? Are you paying attention? If not, it's fine. But if you're doing comments, that's good too. Jesus the Lord, we can agree on that. But if these verses teach you eternal life depends upon our obedience, let's take a closer look. Acts 16.31, MacArthur cites part of Paul's famous answer to the Philippian jailer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, you and your household. He suggests that the word Lord in Acts 16.31 proves one must yield to the Lord Jesus Christ to have everlasting life. But please read that verse carefully. What is the one condition that we must fulfill in order to be saved? The only condition is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the mentions of repentance, surrender, commitment, obedience, and perseverance, they aren't mentioned. The word Lord Jesus Christ, the Paul says the nation of the person who is the object of the saving faith. He is the one we must believe in to be born again. Paul neither says nor implies anything about repentance, commitment, surrender, obedience, and perseverance. Acts 16.31 actually refutes Lordship salvation. Romans 10, 9, MacArthur finds additional proof of the position in Romans 10, 9, which reads that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. 
he he does not cite verse 10, which completes the thought of verse 9. For with the heart one believes in the righteous, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 lists no one, not one, but two conditions of being saved, confessing Jesus and believing them. Even if we granted MacArthur's view that believing in Jesus is insufficient for anyone to be born again, four of MacArthur's five essential elements of genuine converse, uh, conversion are missing. Paul does not mention humility, revelation, repentance, or submission, which were all essential to the new birth according to MacArthur. Why this is not explained is puzzling. Since elsewhere in Romans, Paul taught justification by faith alone, not by faith plus confessing Christ. MacArthur's use of Romans 10 does not make sense. There are various explanations of Romans 10 which avoid the problem of suggesting that Paul contradicts himself within Romans. Far and away, the simplest solution is to recognize salvation in Romans does not refer to salvation from eternal condemnation. This is easily seen in Romans 10, 13 and 14 where MacArthur does not discuss. Romans 10, 13 is a quote of Joel 2, 32, which refers to salvation from temporal difficulties by believing Jews during the tribulation. Romans 10, 14 specifically says that the ones calling of the Lord are believers. How shall they call on them whom they have not already believed? In Romans, the Apostle Paul uses the noun salvation, soteria, five times, and the verb to save, sozain, eight times. And in each case, they refer to deliverance from God's temporal wrath. Romans 10.10 10 refer to justification by faith alone. One is declared righteous by believing. In Romans 10.10, 10, following Job B, refers to the salvation of the believers for God's temporal wrath by confessing Christ, faith, and true discipleship. MacArthur says the obedience and submission are not extraneous to saving faith. In other words, MacArthur has arbitrarily redefined the meaning of faith or belief without any lexical or biblical support. He simply announces that obedience and submission are a part of saving faith. But if, if, but if that were true, think of how the, this will radically change the meaning of several authentically evangelistic verses such as John 3.16. It would have to read the saying, For God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever obeys and submits to him should not perish, but have uh, everlasting life. But it don't say that. Or think of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It would actually mean, For by grace you have been saved through obedience and submission, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of words, since anyone should boast. But it don't say that. In James 2, 19, uh, though not evangelistic, would strangely mean, You obey and submit to the one God, you do well. Even the dem demons obey and submit. Ah, I like that. I like that right there. That's a good argument. Whether or not you agree with MacArthur that obedience and submission are part of faith, you have to admit that such a view results in radically different understanding the justification by faith alone. Two different objects of hope. MacArthur's Lord's salvation hands our eternal destiny, not on faith, but on works. If saving faith is simply believing that what the Lord promises to believe in is true, then our eternal destiny relies solely on Jesus being faithful to his promise. But if saving faith involves obedience and submission to Christ and to death, then the burden of our eternal destiny rests squarely on our own shoulders. Can you see now why Mormons love MacArthur's book? The MacArthur does not separate justification from sanctification, or the call to discipleship with the promise of life is a fatal flaw in his thinking. The results are disastrous and makes the salvation depend upon works. Obviously, following Jesus in discipleship involves more than just believing him apart from works. So once MacArthur equates discipleship and evangelism, the belief cannot be the condition of everlasting life. While MacArthur decries what he calls easy believism, what he actually rejected is plain old believism. Belief isn't enough for him. He thinks God requires lifetime of good works for everlasting life. Belief must be joined with submission, commitment, obedience, and perseverance. MacArthur thinks that people discussed in Matthew 7, 21 to 33 have the problem of relying on the wrong type of works. Might it, might it not be the people who will say at the great right throne judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Do so because they think the works will justify them. Could it be these people like MacArthur hope that the works will be sufficient to get them into the kingdom? But Jesus rejected them. I never knew you. He does not reject the works. He doesn't say, I never knew your works. Jesus standard is higher than theirs, for they did well, but Jesus were rejected for their lawlessness. He never knew them because they never did the will of the Father, which is believing in Jesus for everlasting life. Faith in Christ, apart from works, guarantees interest into the kingdom by grace through faith. Realizing that some will see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is salvation that is not of works. MacArthur does mention these verses, yet surprisingly, without actually explaining them, we find no discussion of how Ephesians 2, 8 harkens back to Ephesians 2, 5, showing that saved in Ephesians 2, 8 
clearly refers to everlasting life or being made alive. We have we find our discussion of the perfect tense of the verb sozo, signifying a past salvation, which is also has an abiding result. Missing is the discussion of the neuter, that which refers back to the by grace through faith salvation, not to faith, which is the feminine noun, not neuter. Uh, though C-188, where he, he has a brief yet unconvincing explanation. And what it is that Paul is saying is the gift of God. Is this expression used elsewhere in the New Testament or in Paul? We aren't told by MacArthur. Previously, MacArthur has said that saving faith is surrender, we're in obedience. Now he adds a third aspect to saving faith, repentance, which defines as turning from self and sin to God. So by grace you have been saved through faith it really means by grace you've been saved through turning from sin, surrender, and obedience. It is another any wonder that people who hold to Lord's salvation lack assurance of their eternal destiny. Sadly, their motivation to obey God is the desire to gain interest to the kingdom. Loosely commenting on the word gift in Ephesians 2, MacArthur writes, Salvation is a gift, but it's appropriated through a faith that goes beyond mere understanding and ascending to the truth. Note the word but, it is a contrast word. He is saying one thing only to take it right back again. Okay, I'm gonna look at the comments because Janet must be sleeping. All right. All right, y'all doing good. Y'all good over there. MacArthur cannot simply say what Paul says, salvation is a gift to God. He needs to qualify the statement and explain it and hedge it in. Otherwise, the reader might think it really is a gift. MacArthur feels it vital that no one bases assurance on Jesus' promise. He is always trying to turn people's attention to their own works. Genuine assurance comes from seeing the Lord's Spirit transform, transform a work in one's life. A warning. The second chapter of Gospel quoted that Jesus ends with a warning. If we're truly born of God. MacArthur says we have a faith that cannot fail to overcome the world. The process of sanctification can never start completely in us. God will continue to perfect us until the day of Christ. But who among us is certain that he will overcome the world? Who is sure that his sanctification will never start completely? Who can be sure that God will continue to perfect him until Christ returns? The answer is no one. Hence the second chapter of gospel quoted that Jesus ends with a warning that is in essence a call to doubt and despair since no one can be sure he will pass those tests. Okay, I'm just looking at in, um, just looking at the quotes, the deity Christ, um, that's the stuff about the Mormonism, stuff about Zane Hodges from his Romans commentary, uh, more detail about the Badag. Watch this. Although I'm convinced that MacArthur preaches a false gospel of salvation by works, I am not thereby suggesting that he's unregenerate. I've heard him say that prior to the study of the Puritans in 1980, he believed in justification by simple faith apart from works. And I met people who have been in the church for over 20 years who told me that only after he studied the Puritans in 1980 did his theology change. On that basis, I believe that MacArthur is regenerate and eternally secure. He, like all of us, will have to answer at the judgment seat of Christ for anything he's taught, which is in error. Yet in the end, yet in the end, I expect to spend eternity with him as a brother in the Lord. MacArthur himself illustrates the beauty of once saved, always saved. Even if someone ceases to believe in justification by faith alone, apart from works, his later belief in works salvation cannot undo the new birth. But people who have never believed in justification by faith alone, apart from works, remain unregenerate, no matter how committed and seemingly obedient they are, for they have failed to do the will of the Father concerning the Son. He calls for a new birth. Double thing. George Orwell once explained means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. The third chapter of the gospel according to Jesus reads like a case study in theological double thing. MacArthur desperately wants to denounce legalism and to teach that everlasting life depends upon our obedience. If this seems contradictory to you, it is. And yet this is how MacArthur interprets the famous dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus about the new birth in John 3, the new birth. If you want to know uh, what a person needs to do in order to be born again, then John 3 is one of the best passages to read. Obviously, MacArthur agrees. So we wanted to have one of the opening chapters on John 3, the message of simple 
simple and easy enough for a child to understand. All we need to do is believe in Jesus for everlasting life and he gives to us and we become born again. Rituals and laws can't do it. Only faith in Jesus can. But the way of understanding Jesus' talk with Nicodemus doesn't sit well with MacArthur. In the gospel according to Jesus, he calls the message easy believism. The no lordship doctrine, message evangelism, gospel, cheap grace, and antinomian, antinomianism. He thinks that faith alone message leads to many fake Christians, people who believe in Jesus for their eternal destiny, but whose lifestyle does not reflect total submission to him. MacArthur begins the chapter by repeating his concerns about assurance, saying, not everyone who claims to be Christian really is. As always, his current concern is cheap grace and easy faith. The sovereignty and the New Testament message is brought with it a putrefying inclusivism that is in fact sees almost any kind of positive response to Jesus' attempt to mount to saving faith. What kind of positive response to Jesus does MacArthur have in mind? If he's saying that walking the aisle is not the saving response to Jesus, he's correct. Of course, this isn't a positive response to Jesus. That's a positive response to the preacher and a man-made appeal. The only saving response is belief in Jesus promised to give us eternal life. But MacArthur does not believe this is what the Lord told Nicodemus. He wants us to convince his readers that John 3 teaches that salvation is attained by obedience. Though the Lord does not mention repentance or obedience to Nicodemus, MacArthur says he was showing Nicodemus the necessity of repentance. Disobedience is unbelief. Real faith obeys. Real faith, he says, has his heart a willingness to obey. In the very last sentence of the chapter, he says that there's no promise of life for those who were not identified with the sinful, dying, Israelites in turn from sin and obedient faith to the one who's lifted up so that they would not have to perish. We drink of water. Seven times in John 3, the Lord Jesus said, the one who believes in him has everlasting life. Seven times in seven verses. Not once did he say, he who obeys me has everlasting life. Yet MacArthur wants his readers to think in terms of salvation by works by suggesting that in speaking with Nicodemus about how to be born again, our Lord eschewed the quick, easy, or shallow response. What the Lord demanded MacArthur saying was a gradual, not quick, difficult, not easy, and deep, not shallow response. Does that sound like the message of John 3.16? Does that resemble the response of the woman at the well in John 4? Did she or Nicodemus gradually come to faith in Christ over the course of years? Was it difficult for them to come to faith? Was the response of them way deep? No, 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 and no. The futility of religion. Of course, MacArthur knows that most evangelicals look down upon salvation by works, at least in theory, so he needs to appear, appear to be against it. MacArthur thinks that Jesus was rebuking Nicodemus for legalism or hyperlegalism. But just in case anyone starts to wonder what the difference between lordship salvation and legalism is, he distracts the readers with a generalization about the Pharisees and Nicodemus. The Pharisees were hyperlegalists, they extended Britain. Uh, externalized religion. They were the very epitome of all pursuit of former godless with no reality. Although they were f uh, fan uh, fanatically religious, they were no nearer the kingdom of God than a prostitute. Their credo included facetious adherence to more than 600 laws, many of which were simply their own invention. MacArthur implies that Nicodemus fit this mode. When Nicodemus heard Christ is talking about a new birth, his mind must have been a bog. He had always believed that salvation earned by good works. He probably even expected Christ to commend him for a strict legalism. Implying that Nicodemus was a hyper-legalist who externalized his religion and followed laws, many of which were simply the Pharisees' own inventions, allows MacArthur to denounce one form of legalism. However, MacArthur wants the readers to know that the problem is not legalism, but what he calls hyper-legalism. Too much attention to the commands and to the works is a bad day, but the right amount of attention to the commands to our works is a life and death matter. Jesus' solution, according to MacArthur, was to give Nicodemus an even more challenging demand. Far from offering of this man, Nicodemus, an easy conversation, Christ would challenge him with the most difficult demand he could make. MacArthur explains the sentence in the rest of the chapter, the unity of revelation. After having said that at the start of the chapter that being born again was not quick or easy, MacArthur now says people have always stumbled over the simplicity of salvation. So what is the simple way of salvation? We are not told here other than the message simply that God saves repentant sinners who come to him in faith. He continues, there's no secret here, no mystery, no obscurity, no complexity. According to MacArthur, to be born again, one must repent. The repentant sinner come to him, Christ in faith. But remember that MacArthur teaches that faith is inseparable for submission, commitment, obedience, and perseverance.
MacArthur doesn't seem to realize how confusing these conditions are for his readers. How much obedience is enough for people who fall short of God's glory every day? What if we find some major assurance in the fact that we appear to be more submitted, more committed, more obedient to others? What if we have assurance of being committed because we are blind to the extent of our own sinfulness? How can we be sure we have never fallen away? The reality of redemption. Itchy, what's up? Why are you reading like you're rapping? So that I can read fast. I gotta read fast. The reality of redemption. MacArthur's clearly rejected few that believing in Jesus and believing in him. I know that sounds odd. Let me restate that. MacArthur thinks that belief in the Bible is always being convinced or persuaded of the church, except in the case of saving faith. To believe that Jesus is God is simply to be convinced he's God. To believe that the Bible is the word of God is simply to be persuaded of the fact. But to believe in Jesus for everlasting life is not to be persuaded that he guarantees everlasting life to all who simply believe in him. Is this one case to believe meant to submit to him and to obey him for the rest of one's life? He champions the idea that believing in Jesus includes obeying his commands. MacArthur disprovingly cites St. Hodges who said there's no there is no idea of committal or life, no possibility of surrender. Instead, MacArthur flatly says that obedience to Christ is an element of saving faith. MacArthur also says he, Jesus, was showing Nicodemus the necessity of repentance. However, repentance is not mentioned in John 3. In fact, it's not mentioned anywhere in John's gospel. If that is the condition of everlasting life, why didn't Jesus mention repentance to Nicodemus? Why didn't John mention it? MacArthur goes on to say that what is required to be born again is obedient faith. This is confusing. MacArthur just castigated Nicodemus and the Pharisees for overzealous over obedience to God's law, arguing the hyper-legalism is wrong and that the people must recognize that they help the sinners. Yet here he is arguing that he must also commit and surrender and obey in order to gain the new birth. MacArthur's interpretation of this passage is at odds with the plain statement made by Jesus as recorded by the Apostle John in the biblical text. Jesus didn't call Nicodemus to repentance, obedience, or commitment. He only asked him to believe in him. This is all that required to be born again. By looking carefully at the conversation between the Lord and Nicodemus, we can understand what actually happened. The real meaning of Jesus' meeting when Nicodemus is playing. The Lord indeed told Nicodemus that the new birth was essential in order to see the kingdom. And he told him that he should have understood this from the Old Testament. Nicodem Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because he did not want his interest in Jesus to be public knowledge. He knew that Jesus was a teacher come from God because of the signs that he did. Jesus got straight to the point, unless one born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Seeing the kingdom refers to entering and participating in it. Jesus had not yet not Nicodemus what he must do that God would have regenerate him. Jesus first shows him his need for the new birth. Nicodemus, like the woman at the well in John 4, is confused about the new birth, but he does not understand that Jesus talk about a second birth. Nicodemus now wants to know how this new birth can be realized. And Jews... And Jesus explains to him how it's possible and how to receive it. This is the last mention of the name of Nicodemus until 751. In John 314, we read about the episode in Numbers 21 of the bronze serpent. When God heard the complaints from the Israelites about the miraculous manna, he provided freely what they were in the wilderness. He sent deadly serpents among them, killing many. Directed by God, Moses lifted up a bronze serpent. Whoever looked at his heel, the lifted serpent was a type of Christ, picturing how the Messiah would be lifted up, but the cross would save everyone who simply looked at him. Look at Jesus in John 3.14 is a figure for believing in him as John 3.15 and 18 looks abundantly clear. MacArthur, like some preachers, is willing to embellish God's word if embellishing helps to make the point he wants to make concerning Numbers 21 and the uplifted. I'm going to drink of water. MacArthur shares insights not found there or anywhere in the Bible concerning the incident. He says that the people of Israel turned to God in desperation and with genuine repentance. When they realized they were dying, they repented. He then adds, Jesus was demanding that Nicodemus do the same. Uh, where he was saying he showed Nicodemus the necessity of repentance. There's no mention of repentance in John 3 or John's Gospel or Numbers 21, but MacArthur's manages to find it anyway. In the first edition of the Gospel, according to Jesus, he boldly stated, in order to look at the bronze snake at the pole, they had to drag themselves to where they could see it. Drag themselves? There's no hint of that in Numbers 21 and John 3, 14. Evidently, someone convinced MacArthur he was going too far. In the second and third edition, the claim was toned down to the following. Undoubtedly, many were already sick and dying, fast losing their strength. 
But in all three editions, he then makes a statement they were in no position to glance flippantly at the foe and then proceed with their lives of rebellion. How does he know that uh, that a special type of look was needed? And what would glancing flipping, uh, flip, uh, flippantly at the foe even mean? MacArthur is suggesting that those, that those Jews of the generation who saw the unlifted servant cease rebelling and lived in fellowship with God after Numbers 21. But that is not supported where the remainder of Numbers or Deuteronomy. Numbers 25.1 says that the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Mo. The next verse says they invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Does that sound like national repentance occurred in Numbers 21 like MacArthur says? Does Moses had to contend with the people of Israel repeatedly and it did not stop after an Olympic serpent incident. In John 3, Jesus uh, twice says directly that believing in them is the condition of everlasting life. The moment anyone believes in Jesus, he has present tense, everlasting life. The issue is belief, not believer, even though God wishes believers and unbelievers to obey him. In John 3, 18, the Lord summarizes the life and death issue. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Three times in John 3, 18, Jesus refers to the necessity of believing him to escape eternal condemnation. Five times in John 3, 15, 16, 18, the Lord told Nicodemus, whoever believes in him has everlasting life. John's gospel is rightly called the gospel of belief. Jesus doesn't tell Nicodemus that he needed to repent, commit, and obey in order to be born again. He told him that he needed to believe in him in order to have everlasting life. Conclusion John 3 through 21 is a crucial passage for understanding how to be born again. Having carefully examined those verses, we can conclude that contrary to MacArthur's understanding of the passage, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only condition of everlasting life. The Lord said this over and over again in Nicodemus in 3, 14 and 18. The Savior did not talk to Nicodemus about repentance, commitment or obedience. The three conditions of everlasting life MacArthur suggests are evident in this passage. The issue in relation to the new birth is belief, not behavior. So th this is a statement right here. In the introduction to the gospel according to Jesus, MacArthur says, The gospel in vogue today holds forth a false hope to sinners. It promises they can have eternal life, yet continue to live in rebellion against God. Under the head and saying without a doubt the sin of empty words, MacArthur writes in chapter 21, Unlike preachers today who go to excessive lengths to avoid upsetting anyone's assurance, our Lord was determined to destroy the false hope of all who falsely thought they were redeemed. According to MacArthur, the issue the Lord was addressing is not what one believes, but what one does or does not do. MacArthur speaks of false professors, whom he identifies as those who are not loyal, abiding believers, false disciples, whom he says are friendly to Jesus, look and talk like disciples, but they're not committed to him and are therefore capable of the worst kind of betrayal. Professor Christians, whoever's believer is indistinguishable from the re rebellion of the unregenerate and false believers, whom he identifies as shallow responders and those who respond positively on the surface and their faith looks encouraging. You might think these people stand taller and stronger than anyone else, but they are all smiles and tears with no sense of repentance or humility. All right, so then he keeps on going on about the commitment and obedience and all those terms, obedient faith. All right. Okay, he demands true worship. So now we're in John 4. Hey, Lisa. All right. He demands true worship. Anyone who doubts that God can use the most broken of people to become the most powerful witness for the gospel promises to read John 4, the story of the woman at the well. In the fourth gospel, the gospel uh, in the fourth chapter of the gospel according to Jesus, John McCarthy. Let me turn on my air conditioner. It's kind of getting hot. Hold on. Well, I'll turn my fan up first. I don't want to have to use my air conditioner. I have to electric bill. In the fourth gospel, of the uh, uh, why did I do that again? 
In the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Jesus, John MacArthur offers us the interpretation of the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. He believes the episode provides us with some critical truths that need to be emphasized when evangelizing, such as the need to confront sinners with their sin, the necessity of moral evaluation, the need for spiritual transformation, the demand that we worship God in spirit and in truth. However, MacArthur's interpretation doesn't fit the details of the passage. What does Jesus demand? The title of this chapter is telling, he demands true worship. Of all the ways you could summarize what the Lord told the woman at the well, Jesus demands true worship. It's one of the last statements that should come to mind. True, the Lord had talked to her about true worship at John 4, but that was in response to an issue she raised about worship. It wasn't the main point. He was communicating to it. The Lord certainly wasn't saying that in order to be born again, one had to worship God in spirit and truth. Just as the Lord communicated to Nicodemus, the one born again by believing in him, the main the Lord's main point here is that believing in results in everlasting life. John 4 and all those verses. Like a good debater, MacArthur early on addresses some possible objections to his view that the Lord was telling the woman that to be born again, she must worship from faithfully to her the rest of her life. MacArthur says he made no mention of sin, wages, repentance, faith, atonement, his death for sin, or the resurrection. But he warns that we shouldn't be too quick to draw any conclusions from an argument from silence. Are we to conclude that those are not indispensable elements of the gospel message? Certainly not. Did you notice that MacArthur said he made no mention of faith? Yet the text of John 4 shows that Lord did mention faith and that faith is the very center of the discussion with the woman at the well. In verse 10 through 14, Jesus used drinking living water as a metaphor for faith, as is clear from a comparison with John 6.35. I am the bread of life who comes to me shall never hunger and who believes in me shall never thirst. In John 4.21, he explicitly tells the woman to believe him. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you would neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. In addition, the apostle John tells us that many Samaritans of the town believed in him because of the word of the woman. Uh, killer banana, four views of the chain in the up. Yep. In addition, the Apostle John tells us that many Samaritans of the town believed in them because of the word of the woman, and many more believed because of his own word. Both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle John emphasize belief. Yet MacArthur says that faith was not brought out, brought up in this passage. The lesson of the water, everyone at thirst may come. Apparently, MacArthur disagrees that drinking is a metaphor for faith. Instead, he asserted that in the context of conveys the idea of commitment to Christ. Can we concede that the verb drink conveys the idea of appropriation apart from commitment? Certainly not. As proof besides Matthew 20 and John 18, where the Lord prophesied that he's about to drink the cup of God's wrath. He says that in those verses, both use drink in a way that clearly implies full compliance and surrender. Not quite. MacArthur equates a sinner drinking the wonderful living water with the sinless son of God drinking the terrible cup of supper and also called the cup of God's wrath. In John 18, the Lord makes it clear that the cup he was about to drink refers to the cross. But MacArthur fails to explain what drinking the cup of supper means. He does not discuss the cross here. He does not discuss whether Jesus willingly going to the cross is different from a person drinking living water. So while MacArthur is right to point out that drinking can sometimes be a metaphor for painful experience, indeed a good work, the cross of Christ is the greatest work ever done, the greatest work. The real question is whether drinking living water ever equals works or a commitment to do works. The answer is never. If anyone doubts that drinking living water is a metaphor for simple faith, then John 6.35 should settle the issue. He who believes in me shall never thirst. The Lord's point is that once someone believes in him, drinks living water, he will never thirst again. Drinking living water is not in any way comparable to the Lord dying on the cross. See also Revelation 22, 17, and let him who thirst comes, whoever desires, let him take the water or life freely as a gift. Unfortunately, MacArthur fails to mention those verses. But what's worse, MacArthur's conclusion about Matthew 20 and John 18 is flawed. He says that both verses you drink in a way that clearly implies full compliance and surrender. He thinks the Lord's reference to drinking the cup of suffering is a metaphor for commitment and surrender. On the contrary, the Lord Jesus was talking about an action. The cup, the cup of God's wrath is the experience of crucifixion. Jesus was not saying that he was committed to going to the cross. He was prophesying that he would actually die on the cross. Matthew 20 and John 18 attest. 
drinking the cup was the greatest good work ever done. The Lord Jesus did not tell the woman at the well that if she drank the cup of supper, she would have everlasting life. And drinking living water, her men drinking the cup of God's wrath, as MacArthur argues. Then the Lord was teaching work salvation in John 4, her sinful lifestyle. MacArthur claims that before Jesus would give her eternal life, the Samaritan woman first needed to undergo a moral investigation and correction. Jesus allegedly challenged the woman to change her sinful lifestyle and alter her behavior before he could give her eternal life. Now, there's no question that her sinful past were discussed. The question is, why did the Lord Jesus bring it up? MacArthur's view is that the Lord brought up a sinful past to get her to confess that she's a sinner because such a confession is one of the many steps along with moral investigation and correction to eternal salvation, yet they can't be right. She already knew she was a sinner. There's no evidence in this passage that she pretended not to be a sinner. MacArthur misses the obvious reason. The Lord made his declaration about our daughter's past to prove to her that he was the Messiah. Notice that after he pointed out her infidelity, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. Why would she say that? Apparently because she had been taught that the Messiah would tell us all things. He would know things that no one else could know. Since Jesus revealed private details of her life that no stranger could have known, she wondered, is this the Messiah? So when Jesus confirmed that he was, she had evidently believed him. Left her water pot and went into the village and said, come, see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So Jesus didn't reveal the woman's sinful past because evangelism demands moral investigation and correction. The reason the Lord revealed the woman's sinful past was to convince her that he was the Messiah. He succeeded. Now, if Jesus had meant to teach the necessity of moral correction for everlasting life, we would expect to see him actually say that. But he does not. And we would expect to read the woman indeed change her life, her way of life. There's nothing in the text to support MacArthur's understanding of the passage. MacArthur's view of the passage is consistent with the text itself. Why? It seems that MacArthur had read his theology into the biblical text. His Puritan theology tells him that faith alone is not sufficient to be born again. So he imports it to the text, repentance, commitment, obedience, confession of the past sins. Are we to understand that the Lord Jesus, the perfect evangelist, failed to properly inform the woman of what she needed to do to have everlasting life? The lesson of true worship now is the acceptable time. During this talk, the Samaritan woman asked Jesus about the correct place to worship God. The Lord told her that, that where we would worship God is not important. What matters is whether we worship in spirit and truth. MacArthur believes the Lord gave the answer because he was leading the woman to see in order to be born again, he must transform her into true worshiper and living God. He adds the hour of salvation has come for her. She would willingly become a true worshiper. In other words, from MacArthur, Jesus answered. Killer Banana says, if you look at sanctification as a gift to receive and reject it, like, then I think you're viewed it in a different way. Okay. In other words, for MacArthur, Jesus' answer shows that the condition of everlasting life, or one of the conditions, since he believes there are many in becoming a true worshiper of God, is it possible to worship God and not do work? The answer is obviously no. If worship is a condition for everlasting life, then work is required to be born again. The only one, only way one can come to such a conclusion is by having a theological predisposition. The text itself does not in any way suggest that the Lord told the woman that the condition of everlasting life is to become a true worshiper of God. The lesson of the witness, this man received sinners. After Jesus revealed himself to the Messiah, the woman left her water pot, went into town and told the men what had happened, the first thing she declared was, come, see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Notice the question which she asked. This is the question which MacArthur fails to mention at this point. He, he somehow separates the question from the appeal by several paragraphs. Why? Possibly because he does not see the condition of everlasting life as believing that Jesus is the Christ. MacArthur implies the reason he revealed to her simple past was to convince her that she was a guilty sinner who needed forgiveness. Of course, neither the word forgiveness or the concept of forgiveness or release from shame and liberation from guilt, as MacArthur says, is anywhere in the account. MacArthur imports those ideas into the passage. Yet the woman's message to the men is clear. She is saying, I know this man is the Christ because he did what we know Messiah would do. He told me all things I ever did. MacArthur does not get around to mentioning her question to the men. What he does, he is correct in the reason the woman asked the question, could this be the Christ? 
rather than asserting directly that Jesus is the Messiah. It's because she had a low reputation and she was convinced a more subtle approach would have a better effect. Instead of saying what the text says, what the men in the village believe in Jesus, MacArthur says they responded to Jesus with zeal and they had a zealous reaction. But the Apostle John twice says that they believed in Jesus in verse 39 and 41. The emphasis is on the response of faith. Why then does MacArthur keep on emphasizing zeal, which is not mentioned in the text? The reason they mention zeal and not faith is because what, that's what his theology demands. Talking about zeal gets the impression of repentance, confession of sins, commitment, obedience, and everything else. MacArthur believes one must do to be born again. So instead of emphasizing what the text actually emphasizes faith, he offers up zeal. Conclusion. So what should we learn from the counter of the Lord Jesus with the woman at the well and later with the men at Sikar? MacArthur says that the lesson of the encounter is that the born again must confess and forsake the sin and must submit themselves to worship him in spirit and in truth. What MacArthur's interpretation illustrates is the stark difference between his gospel and Jesus' gospel. It's a prime example how MacArthur reads his theology into God's word rather than simply trying to understand what the text means. The point of Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well is this. Anyone can believe that Jesus is the Messiah who guarantees everlasting life to all who believe in him. Even an immoral woman who had not changed her ways and who are not seeking after God can believe in the Messiah upon hearing his promise. That whoever John 3.16 is powerfully illustrated by the Samaritan woman in John 4. Good point. Alright, so we're talking about the footnotes. Chapter 5. He receives sinners but refuses the righteous. Imagine someone too terrible to be a Christian. I mean, someone so awful, horrible, wicked, that no one in his right man would ever think he was a believer. Who would that be? What, what would he do? Frankly, I can't think of such a person. The blood of Christ atones for the sins of the whole world. No one is too evil to be born again by faith in Christ. However, MacArthur has an example of such a person. He heard about this vile fellow from his pastor's friend who said the fellow was a member of the Sunday school class. Oh yeah, this is the one that owned the bars. What did this awful man do? He owned a chain of liquor stores. Oh, the horror. Now you might not be disturbed, dear reader, by this tale, but apparently MacArthur was. In fact, he was so shocked at the idea of a Christian owning liquor stores that he wondered how, aloud how such a thing could be. How could someone who sell liquor store be born again? Isn't it obvious to man his head straight to hell? Well, it certainly isn't obvious to me, and I come out of an alcoholic family. I know what alcohol can lead to. I don't drink at all. Not even a drop. However, it is clear that the Bible doesn't forbid the drinking of beer and other distilled drinks. After all, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into real wine. And it wasn't just any type of wine, but the very best wine. Paul told Timothy to drink some wine for his stomach and other ailments. And the psalmist said that wine gladdens the heart. So while we are commanded not to get drunk, contrary to what MacArthur would have others believe, we are not forbidden from drinking or even from selling liquor. Though I don't drink, I would be glad if no one in the world drank. I am unwilling to go beyond what scripture says on this or any other matter. Sometimes one of my friends has a glass of wine or beer while I'm at, while I'm with them. I never take offense or ask them to stop. That would be intruding on his personal freedom when I'm not tempted to drink or offended by his action. MacArthur assumes that if a man makes a living by selling liquor, then he must be morally bankrupt. As it happens, MacArthur finds out some other unsavory details about the liquor store owner's life. Specifically, we are told the man has been divorced. However, this isn't necessarily an example of a sin. The Lord allowed for divorce from a marriage in one case only, sexual infidelity. But even if he was guilty of breaking up his marriage, are we to believe that the divorced people are condemned to hell? Are we are also told that the liquor store owner was living with the young girl, the implication being they weren't married and that she was younger than he was. If so, yes, it is simple to have marital relations with someone and not be married to the person. So the false professor in MacArthur's story owns some liquor stores, is divorced and living with a younger woman. The first action is not a sin. The second action is ne isn't necessarily a sin, but the third action is sinful, assuming they're not married. So the man is a sinner, though, of course, we already knew that. But MacArthur wants us to take this man as an example of a wanton rebellion against God's standard. Wanton rebellion? And more than that, he wants us to agree that this is the example of someone who is clearly not born again. But isn't this illustration a big week? If if that's the worst example MacArthur can present, then it's no wonder why so many Lords of Salvation people lack assurance. Can any of us really say that we're much better than this man in the eyes of God? 
think of what we would mean for the rest of us. And MacArthur's correct and anyone who sells beer or other alcohol is probably not born again. That would include not only those who own liquor stores, bars, restaurants, grocery stores, convenience stores, and all other places to sell beer, wine, and spirits, but also anyone who works in a place that sells beer, wine, or liquor. Let me list some people who fit their profile. Waiters and waitresses, bartenders, beer, wine, and liquor distributors, grocery store clerks, anyone who works at Walmart which sells wine, people who work in breweries and wineries and distilleries, importers to import beer, wine, and spirits, those who own vineyards, those who make games and bottles for alcohol, those who make labels for alcohol, those who drink beer and drive beer and wine trucks, caterers, and people who run wedding chapels. But it gets worse. MacArthur Ross implies that divorced people aren't born again, nor are people who are living together. But why stop there? Why not include alcoholics and drug addicts? Oh, wait a minute. MacArthur does include those people because he says that in order to experience justification by faith, one must let go of sin. What kind of sin does he have in mind? Later in the book, he mentions three vice lists, which he says refers to people whose sins show they're going to hell. Those vice lists include the sins of covetousness, outbursts of anger, jealousy, and envy. Does he really mean to say that believers who struggle with jealousy brew, they're unregenerate? Yes, he does. Immediately after quoting these vice lists, MacArthur just says we must persevere or else we won't make it to the kingdom for Paul. Perseverance in the faith is essential evidence that faith is real. If a person ultimately and finally falls away from the faith, it proves the person never was redeemed to begin with. It is true that owning... Is it true that owning liquor stores and struggling with jealousy disqualifies a person from spending eternity with the Lord? No, please don't misunderstand. Sin is a serious business. We do need to call for believers and non-believers to turn from sin. We should be deeply concerned that believers live righteous lives that honor God. It should grieve us when we hear of a pastor or church leader or believer who has a moral fault. But to link the eternal destiny of people with their behavior is to pervert, pervert the gospel of Christ. Over 30 years ago, during a chapel message at DTS, one of my professors, some seminary professor, Dr. Howard Hendricks, who recently went to be with the Lord, said that we must not front load the gospel in order to improve the quality of people in the church. He was right. That's cool. That came from Hendricks. Nominalism and carnality are problems in the church, but the solution isn't to compromise the freeness of the gospel promise while making it depend upon works. If we want people to grow spiritually, we must call them to follow Christ and teach them about such things as grace, belief, everlasting life, God's discipline, and blessing and cursing motif, eternal rewards, and the possible approval and praise of the judgment seat of Christ. But we dare not tweak the message of everlasting life in a misguided effort to improve the quality of people in our churches coming to grips with sin. When MacArthur speaks of salvation, it means regeneration or salvation from eternal condemnation. He condemns the belief that regeneration is only the granting of eternal life, not necessarily the liberation of sinner from the bondage of his iniquity. In other words, MacArthur is implying that true regeneration includes liberating the sinner from sin in one's experience. Interesting. Of course, everyone should know that Paul taught that believers have been liberated from sin's bondage. For example, Paul said, And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. This is true in our position. Let me get a Harper and Pill. Killer banana said while you are taking your right. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with another and his blood cleanses us from all sin. I personally don't see walking in the light is necessarily good behavior. Yeah, it's walking in the it's walking in the revelation of God's word, I believe. Walking in doctrinal fellowship. Okay, mute Asabaco, please. Oh sorry. No problem. However, we should also know the apostle taught that born again believers are not necessarily liberated in our experience. Notice that in Romans 6, Paul also says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. 
by urging Christian people who have everlasting life not to let sin dominate their experience. Paul was showing that they might allow that to happen. MacArthur says that God has set believers free from sin's bondage in our experience. If so, then why would he, uh, any believer ever sin at all? Uh, will we sin in the eternal future? Uh, I mean, why would we have to cleanse you from all sin and behaving well already? I agree with Chris Morrison on this. This is Dr. No Fellowship. Yeah, that's the way I argued in my debate with uh, Church of Fan. All right. Will we stand in the turn of the future when we have glorified bodies? Of course not. Then we will be free from sin's bondage in our experience. But now we are still in our mortal bodies and we still fall short of the glory of God every day. If God's intention were to keep believers in this life from sinning, the believers in this life would never sin. God does not tell us why he allows believers to sin or why he even allows believers to enslave to sin in their experience. The implication for various texts of scripture is that he keeps us in flawed bodies from now because this life is a test to determine our position in the Lord's coming kingdom. We will be judged for the things done in the body, that is, in our fallen bodies. Charles, I thought you agreed First John was about our practical Christian walk and discipleship, not the doctrine of salvation. I do agree. I do agree, but it's about doctrinal fellowship. So, yeah, I take First John as experiential. So I'm not. I'm not sure where where you're misunderstanding me. Go back and watch my debate with Turton fan. All right. Yeah, I got it. I'll go back to that one. That's Sawako, the killer banana one. Uh, peaceful banana. We've already cleansed from our sin. I'm talking about the practical Christian walk. They're two separate things. But the practical walk is walking out our new identity in Christ. Yeah, but it's still doctrinal. Killer banana. The truth is we don't believe in about salvation either. A believer who has a completely wrong view about Jesus and rejects apostles is out of fellowship. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So so they're they're discussing that. Janet, we will let them discuss that. They they look like they're having a great conversation. So we don't need to interfere unless they put TLS up there. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. But I will come in back after, you know, uh just come and go, okay? But I'm yeah, I'm listening that's fine. to you. You come and go. Come on, come on, come keep you know that song, right, Janet? Anyway. What kind of song is that? Come on, come on, chameleon, you come and go. Oh, chameleon. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. You, you are out of tone. Uh, tune. Well, show me how it's done, Janet. <laughs> Sing the song for us. No, I don't know the lyrics, but I All know right. the tone. <laughs> All right. All right. Got you. All right. MacArthur says that God has set believers free from the sin's bondage in our experience. If so, then why would any believer ever sin at all? We will sin in the eternity. Will we stand in the eternity of the future when we have glorified bodies? Of course not. Then we will be free from sin's bondage in our experience. But now we're still in our mortal bodies and we still fall short of the glory of God every day. If God's intention were to keep believers in this life from sinning, the believers in this life would never sin. God does not tell us why he allows believers to sin or why he even allows believers to be enslaved to sin in their experience. The implication for various texts of scripture is that he keeps us in flawed bodies for now because this life is a test to determine our position in the Lord's coming kingdom. We will be judged for the things done in the body, that is, in our fallen bodies. I long for the day when I will sin no more at all, and such MacArthur does as well. But the fact is that we long for the day shows that there's no guarantee that it's a life of believers will never fall. How much of righteousness does it take to call our eternal destiny into question? Following MacArthur's logic, any sin in our lives should lead us to have doubts about whether we are born again. Is sin the issue? Sin is serious business. Sin destroys, which is why the Bible warns it against it. But in the grand scheme of things, how central should sin be in evangelistic presentation? MacArthur says sin is no preferable issue as far as salvation is concerned. It is the issue. What then does MacArthur think was the point of Jesus shed blood? Did Jesus not take away the sins of the world when he died on the cross as a substitute for all of mankind? Is he not the propitiation not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world? The atonement guaranteed to sin isn't the issue anymore in terms of regeneration. As Lewis Ray Shaper, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, said, because of the cross of Christ's people no longer have a sin problem, they have a son problem. 
Do you see the difference between the Jesus Schaefer and MacArthur? MacArthur said the issue in salvation is our sin. Thus, MacArthur points people to themselves. The solution MacArthur implies is for us to deal with our own sins by turning from them and determine not to live that way any longer. We must have a longer to turn from them. By contrast, Schaefer pointed out people to Jesus. Jesus took a, a sin away. He reconciled the word of God. He paid for our sin by dying on the cross for us. So sin is not the issue anymore. Faith in Jesus for everlasting life is the issue. Do you believe in him for the promise of everlasting life? In order to make his point that people cannot be saved without coming to grips with the heinous of sin, MacArthur gives a number of examples of people who repented or had some sort of conviction of sin. Interestingly, although MacArthur is trying to argue that the experience of turning from sin is necessary to be born again, many of his examples are people who are already born again at the time they repented. Amen. Peter was already born again when he lamented his sinfulness in Luke 5, 8. Job was as well when he repented. So was Isaiah when he said he was a man of unclean lips. Uh, were all the examples of people who turned to sin in order to be born again? More to the point, why doesn't MacArthur deal with the fact that repentance is not even mentioned in John's Gospel, which is the only evangelistic book in the Bible? When the Lord evangelized Nicodemus, he didn't even mention sins of turning from sins. If sin is the main issue in evangelism, then why didn't the Lord Jesus mention sin in Nicodemus? Why isn't repentance found in some of the most beloved evangelistic verses in the Bible, like John 1, 3, 5, 6, 11, 20, Acts 16, Romans 4, Galatians 2, Ephesians 2, Titus 3, Revelation 22? Why isn't repentance found in Paul's defense of the gospel in Galatians? Why doesn't Paul mention repentance when he answers questions, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16. MacArthur's position is inconsistent with scripture, receiving sinners. MacArthur goes on to appeal to the example of Matthew, the tax collector. Since the passage doesn't mention repentance, MacArthur naturally has to speculate. So we imagine the following scenario. Deep down in the heart, he, Matthew, the tax collector, must have longed to be free from this life of sin, and it must have been uh, why he virtually ran to join Christ. Nothing in Matthew 9 implies any of this. The truth is, we really don't know how what motivated Matthew or the other disciples to follow Jesus. So why does MacArthur imagine that Matthew must have wanted to follow Jesus in order to be free from the life of sin? The reason is because in the previous section, he claimed that one must long to be free from sin's bondage in order to be born again. He needed evidence to support his position, but instead of finding actual evidence for his view, he speculated. Jesus invited Matthew to follow him. Matthew followed him. MacArthur understands the call to follow Jesus as a call to everlasting life. And yet we know from John 6 that some unbelievers follow Jesus. Is MacArthur suggesting that, that all who follow Jesus were born again? No. Is he suggesting that anyone who follows him today is born again? No. He is not saying that either. What he is saying is that the follow of Jesus is one of the many conditions necessary to spend eternity with the Lord. That Matthew as a tax collector was regarded by the Pharisees of his day is one of the worst of sin is certainly true. But MacArthur builds an entire section about Matthew's supposed repentance when turning from sins is not mentioned in any of the text he cites, refusing the righteous. In this final section, MacArthur brings in repentance once again. The gospel quoted that Jesus was first of all a mandate for repentance. MacArthur rightly says that Jesus began his preaching with a call to repent, but he fails to get the entire quote. Jesus, like his forerunner, said to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The call is not evangelistic. Jesus preached repentance. The issue he was discussing was not individual salvation from hell, but the coming of the kingdom for the nation of Israel. In order for the kingdom to come to Israel, the entire nation must believe in Jesus for everlasting life and be repentant. This would be true at the end of the tribulation, but neither the Lord nor John the Baptist were evangelizing when they said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were inviting the nation to prepare to receive the kingdom. Of course, if the nation had repented, it would have also come to faith in Jesus for the promise of everlasting life. And then the Lord Jesus would have died on the cross, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, returned to establish his kingdom seven years later after the tribulation would have ended in AD 40. But the seed in the call of repentance to offer everlasting life to the people in the church age or any ages to misunderstand scripture. Conclusion. MacArthur argued that repentance turning from sin is the essential condition for being born again. The truth that there are many people who will only believe in Jesus' promise of an everlasting life after repenting, but that isn't true of anyone. But that isn't true of everyone, and it isn't absolutely necessary. There are thousands of different ways to come to the point of believing in Jesus for eternal life. How we arrive at the point of believing in Jesus isn't the key. The key is we come to believe his promise. But MacArthur won't have that. He believes that there are multiple conditions for the new birth. 
not just believing in Jesus. One of those conditions is turning from sins, that there are many other conditions which he lays out in the gospel according to Jesus. Submission, confession, obedience, perseverance. Remember the liquor store owner, MacArthur did not discuss whether the man repented, submitted, confessed, and obeyed in the past. This wasn't MacArthur's concern. His issue was the man that he was currently sending. The liquor store owner illustrated the need for perseverance. One must continue to repent and obey and submit and confess in order to be able to enter the common kingdom. If MacArthur really knew you, would he conclude you were born again? Maybe. But know this. If you were to backslide, he would surely doubt your salvation. Not because of what you would believe, but because the quality of life he did below the standard he sees as necessary. MacArthur's view begs the question, how good is good enough? As senior in college, I first heard about the free gift of everlasting life to all who simply believed him. It was a campus crusade for Christ's meaning called College Life. I initially rejected the idea as silly. That would mean the sinners could be saved just as they were. Yet I heard enough scripture the night that I began to worry. What if this is correct? I had turned from my sins. I committed my eternal life, entire life to God. I was obeying him as best as I could, but did not believe this faith alone message. If it is required to believe that, then I was unsaved, no matter my works. I met with Campus Crusade for Christ staff meter Warren Wilkie for four weeks running. I can't remember much of what he said then. That was over 40 years ago, but I remember he quoted Ephesians 2 8 over and over again every time we met. For by grace you have been saved through faith, but not as self, it's a gift of God, not a word as anyone should boast. I'd ask him about difficult verses that seem to teach that we could lose everlasting life, and he gave me a brief explanation, and then he quoted Ephesians 2 8 again. By the end of the month, I was convinced. I became sure of my eternal destiny. That was the fall of 1972. I came to believe that I had been saved by God. grace through faith and apart from works. There's no ground of boasting. I've not doubted my eternal destiny since. The reason is simple. Jesus is trustworthy. He promises everlasting life to the, all those who believe in him. I believe in him, therefore I'm secure in his love. How about you? So he's talking, not strictly speaking, evangelistic verses. Uh, written to, let me read this. It should be noted that Romans 4, Galatians 2, Ephesians 2, they are not strictly speaking evangelistic verses. They are written to believers reminding them what the evangelistic message is. However, I include them here since they do explain the sole condition of regeneration and justification and faith in Christ. That's cool. Alright, he opens blind eyes. Introduction. Does a new birth always lead to noticeable and lifeline changes in someone's behavior? MacArthur thinks it does, as he writes, If salvation is truly a work of God, it cannot be deficient. It cannot fail to impact the individual's behavior. It cannot leave his desires unchanged or his conduct unaltered. It cannot result in fruitless life. It is the work of God that will continue steadfastly from its inception to ultimate perfection. What biblical proof does MacArthur cite in defense and decency select John 9 in the account of Jesus healing the blind man? Yet John 9 doesn't support his claim that the new birth guarantees a life of holiness. The problem with appealing to John 9. There are four reasons why John 9 does not prove that saving faith always leads to noticeable and permanent change in one's own behavior. First, there's no mention of everlasting life or salvation in this entire chapter. There are scores of texts in John's Gospel which specifically say that Jesus promised everlasting life to all believing him. There's not one of them. Second, we don't know when the blind man became born again. It is impossible to know if he was born again before he was healed, after he was healed, but before he saw Jesus, or when he believed that Jesus is the Messiah. Or if he was an Old Testament saint like John the Baptist, Simeon, or Anna, and was born again before he knew that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God. Third, and most significantly, the chapter gives no indication that the man's behavior changed. Let me say that again. He, there's no indication that the man's born the more blind bad did uh, the man born blind did after he worshipped Jesus. Did he become a follower of Christ? Did he confess Christ? Did he live a godly life? Did he marry and have kids? How did he handle his finances? Did he persevere in faith and good works? The Apostle Paul, uh, John does not tell us. Fourth, even if John 9 had taught that the man born blind became an apostle or wrote half of the New Testament to die for his faith, that would still not prove that every believer preserves in holiness. John 9 is in addressing the question of whether regeneration always produces a life of holiness. The ninth chapter of John shows the reader that the Lord Jesus is willing and ready to heal spiritual blindness. Anyone who wishes to know Jesus is the Messiah will receive spiritual sight reading it to the text. MacArthur speculates when he says that the blind man initially was regenerate, having not come to the full faith in Christ. What indications are there in the chapter that this man was unregenerate? We are not told. And what does full faith in Christ mean? Did the man have partial faith in Christ? What is partial faith in Christ? Does partial faith in Christ lead to partial regeneration and partial changes in behavior? MacArthur is surely correct when the man believes certain things about Jesus between the time he was healed 
and before he worshipped them. For example, the blind man believed that Jesus was the prophet, that he was sent from God. Evidently, MacArthur considered this to be faith in Christ, but not full faith in Christ. What MacArthur probably means is that it's possible to believe some correct truths about Jesus, and yet not believe in him in the biblical sense. He accuses the critics of having a tendency to identify the object of faith as a basic set of biblical facts about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Yet those of us in the free grace camp would actually agree with MacArthur that believing in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection does not necessarily mean one believes in them in the biblical sense. Most people in Christianity believe those truths and yet are not born again because they believe in works salvation, not salvation by grace through faith apart from works. MacArthur defines full faith, which he also calls true faith in this way. True faith embraces not only the data of the gospel, but the person of Christ as well. The gospel causes not simply for the acquiescence of the mind, but for the full surrender of the heart, soul, mind, and strength. Elsewhere in the gospel recorded that Jesus MacArthur indicates that faith includes repentance, commitment, submission, obedience, and perseverance. In reality, the object of saving faith that Jesus promised whoever believes in him has everlasting life. No one biblical facts about Jesus' his death on the cross for our sins and his body resurrection for the dead might lead you to believe the promise of life. But believing those facts is not saving anyone unless he also believes the promise of everlasting life to the one who simply believes in Jesus. However, contrary to MacArthur, there's insufficient evidence in the text of John 9 to conclude that the blind man was not yet born again. This is, we did not know whether he believed in the Messiah for everlasting life when he was blind, when he was healed, or when Jesus identified himself as the Messiah. What is certain with the man born blind and belief in Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, he should apply the same argument to John 3 and to John 4, but they don't do it yet. Maybe eventually they will. So then I will. Do we need to be theologians to be regenerate? MacArthur ends the introduction of this chapter with these telling words. But when Jesus finished, when Jesus finished opening his demand more blind spiritual eyes, he worshiped Christ as Lord. It was not a theology lesson that brought about this transformation, but a miracle of divine grace. Is evangelism in some sense a theology lesson? Think about that before answering. What is theology? The what is a theology lesson? When you show your faith, you're trying to communicate truth about God. If so, is that not a theology lesson? Sure it is. Theology is the study of God, of God and His Word. They ask Miss God from which we get theology. Thus, when we evangelize someone, we tell them about God and what He has said in His Word. When evangelism is not a rocket science, it does involve clearly communicating the truth of John 3, 16, 5, 24, Ephesians 5, 28. There is content to be communicated. MacArthur assumes that the blind man was not born again. How does he know that? Based on what he writes here. It's because John tells us that this is the only letter that the man fell down before Jesus and worshipped him. He worshipped Jesus, and that was evidence of his transformation. But even according to MacArthur's own theology, that can't be right. In MacArthur's view, born-again people are known by their lifelong faith and obedience. We cannot be sure of the eternal destiny of anyone prior to death, and because it's always possible that their worship, commitment, and obedience will not last, if a person worships and obeys Jesus for a time, and in that time of temptation falls away, according to MacArthur, he proves he's never really born again in the first place. Commenting on the parallel discussion of the second soil and the parable of the four soils in Matthew 13. So it's terrific that the blind man worshiped Jesus. It's a good thing, but it's not proof that a miracle of divine grace happened. And MacArthur's Lordship salvation is correct. It remains to be seen whether anyone who is still living is born again or not. According to MacArthur, one must persevere in faith and good works until death in order to prove that he's truly regenerate. The man in John 9 has certainly not done that yet. The physical miracle. MacArthur believes that blind man was regenerate up until Jesus spoke with him and was asked if he believed in the Son of God. He is not alone in this view. Many commentators say the same thing. But is that true? For one thing, unlike any other evangelistic encounter in John's Gospel, the Lord never once mentioned the promise of everlasting life to those who believe in him. Why would Jesus leave out the crucial message? The Lord would do so if the, if the man was an Old Testament saint who was already born again before he saw him. It is most likely that the man either was born again before his healing or sometime between his healing. In the end of the questioning by the Pharisees, the Old Testament believer was one who believed in the coming Messiah for everlasting life, but who did not yet know who he was. John the Baptist, for example, was born again before he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. MacArthur's view is that the man was born again because at the end of the encounter became commitment to Christ and determined to follow him. There are two problems with this view. First, the Lord repeatedly taught that the sole condition of the new birth is faith in them. John 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and 11. Regeneration cannot be both by faith alone and by faith plus repentance, submission, worship, obedience, dedication, and perseverance. Second, John does not indicate that the man born blind pledged to follow Jesus. Possibly after he worshiped, he did make such a commitment. But it's not stated in the passage. Indeed, there's no record in John to send out the Gospels or anywhere in the New Testament that the man born blind 
follow Jesus for the rest of his life. The Inquisition. In this section, MacArthur Marcus said the blind man boldly stood up for Jesus in front of a very hostile crowd of religious leaders and makes a pointed comment about the Pharisees. The Pharisees had heard the testimony. They had seen the miracle. They still, uh, uh, and they still, they were not swayed. Thirds was hard and vicious and determined unbelief. MacArthur is correct. Any reasonable person should not come to faith in Jesus Christ from this one miracle alone, let alone all of his miracles. Yet the Pharisees were hardened in unbelief. While we can't be sure, it appears the man born blind, at least by this point, believed in Jesus. The spiritual miracle. MacArthur correctly says that God is sovereign in regeneration. Salvation always results because God first pursues sinners, not because sinners first seek God. However, the biblical presentation of God's pursuit of sinners is somewhat different from what MacArthur proposes. No doubt, he is thinking along predestinarian lines. He cites John 15, 16 and supported the principle of God's pursuit. But since the statement is about the Lord choosing the twelve to be disciples, including one Judas, who never believed and never was born again. It's interesting. He agrees with me there. Of course, he doesn't believe Judas is a disciple. But anyway, that probably wasn't the best verse to choose. Luke 19 is more to the point. Even better is Roman 3.11, which MacArthur says, but not quote. It is true that no one seeks God unless God first seeks him. However, contrary to MacArthur's view, God is seeking everyone, not just a chosen few. That is what the Lord says in John 12. And if I'm lifted up, the earth will draw all people to myself, the Lord and draw and all. The, uh, the words people, the word peoples is not in the text. Likewise, the Apostle John in his prologue said, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Every man is given light. MacArthur goes a bit too far, presenting the illustration of physical and spiritual blindness. The blind man in John 9 did not gain his sight because he was exposed to the light. No amount of light affects blindness. The narrative shows that MacArthur has read the theology into the passage. It was precisely because the blind man was exposed to the light. That is the light of the word that he gained physical and spiritual sight. Light in John's gospel clearly affects blindness, despite MacArthur's claim. This is one of the puzzling aspects of his book. Wonderful observations and interpretations are followed by non sequitur pronouncements. In addition to John 1 9, started above, noted the following statements in John about the light. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. I have come as light of the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. As you can see, one of those, I am on the light of the world, statements comes right from John 9. Yet MacArthur not only does not mention it, he denies the exposure to Jesus in his words, and which leads to the new birth or traditional spiritual insight for one who is already born again. MacArthur's Calvinism seems to have led him to deny one aspect of what the text is highlighting. In this passage, Jesus revealing himself to be the light of the world. He not only opens his eyes physically, but also spiritually. Exposure to the light is indeed the cure for spiritual blindness. This is why it's wise to encourage unbelievers to read the Gospel of John. While all scriptures inspired a proper, John's Gospel is uniquely suited for evangelism since that is his purpose. I encourage those who lack assurance of everlasting life to read a chapter a day of John's Gospel to those and, and to do so prayerfully. Ask God to show you the truth about assurance. Can I be sure that all who simply believe in the Lord Jesus have everlasting life that can never be lost? Please show me, Lord, as I read. In three weeks, a person can read the entire Gospel of John. I encourage people to read it as many times as it takes to gain assurance. But it is God's word, not God's works. Repentance, submission, confession of sins, commitment, obedience, and perseverance that lead to the miracle of spiritual sight and the new birth. Conclusion. John 9 does not support Lordship salvation. It does not show the worship of the Lord is conditioned for receiving eternal life. It does not show the believers will manifest changed lives for the moment of their new birth until they die or are raptured. Most generally, there is no indication in John 9 or in all of John's gospel that one must turn from the sin, submit to the Lordship of Christ, and persevere in obedience until the death in order to be born again. So it's talking about the passages in the Old Testament. Talking about evangelism. Talking about Nicodemus a little bit. It's hyperly important that Judas came to faith after he betrayed Jesus. That is extremely unlikely. First, he had come to faith. Why would he kill himself? Really? Is that your argument? In that case, I saw he would have every reason to believe a mighty witness for Jesus. Second, if he did come to faith, surely the gospel writers tell us. Third, Jesus called him the son of perdition. Well, this is not a strong argument. Um, 
Anyway, that's not the topic of this stream. He challenges our eat your secret. Introduction. If you were on an airplane and some next to you asked how to have a relationship with Jesus, what would you say? Ask my wife, right? She got saved on a plane. Whatever scripture would you go to? MacArthur thinks the story of the rich young ruler would help. The story is a good litmus test for telling if someone believes in salvation by faith or if they believe in salvation by faith, what's worse? Leaving on a jet plane. MacArthur opens chapter 7 with an illustration of what he now thinks is the wrong way to do evangelism. One day he was on a plane when the man next to him asked how to have a relationship with Jesus. MacArthur told the man to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as his Savior. He did not tell the man to turn from his sins or submit to Christ. He only needed to believe. Later the month later, MacArthur baptized the man. And soon after, MacArthur discovered that he had no continuing interest in the things of Christ. MacArthur became convinced that the problem he had was shared the wrong message on the plane. MacArthur never asked the man to acknowledge his sinfulness. He went on. And I think back to my conversation with the man on the airplane. I realized that this is when I failed. Too hastily offered him Christ for his psychological needs without compelling him to acknowledge his sinfulness. The salvation I described to him had a man were focused rather than a God were focused. This is certainly a problem with converts who do continue in discipleship. Anyone who's been in ministry for any length of time has seen people drop out of church, stop reading their Bibles, and even stop following with Christ. The solution is to miss everyone who falls away is a false professor as MacArthur does. But the solution creates an even bigger problem. It means that no one, not even MacArthur himself, can be sure of eternal destiny. Since no one can be sure he will preserve in faith and good works, no one can be sure he will make it into the God's presence and perseverance is required. In the introduction to this chapter, MacArthur suggests the story of the rich young ruler is one of the most straightforward presentations of the gospel according to Jesus. Yet the rich young ruler passage has not been regarded as a tough text for those who believe in justification by faith alone apart from works. To say the rich young ruler passage is one of the most straightforward presentations of the gospel according to Jesus is troubling. One wonders that the reason MacArthur says is because he found in the text one that is easily adaptable to his lordship salvation teaching. He goes on to say the term sick eternal life is used about 50 times in scripture. Actually, expression eternal life, everlasting life occurs 98 times in the New Testament. Yet the statement which follows is far more inaccurate. It always refers to conversion, evangelism, the new birth, the entire salvation experience. He does not offer any evidence to support his statement. It is merely an unsupported claim. The evidence contradicts the claim. One of the uses of the expression eternal life occurs at the end of this passage in Matthew 19, 29, where the Lord promises the 11 believing disciples that they would inherit eternal life. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. As a result of their service to him. But the 11 already had eternal life in the sense of the new birth. The Lord, I need to, folk, I need to remember that verse. I, I, I should... Already have that verse memorized. I don't know why I've over not internalized that verse. That makes things so much simple. All right. The Lord was not saying that if the disciples preserved his service, that they would in the future be born again. That makes no sense. Everlasting life is something presented in the New Testament as a possible future reward for work done. Okay. All right. I like this. It is properly believed that the afterlife will be the same for all Christians. But that is the truth. Jesus, Jesus said he came that he might have a life and that we might have it more abundantly. The believer who perseveres will inherit a fuller life, fuller than uh, forever than the believer does not. Compare Galatians 6, 8, 9, where he sows to the flesh, through the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good for the new season we shall reap, but we do not lose heart. Paul's talking to people who already have everlasting life, yet he says that they himself Note that we in verse 9 can reap everlasting life. Yeah. That is, they can earn it by the works done and they continue to do good. This is not the message of the new birth described in Ephesians 2 8 and John 3 16. This is the message of the potential fullness of life that awaits the believer who perseveres in doing good works. Before leaving the introduction to chapter 7, MacArthur offers his conclusions about the rich young ruler. First, he says there's no way he, the rich young ruler, would get away without receiving eternal life. Then MacArthur reverses course and says, but he did. He left without receiving eternal life. Not because he heard the wrong message, not even because he did not believe, but because he was unwilling to forsake what he loved most in the world and commit himself to Christ as Lord. Notice the words, not even, because he did not believe. According to MacArthur, the rich young ruler believed in Christ, and yet he left without everlasting life. This is a contradiction. Many times in the gospel according to Jesus, MacArthur says that anyone who has faith in Christ is everlasting life. 
Here, MacArthur indicates that the man believed in Christ, and yet he was not born again. Of course, it's true that MacArthur indicates in many places that he takes a special type of faith in Christ to be born again. He calls a special type of faith in Christ true faith, genuine faith, full faith, repentant faith, obedient faith. He calls what they consider faith in Christ will not say spurious faith, false faith, favor and sign Spurgeon, false faith, false profession of faith, and false assurance. According to MacArthur, good works are the difference between faith in Christ that saves and faith in Christ that does not save. MacArthur is convinced that faith in Christ by itself will not save anyone. Faith in Christ must be joined with a lifetime of good works in order for someone to be born again. Faith in Christ plus a life of good works equals salvation. Faith in Christ without a lifetime of good works equals eternal condemnation. Here is a place where MacArthur slipped, where he said the rich young ruler had faith in Christ. He did not say he had spurious faith, false faith, or the like. MacArthur is correct when he says, our ideas of evangelism cannot indict Jesus. Rather, he must judge contemporary methods of evangelism. This is true, for all believers must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There he will evaluate our entire lives, including how we evangelize. Yet one wonders why MacArthur chose a non-evangelistic text to discuss Jesus' method of evangelism. In this text, the Lord does not even mention believing in him. Instead, he points to rich young men to the law of Moses. This is something that MacArthur, by his own admission, is linky dispensationalist, does not do. Why didn't MacArthur choose an evangelistic text like John 5, 6, or 11? Probably he bypassed texts like that because those texts only call for belief in Christ. This text calls for the listener to do good works, so it does not mention faith in Christ. Interesting. So he's not even saying it's pre-evangelism there. He had the right move, motive. MacArthur summarized the rich young ruler's right motives as follows. This man came seeking eternal life. He knew what he wanted and knew he did not have it. What in the text leads to this conclusion? MacArthur does not say, evidently basing his conclusion on the question the man asks. Good tissue. What good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? What, why it was possible he wanted to present possession of eternal life and knew he did not have it. It is likely there's something else is going on here. Jews of the first century thought in terms of physical earthly kingdom in which Messiah would reign. It is likely that the man did not believe that eternal life was a present possession. He seems to think the good news, those who keep the law of Moses faithfully, would enter into everlasting life. That is into the kingdom when the kingdom began after the resurrection. MacArthur is writing with a 21st century church age mindset. But is that the way the rich young ruler was thinking? Man, I'm so glad that that uh, uh, Wilkin is is dealing with this like this because I didn't know that he was so similar to Dillo in this place. Was he thinking of being born again? That seems unlikely. He was not seeking to gain eternal life right now. He wanted Jesus' confirmation that he was unwell on his way into the kingdom because of good works. But when we produce the fruit of the, Janet, if you're going to put it up there, let me read it. Anyway, MacArthur's right in the 24th century church age mindset. But, is that the, but when we produce the fruit of the spirit, it motivates us to do good works. So that's why it's important to renew your mind on the gospel, positional truth so that the spirit can work through. I agree with that. Thank you, Yasawako. MacArthur, you can remove it now. MacArthur is right in the 21st century church age mindset, but is it that way the rich guy really was thinking? Was he thinking of being born again? That seems unlikely. He was not seeking to gain eternal life right now. He wanted Jesus' confirmation that he was unwell on his way into the kingdom because of his good works. Even MacArthur later suggested that what he was seeking was being alive to the realm which God dwells, walking with the living God in unending communion that God loved our life. Seems to be reading later New Testament theology into the man's thinking. Yes, believers have the potential to experience life in close communication with God, but there's no indication this is what the rich young ruler is seeking either. Okay. So what are you talking about then? Is the rich young ruler's motive right? Is he really seeking the Lord? Based on the entire conversation between him and Jesus, it seems the young ruler doesn't really want to hear what the Lord has to say unless what he says confirms his standing. Uh, I'm disagreeing with you now, Mr. Wilkin. MacArthur also says all his rigid and wealth had not given them confidence, peace, joy, or settled hope. Possibly with the text given an indication that he was quite confident. Until he hears the Lord's final answer, he claims to have kept the entire liar of Moses from his youth up. He certainly acts like he sees his wealth as a sign that God is pleased with him and with his works. The text does not give sufficient indication to show that this young man had the right motive. He had the right attitude. If the man's motive was suspect, so was his attitude. There is good reason to question 
MacArthur's suggestion that the Richard Wheeler was not haughty or presumptuous. For evidence, MacArthur turns to Mark's report of the incident. He tells us that the young man knelt before Jesus. This is a sign of respect at the least. Possibly this suggests he is not haughty. However, neither Matthew nor Mark is presenting this man as one whom anyone should emulate. It is hard to see evidence that his motive or attitude is right. He seems to want Jesus to validate his legalistic thinking. He came to the right source. MacArthur is correct when he says, but the young ruler had not come to just an evangelist that was the source of eternal life himself. The Lord Jesus is indeed the source of everlasting life. MacArthur continues with the excellent observation. Most people never find eternal life because they spend their entire lives looking in the wrong places. The Lord himself said so on many occasions. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Likewise, he said, he believes in me, has everlasting life. One of the statements to a legalist Jewish audience fits the encounter as well. You search the scriptures for and them, you think you have eternal life, and these are they which justify me, but you're not willing to come to me that they may have eternal life. John 5. Yet the Lord Jesus is indeed the source of eternal life. The rich and ruler came to the right source. He asked the right question. In this section, MacArthur says that the one thing we must do to have eternal life is this. We have to believe in Christ. Amen. This is true. As long as it's a belief, understood his persuasion alone. Jesus was not telling the man what he needed to do was to be born again. He was showing him the possibility of attaining everlasting life but good works. This is why the young man went away grieved. However, why is the statement does MacArthur make belief the condition of receiving eternal life? Well, elsewhere in the chapter and book, he makes a condition, confession, of sins, and submission to Christ. It is because for MacArthur, belief alone is not enough despite the biblical evidence to the contrary. This statement by to the contrary. This statement by MacArthur is excellent. Strictly speaking, Jesus' answer was correct. If a person could keep the law of his life and never violate a single jot or tittle, he would be perfect sinless. But no one except the Savior alone is like that. We are born in sin to suggest the law is meant to eternal life clouds the issue of faith. Unfortunately, this excellent statement is followed by a contradictory teaching about the same passage. The issue moves from simply believing in Jesus to obeying the Lord, being willing to forsake all for him and being willing to turn from sin possessions false religion and selfishness for MacArthur faith alone is not enough to obtain everlasting life he was filled with pride how is it that the man was humble and not haughty as MacArthur has already said and yet he was filled with pride those who contra those are contradictory statements how can both be true at the same time the common is worth additional consideration much of contemporary evangelism is woefully deficient when it comes to confronting people with the reality of their sin I suppose that would also be true if he held MacArthur's view of the evangelistic conversation that the Lord had with Nicodemus in John 3 and with the woman at the well in John 4. It would also be true of Jesus' comments to Martha in John 11. Even the Lord's conversation with the rich young ruler is not the type of confrontation that MacArthur and others, the way the master, promote. Notice that the Lord does not ask the man if he ever told a lie, cheated, or stole something. He just points to the second half of the Ten Commandments, the commandments related to a treatment of other fellow men. This is pre-evangelism and not evangelism. Okay, so now he's finally saying it. The Lord is indeed showing to the man that he's not sinless, though he's a mentally roundabout way. He does not directly say, you have lied many times in your life. You have stolen things you did not belong to you. Indeed, the Lord simply mentions the commandments and let them convict the man. Do all people need such confrontation? Evidently not, for the Lord rarely did this. Nor did we, the apostles, particularly doing this in their evangelistic sermons and acts. While this is a fine tool to have an evangelistic tool belt, it's wrong to think that most people fail to recognize their own sinfulness. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. Of course, MacArthur is absolutely correct when he later says, the pattern of the divine revelation confirms the importance of comprehending one's sinfulness. But most people are quite aware of their own sinfulness. Only those who have hardened themselves to the work of the Spirit actually fail to comprehend that they're sinful. Expanding on that point, MacArthur says in Romans, Paul speaks three full chapters declaring the simpleness of humanity before it begins to discuss the way of salvation. Let's see whether this is true in the first place. When Paul discusses in Romans 3, it's not the way of salvation, but the way of justification. The words saved and salvation are not found in the justification sanctification section of Romans. In Paul's letter to the believers of Rome, every use of the word saved, sozo, and salvation, soteria, refer to deliverance from God's temporal wrath, not salvation from hell. In the second place, the reason Paul describes sin so much in Romans 1 is because sin brings about God's wrath here and now. The legalist cannot escape the wrath of God because he's a sinner. He can only be set free from bondage to sin through justification. 
It is the bondage of sin that brings about God's temporal wrath. It is going beyond scripture to say it's meaningless to found on grace to someone who does not know the divine demand for righteousness. Everyone knows the divine demand for righteousness because of the convicted work of the Spirit. Even people who have never heard about the Bible know the Creator of the coming judgment of their own sinfulness. What they do not know is that God became a man and dealt with them on the sin problem, but dying the sins on the cross and rising from the dead. So they all believe in the God, man, the Lord Jesus, have everlasting life that can never be lost. Neither the Lord nor his apostles will truly mention the divine demand for righteousness in their evangelistic preaching. Was their effort meaningless? When we proclaim the message, John 3 16, John 6, or Ephesians 2 8, it is clear that the, apart from faith in Christ, we cannot have everlasting life. It's clear that everlasting life is a gift and that it's not works. There is no ground for boasting. So the message of grace has within it the idea that our best works are as filthy rags. Whether mentioned or not, once we say that the everlasting life is a gift and that it's only for those who believe in Jesus claims that work righteous are validated. Did not, he did not confess his guilt. While it's true the true rich young ruler did not confess his guilt, his problem was much bigger. The young ruler said, all these things I kept from my youth. What do I still lack? So not only does he fail to confess his guilt, he actually affirms his view that his works are sufficient to warrant kingdom entrance. He sounds like the people in Matthew 7, 22. MacArthur comments, Salvation is not for people who want an emotional live. It is for sinners who come to God for forgiveness. Those who are not ashamed of the sin cannot receive salvation. The first sentence is certainly true, though it is more accurate to say that we come to God for everlasting life, not for forgiveness per se. While it is true that when we believe we, to uh, we receive total positional forgiveness of all our sins, including our future ones, that is not the theme we typically find in evangelistic encounters recorded in Scripture. The second sentence is not quite true. There's no condition that people must be ashamed of the sin to be born again. What we must do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the everlasting life he promises. Nowhere in all the scriptures anyone told me must be ashamed of a sin to be born again. Of course, shame over one sin may lead a person to church and hearing the message of everlasting life. That shame might result in one hearing the message and then believing it, but shame is not a requirement. One need not hit bottom to be born again. How could children be born again if shame over the sin is required? What if adults who, like the rich young ruler, are fairly good people in the eyes of the world? The rich young ruler did not need to feel shame about his bad works. He needed to know that his very best works are his filthy rags before God. Clearly, if one's best works are not enough to grant one everlasting life, then the only way to life is faith in Christ, which is the Lord, and said again and again in his public ministry. MacArthur says, the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, the Lord of Jesus does not take sinners on their own terms. Amen. They must come to him on his terms. And what are his terms? Faith in him. That is the only way to be born again. Works will not do. Works don't work when it comes to the new birth. He would not submit to Christ. MacArthur's final section of the chapter is a bit speculative. The rich ruler does not immediately do what the Lord tells him to do. He goes away. However, the text does not tell us what happened later. He might have come to faith and even followed the Lord later. The bigger point, of course, is that the issue here is treasure in heaven, not regeneration of the future interests of the kingdom. Treasure in heaven is a reward or concept. MacArthur reverses himself momentarily when he says he, Jesus, was not saying that it's possible to buy eternal life with charity. Why not? And MacArthur is right. Treasure in heaven prefers the regeneration and spending eternity with the Lord. Then the Lord was indeed telling them he could buy everlasting life by obeying his commands to give everything away. MacArthur claims, in effect, he, the Lord Jesus, was saying, here is the test of true faith. Are you willing to do what I want you to do? That's not true. It's quite possible to believe something and yet not live in light of what you believe. How many pastors believe that they are in love their wives and yet they end up committing adultery? Does that mean that they didn't really believe that they should love their wives? Does that mean that they didn't really believe in Christ? Is it not conceivable that a believer in Christ might find it difficult to give away his cars, his computers, his boats, his home, his furniture, his external clothing, his golf clubs, his television, his savings, his retirement accounts, and everything he has? The essential mistake that MacArthur makes is the merchants to call it discipleship with the promise of everlasting life. For him, justification and sanctification are intertwined in faith because works of obedience. MacArthur says that Zacchaeus was willing to do anything, including getting rid of all of his wealth, to come to Jesus on his terms. This is not what the Luke reports in Luke 19. Luke quotes Zacchaeus as saying, Lord, Lord. I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I take in anything from anyone, by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Half of his good is not all of his wealth. More importantly, Zacchaeus did not be given, did not do this, but given to gain an everlasting life, which is what MacArthur suggests to come to Jesus on his terms. He did it out of things for already having an everlasting life. Zacchaeus was born again when he heard the Lord Jesus speaks and then came to faith in him. 
today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus became a son of Abraham spiritually that very day. Thus he gave half of his goods out of joy and gratitude. He did not do so in order to buy everlasting life. The last four paragraphs in the chapter are filled with contradictions. MacArthur says here that everlasting life is a free gift received purely by faith in Christ. And he also says that Christ will not give if one whose hands are filled with the other things. Those of those who are willing to turn from sin, profession, false religion, or selfishness will find they cannot turn to Christ in faith. Concluded. Re uh, conclusion. Re readers of the gospel recorded that Jesus should believe that MacArthur says about the freeness of everlasting life and the sole condition for receiving it, faith alone and Christ alone. If they do, they will be certain of their eternal destiny. But those who read gospel recorded Jesus should reject MacArthur's contradictory claims. That in order to attain everlasting life, one must turn from sins, yield everything to Christ, obey Him. If readers found to reject those contradictory claims, they will lack assurance of everlasting life and be trapped in the gospel of doubt. MacArthur merges justification and sanctification, discipleship, and the promise of life, and that has confused many people. Uh, he's talking about sinfulness and the footnotes uh, by Cornelius there. We'll come back to that in the future. I want to revisit this in the future, but not right now. He seeks and saves the lost. Let me get some more water. Yeah, um, peace, banana. Jello's view seems to be the best on the rich young ruler. Um, he seeks to save the lost. Luke 19, introduction. Is a dramatic change in our life that our desires prove the genuine salvation is taking place? Is that how we have assurance of our eternal destiny? MacArthur thinks so when he appeals to the story that key is to prove it. Search and rescue. The nature of God is to seek and to save sinners, says MacArthur, and he's right. It certainly is the point in Luke 19 and Luke 15. Of course, the saving the sinners is not limited to their regeneration. It also includes rescue and born-again people who have strayed, as the three parables of Luke 15 show. MacArthur quickly follows up this correct statement with the unsupported claim, the unequivocal teaching of Jesus that those who would not acknowledge and repent of their sin are beyond the reach of saving grace. What is the evidence for that claim? MacArthur says that Jesus' parable in Luke 18 underscores the truth. Though there's only one problem. The parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector does not mention repentance or turning from sins. So, so how did... No. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm doing busy now, so I think I need to go. Okay. okay. Well, in, in short... Yeah, okay. okay. Hmm. All right. Sure. I'll pray for you I'll now. Pray. This is about your children's ministry, right? Yes. All right. All right. Mute your mic. Father God, we come to you right now. My wife and I, as well as the people in the chat right now, and uh, the future audience that are going to see this video, Lord, that learn about Janet's ministry. Lord, we pray that as my, my home church, that will soon be Janet's home church when she arrives here, uh, supported her in, in our online ministry, basically of what Janet explained to me is Fifteen hundred dollar, sorry, fifteen hundred Filipino pesos to feed one meal for the children, which is equivalent of twenty five dollars uh, every Sunday. So that's twenty five dollars a week. And Lord, I mentioned this for the audience so they know how to pray specifically. But Lord, we thank you for your provision and what you've done, so that you can enable Janet to be able to, um, based on an anonymous donor. A donor to continue aspects of that ministry. Lord, I thank you for the other provision and the opportunities that you've given her. But Lord, we just pray right now as, she, as she's about to feed these children and teach the word and talk to them about you, Lord, that you will guide her in all of this. Lord, we pray for the future Filipinos that will be coming to this channel. And contrary to Charlie Michael's claim that this channel is propped up uh, by subscribers, promotion, and and manipulation and 
all that stuff, Lord. Uh, um, we just pray that that as we do promotion in that particular area, Lord, that you build from the internal network that we have of the many Filipinos that we taught over the years, Lord, and other people as well. Lord, you're not a discriminator of persons. And so we just pray that you bless Janet's ministry, bless these children, Lord, and bless any people that you draw. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Bye, guys. God bless. And, and if anybody wants to donate to uh, uh, feed uh, the children for a week. Hey, just, we just keep praying for that. Don't mention. Okay. All right. Okay. If someone asks me, I'll tell you how you can do it. Yeah, I'll but nobody asks you. Okay. So please. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Back to Mac back to MacArthur. Okay. Search and rescue. The nature of God is to seek and save sinners. Says MacArthur, and he's right. It certainly is the point in Luke 19 and Luke 15. Of course, the saving the sinners is not limited to the regeneration. Okay, it's getting too hot. I'm gonna have to crank up the fan on my air conditioner. <laughs> Another thing to keep in prayer, guys, is some of y'all probably saw me wince when I got up. My back's been bothering me because work has been getting hectic. And, uh, you know, eventually it'd be great, you know, to, to do full-time ministry with the Layman Seminary. There was a time whenever I didn't think that was possible, you know, because just how hard it is to get in the algorithm. But with this promotional stuff, you know, we may be able to grow to that point. I don't know. But uh, anyway, pray for me. You know, I, I've had professors that or that recommend. Let me let me turn off my camera for a second and just talk to y'all. I've had professors that recommend that uh, um, that a. Uh, uh, a, a seminary student become a full-time paid pastor and the reason they say that <clears throat> let me let me mention it for example the reason they say that it's because whenever you are a paid minister you can devote yourself fully to the ministry you, you, you're not bivocational. See, the reality is that the calling of the pastor or teacher is you do it whether you get paid or not. Okay? But, as my pastor has said, and I think it's a good principle to go by, is you either pay a pastor in time or money. So, when you pay a pastor in time, what, what you're doing, and I can't remember exactly how it works, but essentially what he's saying is, look, you need to give him the time to go work to provide for his family if you're not going to pay him a wage for being a pastor. And most churches are going to bivocational uh, ministries. In other words, where the pastor is a pastor, but he also works a full-time job. But the reality is, is that when he's working that job, he, it limits what he can do as a pastor. Okay. And um, a lot of churches that are poor, especially since after COVID, because a lot of churches shrunk, uh, they are trying to go to this more by vocational uh, model. Okay. Some are going with plurality of elders and, you know, spreading it all around. Some are even going by pure volunteers. But regardless of all that, you know, 
the thing is, is that if you're a paid minister and that's the only thing you can do, you could focus in, you can make, you can teach what you need to teach. You can meet the needs of everything. All right. But the drawback of being a paid pastor or minister is you don't have as much freedom. Now, you should always have accountability. Okay. I'm not going against that. Uh, if I'm sitting low, it's because my back's bothering me right now. But it, um, you uh, you should always have accountability, you know, whether that's on board or whatever. Um, but they will tell you, you know, I got one professor I have. He, uh, I think he owns real estate or whatever. And he'll say, I don't take money for ministry, but I run this so that I don't have to do that. So they're... Tr but the issue is, is uh, if you got that type of income coming in and you can do full-time ministry, that's a perfect situation, right? But most people, they're having to work two full-time jobs. So it's when we think of bivocational, people think part-time, but that's not really what's going on. You know, it, it's you're having to do two full-time jobs. According to Rainer in his studies, he said the average pastor spends about 10 hours of sermon preparation uh, uh, a week, okay? When you read MacArthur's book, on average, if I remember right, in his book on biblical preaching, he said uh, you should spend 40 hours a week in sermon preparation, if I, if I remember right. I got it in Logos, so we ever need to look it up. But of course, a pastor doesn't just teach. A pastor visits. A pastor does all those other things. Now, the thing is, is that you can train people in your church who are gifted in particular areas to do visiting. You know, have the deacons and, you know, have all of that so that the pastor has more time to focus on preaching, exposition, developing people and all that. The thing about it is, is that what what often happens is in most churches is the pastor does everything and people in the pews they sit and listen and so i'm bringing it all circle back the drawback of me you know working full-time job and doing ministries i i never feel like i'm able to give enough you know uh it, and so it's frustrating because there's times where I want to go deeper, but at the same time, it's all about stewardship. That's one of the best things about seminaries. You learn how to manage your time, your relationships, all of those things, you know, uh, that are given to you from God, that you got to be a good steward, you know, and relationships and intimacy are more important than grades, you know? So there's that aspect of it. But anyway, just keep all that in prayer. Because, you know, the layman seminary one day may be full time. Uh, that's probably years down the road. But just pray for my back in the meantime. And pray Janet gets here soon. My goodness. All right. Back to the book. That was our short intermission. Search and rescue. All right. Man, I, I tried to fan and it's not working. So it's 70 degrees right now. Let's cool, let's cool it down. MacArthur quickly follows on the correct statement with the unsupported claim that an uh, unequivocal unequivocal teaching of Jesus is that those who would not acknowledge and repent of their sin are beyond the reach of saving grace. What is his evidence for that claim? MacArthur says that Jesus' parable in Luke 18 are the score is truth. There's only one problem. The parable of the Pharisees tax collectors does not mention repentance or turning from sins. So how does he prove that one must acknowledge and turn from sins to be born again? 
MacArthur's position is even more untenable when we look at the Gospel of John. Not one in the entire book that we find the word repent and repentance. We are never told that one who repents is everlasting life. Indeed, over and over again, the Lord says that the one who believes him has everlasting life. Faith in Christ is the one and only condition of regeneration in John. And of course, faith in Christ is the one and only condition of justification in Romans and Galatians as well. If, as MacArthur claims, we must acknowledge and repent of our sin in order to be saved, what about the woman at the well in John 4? She never acknowledged her sins to the Lord or indicated that she would turn from them. And Jesus didn't ask her to. Instead, she came to faith that Christ and was born again without repentance being mentioned. The same is true with the Lord told Nicodemus in John 3 and Martha in John 11. And if repentance and acknowledgement of sin was necessary to be in reach of saving grace, we wouldn't expect Paul to have mentioned in Ephesians 2 where he famously speaks of those who have been saved by grace through faith, but repentance is not mentioned there either. MacArthur compounds a confusion when he writes, humble repentance is the only acceptable response to the gospel according to Jesus. This contradicts what he said up until now. He also maintained that the acceptable response to Jesus' gospel includes repentance, confession, submission, obedience, perseverance. That's a more accurate concept, but the view would be the only acceptable response to the gospel according to Jesus or a recognition of a turning from sin, submission to Jesus. Lordship, confession to Christ, a firm commitment to obey him in all areas of life and perseverance and obedience unto death. The only saving response to the gospel according to Jesus' faith is the promise to give the believers everlasting life. This is no other object than saving faith. Humble repentance may be part of pre-evangelism. It might lead a person to church to seek God or to read the Bible, but repentance gives no one everlasting life. Only faith in Jesus does that, seeking the Savior. MacArthur opens his discussion as Zacchaeus with the claim that Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus. Although not on his own initiative, MacArthur speculates that being in the crowd meant that Zacchaeus was in danger of a well-placed elbow in the jaw, heavy boot on the big toe, or even a knife to the back. MacArthur continues to speculate, saying that Jesus had never met him Zacchaeus before. The text doesn't say that. Indeed, Jesus looked up and calls him by name, Zacchaeus. Make haste to come down, for today I'm staying at your house. Did Jesus know Zacchaeus from an earlier encounter, or was that a demonstration of Jesus' omniscience with the woman at the well in John 4? In any case, the text does not warrant a dogmatic assertion that Jesus had never met Zacchaeus before. MacArthur is more cautious when he admits that we do not know what the Lord said to Zacchaeus when he evangelized him. Though we do know that the Lord says today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. MacArthur now proposes several applications about evangelism from Luke 19. One application suggested by MacArthur is that there is no prefabricated prayer that can guarantee the salvation of the soul. This is certainly true, but that isn't the point of the text. Another application he makes is that there is no four or five step plan of salvation. This is true. However, it's also not something we learn from Luke 19. Jesus told people that whoever believed in him had everlasting life. It's that simple. The fruit of salvation. MacArthur makes a clear and simple statement about the salvation in this section that contradicts the rest of what he says in this book. Zacchaeus was the son of Abraham, not because he was Jesus, but because he believed. He was Jewish, but because he believed. Yes, he is the son of Abraham because he believed. There's no mention of confession of sins. There's no indication of turning from them. There's no commitment to life, no submitting to Christ's lordship, no obedience unto death. There's no works at all, only faith. True, MacArthur talks about those things in preceding paragraphs, but here at least you find some precious gospel clarity that is sorely lacking in the rest of gospel according to Jesus. Salvation comes by faith alone and Christ alone. No works are required to be born again. Since the Lord Jesus already did all the works that need to be done for us, if a person believes what MacArthur says in this paragraph, then he's certain that he will be spending eternity with the Lord Jesus based on faith in Christ apart from works. Then MacArthur offers a contradictory and inconsistent pastoral cover requirements for one to obtain eternal life. On the one hand, he says that regeneration is by faith apart from works, but on the other hand, he claims that new birth is by works. For example, MacArthur makes a terrific observation, salvation to come to Zacchaeus because he gives his money away, but because he became a believer. So true. However, MacArthur immediately contradicts himself, but once again opposing his theology on the text. After citing 2 Corinthians 5.17 about the new creation, he says, Zacchaeus response to Christ confirms the truth of that verse. He would have had a hard time understanding contemporary people who claim to be born again, but whose lives challenge that everything Christ stands for. 
in the first place. Second Corinthians 5, 17 does not say he's a new creation. The Greek just says, if anyone is a Christ, new creation. This isn't a verse that promises that all who come to faith in Christ experience a radical change in lifestyle. There's no such verse. In light of the context, Paul's point is that the believers are part of a new world. Oh. In which there are those who have everlasting life and those who do not. We are no longer should recognize people accordingly to fleshly distinctions. The only distinction that ultimately matters is those whose everlasting life and who does not indeed. The New Geneva Study Bible, Calvinist work, says concerned in 2 Corinthians 5.17, the believer's union with Christ is nothing less than participation in the new creation. Interesting. Translating there is a new creation instead of he is a new creation draws the conclusion more clearly. Ah. When MacArthur says that Zacchaeus would have had a hard time understanding contemporary people will claim to be born again, but whose life's challenging everything Christ stands for. It is not clear who he has in mind. It's doubtful that anyone, believer or unbeliever, has led a life that challenges everything Christ stands for. Unless MacArthur's thinking of someone like Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler, but he's probably thinking of allegedly horror people like the Christian Lucas or owner from chapter 5. If so, his audience must be left wondering about their own salvation. If MacArthur had railed against people who claim to be born again, but whose lives are not quite similar to nice some believers, he should really have disturbed the readers. But this isn't the logical conclusion of his position. If regeneration guarantees transformation, then believers will not only be different from serial killers, most people are, they will also be different from really nice some believers like Catholic or Buddhist priests, doctors who work with AIDS or Ebola patients, philanthropists, etc. But if this is true, you know, this is the standard by which we determine if we're born again or not, then who can have assurance? Are any of us radically better than our nice and unbelieving neighbors, let alone someone like Gandhi or Mother Teresa? MacArthur says if such a change has not occurred, this is no reason to think genuine salvation can take place. How radical, complete must the change be? Is MacArthur's view that moment one is born again, that all his sinful actions and cravings instantly vanish? Is he saying that the alcoholic who comes to Christ need not go through rehab of some sort? Do the cravings for liquor immediately disappear? Is the college student who's been sleeping with a different girl each night suddenly free from lust? Is the jealous person suddenly no longer jealous? Does the angry person become as peaceful as a lamb? If Christians are set free from all sinful actions and desires, do they still need to grow? If his understanding that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is true, then would not a brand new Christian be just as spiritually mature as the person who walked with Christ for 80 years? And would it not be true that if anyone ever again fell to desire to sin, then he would prove that he had never been born again? Coming back to Zacchaeus, is there anything in the text that indicates that his life was radically transformed to the extent? Not at all. We don't even know if Zacchaeus ever gave away his money or restored anyone fourfold. All we have is a statement of intent to change in one area of his life, not a report that he in entire life was transformed. Does MacArthur think a statement of intent to give away half his money means that Zacchaeus was suddenly a great husband, father, neighbor, evangelist, prayer warrior, said there? Is there any indication that he stopped living a life that challenged what Jesus stood for? We don't know. We can hope so, but we can't know for sure. There's no indication of this in this passage. Conclusion. Christians are commanded to grow in maturity precisely because we are not immediately transformed the moment we believe in Jesus for everlasting life. The old habits of thinking don't go get thrown off often at night. Our minds don't get renewed all at once. The seed gets implanted, but it needs to grow. It takes time for the acorn of faith to mature into a tower or an oak. It's talking about some Old Testament passages and about the repentance stuff. Uh, Solomon died as an idolater. Okay. Uh, over five cities, the narrative idea. I'm going to land the plane right there. Well, in a minute, I want to talk to y'all again for a second. So, when I first got this book, well, actually, when it first came out, almost when it first came out, uh, I enjoyed it, you know, but I didn't fully grasp it because I read it so fast. No, I didn't wrap it. I read it fast, you know, 
And I used those videos that they made to go through it. But this is what I'm going to say. This is Dr. Wilkin, all right? This is why Dr. Wilkin is going to probably shred Sean Griffin in the debate, okay? Because I listen to Grayson Focus when I go back and forth to work. I refuse to for uh, when people try to say, oh, you're, you believe in GS or whatever. No, I'm not GS, okay? I'm not FGA. I try to learn from both tribes. I try, it's like Cobra Kai, Eagle Fang, and Midagi, Miyagi Do, and I develop my own fighting style, right? That type of my approach. The thing about it is, though, is as I'm reading, there's arguments in here. There's arguments in this particular book that were written in 2015. I'm like, I can implement that in my debate strategy. IL, that answers this question. That gives me new insight in this passage. Now, how do I just listen and say, nah, don't listen to Wilkin because Wilson labeled him a heretic or other people accused him of that. I wouldn't have that insight. If I would not have been challenged, and no one's requiring me to read this book, but my thought is like this, like I said, Zane Hodges replied to MacArthur according to Jesus and his view of things. Hey, cops don't live in some. Uh, you say, Peter, let me put this up here because this is from LinkedIn. Uh, he said, Peter and his friends all night long caught no fish, but when Jesus commanded them to launch to the deep, they caught a great number of fish. It is not over. God has a plan B for you. You shall catch more than the way they expected. People should not understand it. Even you stop, more questions are following. You have testified, but this is a, uh, this one is a special testimony. You know God has not forgotten you. He still remembers you. Plans only that is, and I don't know what the rest of it is. And that's great. As long as you're not claiming to be prophesying, I accept, you know, that. But see, this is the issue. Let, let me just use this as an example, okay, guys? So he's talking about Peter and his friends. Uh, it's not over. God's plan B for you. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, I mean, some would say this is plan A. You should catch more than the way you expected. How do you know that, Kato? I mean, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I know you're trying to commend me, but Kato or Kato, how do you know that? How do you not know that I'm not going to commit a sin in the next five minutes? Man? How do you know that I'm not going to commit a sin in the next five minutes that is a sin unto death? How do you not know that for some weird reason I'm going to go overdose on drugs? How do you not know that I'm not going to get bad news and and reject Jesus out of anger or hurt? How do you know that I'm not going to go get deceived by in some apologetics arguments by some Muslim or someone else or an atheist? You don't know those things. So even though you're hopeful and expecting and being encouraging, Free Grace believes that all those things that I mentioned are a possible danger. So there's no guarantee that that uh, I'm going to get way more, catch way more than I expected. I'm hopeful, you know. I'm confident of better things, but there's no guarantee. Yeah, 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 I like that. In fact, I'm going to put these up here. God has a plan Z for you too. Yeah, God God can use the whole alphabet. Yeah, plan Z. And if he doesn't, hey, and don't forget he's got numbers too. Yeah, any anything that can happen will happen. When is the debate rescheduled for? Um, I think it's the seventh. Oh my goodness, that's three days away. Let's go see if we can find out. The reason I said all that is because 
some forms of hy hyper grace hold to a prosperity gospel. You know, and I want that to be exposed. Uh, so let's go to standing for truth. Okay. Y'all need to see this if you haven't seen it. I, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I SFT told me some things before, you know, behind the scenes and he's working through this. So, but I want to, I'll get, I need to watch this to catch some more stuff. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that he spoke at the funeral. I'm so behind. I've been so focused on my own stuff. I haven't even seen this yet. Wow. Okay. So, upcoming live streams. Here it is, guys. It's rescat. It's in three days. Man, that means I'll be coming three days. So, what is that? Today's the 14th. So, that's counting. So, that. Let's see. Friday I worked. Saturday I slept. Then I woke up. I slept about 12 hours to recover from my back. Four. So I woke up around 4 p.m. And I worked on my paper. And then I streamed. So that means it's now Sunday morning. Is that correct, guys? Is it already Sunday morning? I'm throwing it off. What's the date today? Yeah, oh my gosh. It's already Sunday. Um So yeah, it, it's in 3 days. So 17 Wednesday? It's on Wednesday. Okay. But then that makes me wonder, all right. So when is the Chris Morrison debate? I'm doing after shows for both of these. Oh my goodness. It's the day after. So I do two after shows this week. And I think I got a paper due. Maybe not. I don't know. Um let me go check. Scrolling on down. Let's see here. Absolute free critique. The week of April 23. Okay, so it's not due this week. It's going to be due next week. But I have my Trinity debate. Let's go see if Gospel, uh, Gospel Truth has that one put up. Let's see if that's all going on still. I'm probably going to get tore up my bone. Torn off the bone. For you, upcoming live streams. I need to learn how to do this. I don't think my YouTube channel shows this. Upcoming live streams, interviews. Yeah, I need to figure out how to do that. I think that's a thing called shells. He's not even got me listed. Huh. Well, maybe maybe it got canceled, or maybe he thinks it's uh. I'll, I'll check. Layman Seminary. No, nothing by that name. Let's try Charles Jennings. No. Well, maybe it ain't gonna happen. But it's supposed to happen. We'll see. I don't know. It's the 24th. So. Alright. So I'm looking at the comments here. 
Yeah, I can't wait for Wilkins to bait. Yeah. Um, yeah. Spadey's going to be legendary. It's on Wednesday. Yeah, and the thing is, is that Wilkin watched my debate with Sean as part of his prep. You know, and I'm a nobody, but still, you know. Uh, and which is interesting because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play a part of that debate because I think it has relevance to what we're talking about. Beast flavor, hyper in fact, a lot of the prosperity breeds might be lordship. No, draws. Yeah. Interesting. But see, is hyper grace another form of lordship? Yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> I see you, Killer Banana. I see you applying uh, my argument, right? Which, you know what? I'm going to bring up my commentary. Let's see what I said about Romans 4 there. Um, give me a second. My synthetic summary on Romans 4. Well, it's over the whole book, but let me see if I can uh, bring that up. And then we'll do some of the, uh, we'll look at the Sean Griffin, my Sean Griffin debate stuff. So this is, my professor wrote his comments on the side of this, but I said, Note, this outline contains excerpts from previous things I've written on Romans. It also is bent toward reflecting a more experiential sanctification approach to Romans. I plan to modify this argument to be more objectively reflect my gleanings from your exposition this semester. One day will be a commentary similar to Bing's A Truth, B Truth approach. Teaching people the three aspects chart is more important because I meet people every day that change where they place the given passage or concept. But if we teach people the chart, they will not be so shocked when we change our views. And then, uh, so anyway, I'm going to go to the Romans 4 stuff. Okay. All right. So according to this, Romans 4 and 8 focuses on the doctrine of experiential sanctification with the culmination of the covenants and the concept of inheritance. Hate takes this as the blessing of believing Gentiles justification, the imputation of God's righteousness. Romans 4 is about Paul giving Abraham an example of a faithful person who participated in the Abrahamic covenants blessings and was a channel for them. Then David is mentioned related to experiential forgiveness. So it can be titled, Paul the Illustrator, Abraham and David. Application, Christians should have the faith of Abraham and the heart of David. I say Abraham and David are examples of positionally sanctified people walking in experiential sanctification. They had the word and the enabling means of experiential sanctification. Both experienced imputation of the ethical righteousness. Abraham is an example of a faithful person who participated in the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant and was a channel for them. Abraham is known for his faith and his faithfulness, or faithlessness, sorry, although Romans graciously does not emphasize it. Anyone faithful identifies with Abraham's faithfulness and God's faithfulness. So 4, 1 through 3, God declared Abraham's faith as righteousness in experiential sanctification. 4, 1 through 8. The righteous is imputed separately from works. Abraham is justified by faith. Salvation is a gift, not a payment. 4, 1 through 5. Experiential sanctification righteousness is given to one who looks to the faith principle in operation. David justified by faith. 4, 6 through 8. David needed experiential sanctification assurance. Abraham believed in God's previous revelation and God fulfilled 
the personal promise to him, 4, 11 through 25. Circumcision was both a confirmation and a seal of faith, so righteousness might be credited to all humans who believe the gospel. Uh, 4.13. All believers will inherit the world in some sense, and it will be based on the righteousness of faith. 4.14-16. It has always been this way. Uh, as illustrated in Abraham 4.17-22. As God declared Abraham's act of belief as righteousness, so he does for those who believe in 4.20-25. And uh, it is true in the church age that he has been raised for our justification. 423 through 26. Okay. So, yeah, there's that. Well, my only issue though is that Romans 320 28 seems a highly suggest position justification. So it seems where the Romans 4 and experiential between the two. Well, I. I can't remember my last notes about because uh, I, I recently had taught on Romans or parts of Romans and I and I argued for Romans 3 being experiential but I can't remember what I put in my notes just now I mean from that synthetic overview so let me go ahead and pull that up And share my screen. It's theoret. Christ is the truth. It's a theoretical argument. Um, I talked to Killer Banana about it recently. Um, but if you lit here, this will help you. Okay, look how I'm going to take uh, Romans 1 18 through 2 20. Indictment involved in experiential sanctification. And I'm going to take Romans 1 through 3. Listen, and you'll see what's going on. I'm going to collapse these uh, comments on the side. Well, how do I do that? All right. Comments. How do I collapse the comments? Okay, that was an interesting tool, but how do I collapse them? Does anybody know how to collapse comments? I don't have much experience with Google Docs. Share, no. I got all these AI things going on here. Uh, what's this one? No. Does it, anybody make any comments? No oh, in the chat? All right. So I guess I'm stuck with those comments. Suggest edits, add comment. No. All right. We'll just have to deal with the comments. Unless I can make it so big that the comments don't show. Okay, yeah, that works. Okay, so check this out. In Diamond of Auburn Expert to Sanctification, 118 through 20. But I have Romans 1 through 3 explain how the covenants are vital for understanding how any Roman Christians are not better than Old Testament saints. Nor are they better because they're nationally or ethnically different. The purpose of 1, 18 through 20, 20 is to remind Jewish and Gentile Christians that neither are spiritually better than the other, even though they have two kinds of spiritual and ethnic baggage. They are not better than each other because all humans are sinners. Paul was writing about the heathen, the moralistic Gentile, and the self-righteous Jew, but he is convicting his Christian readers of sin. There is a typical pattern or trend that both people groups have experienced. In Deuteronomy 4, Israel was warned to forget God in the pagan land. Paul was not trying to convince these already saved Jewish Christians that they needed salvation. However, he wanted to help them, and the Gentile Christians became transformed. Being aware of God's 
word obligates the Christian to live righteously. When Paul mentions judgment according to works, he is being topical, meaning he's not saying that the believer and the unbeliever will experience the same judgment, even though both groups' works are will be evaluated. Paul takes this as a stipulation part, whereby faith in Christ is emphasized rather than the law of Moses. Justification and gospel relate to the doctrine of sanctification. Romans 1 is about Paul, a Jewish Christian, calling himself a servant, then describing Christ as connected to the Davidic covenant. He alludes to the Abrahamic covenant, a phrase that bookends the book of Romans. He implicitly sets himself as an example for the Christians so that they will avoid the behavior of those mentioned in Romans 1 and 2. It could be titled Paul the Theocratic Administrator, a Jewish opening. Chapter Application Christians should promote practical reconciliation by learning the big picture of the Bible to see how their individual lives fit into God's plan. Chapter 1 Christians should know their Bible because they are revelatory and regulatory means of experiential sanctification. Christians should depend on the Holy Spirit because He's the enabling means of experiential sanctification. Christians should be faithful servants who imitate Christ's example to have experiential sanctification influence wherever they are. Christians should exercise their spiritual gifts in the sphere of influence that God has granted them. Finally, Christians should show gratitude to God for everything, especially their shared faith. Alright, so now we're going into subcategories. 1-17, through 17, a Jewish-oriented opening in experiential sanctification. The introduction immerses the reader into Paul's doctrine of experiential sanctification. He explicitly uses the term saint for his recipients. Paul's call on the gospel content begin his presentation of experiential sanctification, 1, 1 through 6. The term gospel refers to messianic salvation, implicit broader concept that becomes explicit later in the book, in 10, 1, 9, 13, 11, 26. Though Paul will not formally deal with the doctrine of experiential sanctification into the middle, chapter 6 through 18, he prepares his audience to embrace it. When Paul opens his letter, it is Jewish oriented to calm Jewish Christians before addressing Gentile Christians. Gentile Christians understand the concept of servant, uh, slave, uh, but Jewish Christians have a richer understanding. Paul was described as having apostolic authority with a unique calling. Paul introduces himself as a servant of Christ Jesus in apostolic authority, by which he was set apart for the gospel. Paul was writing to a mixed audience made up of Gentiles and Jews. He begins with a Jewish emphasis before mentioning the Gentiles. This was strategic because the Jewish Christians were coming back from the scattering under Claudius. I gotta get a heartburn pill, one second. That's because my esophagus when I had that endoscopic surgery at that I get hurt for it. One second. This was strategic because the Jewish Christians were coming back from the scattering of the Claudius, and the Gentile Christians have become hostile toward them. Paul explains his plan for both people groups to promote reconciliation among them. Promote practical reconciliation. He uses, which is experts of sanctification. He uses language familiar to Jews and Gentiles. However, he emphasizes the Old Testament prophecy about the Father's Son, who is tied to the Davidic Covenant and vindicated by his resurrection through the Holy Spirit, who gifted and led the, let the apostles bring about fulfilling the Abrahamic Covenant for the Gentiles, who are described as also called for Jesus Christ, culminating in Messianic salvation of the world as we know it, by the establishment of the Messianic Millennial Kingdom, which includes Gentile blessing, Considering the truth that God has always had a plan for the Gentiles' salvation during the church age is a foreshadowing of the program that will be realized in the Millennial Kingdom. This beginning emphasizes the epistle foreshadows chapter 9 through 11 and sets up Paul's explanation for wanting to visit Rome. 
He addressed all beloved saints with grace and peace for two members of the Trinity. And then here's the categories for that. Paul serves as an apostle set apart to deliver the gospel of God. 1-1. One, one. Paul introduces himself as servant of Christ Jesus in apostolic authority by which he was set apart for the gospel. 1-1. One, one. Paul implicitly introduces experiential sanctification by setting forth himself and Christ's examples of faithful servants and by implicitly invoking two biblical covenants. The Holy Scriptures are the distinctly inspired revelatory means of experiential sanctification. 1-2. The gospel of God is what he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures, 1-2. He described the gospel as Old Testament prophecy. Their content includes the Davidic son, designated rightful heir to the Davidic covenant, promises with power by the vindication of his resurrection, 1-2-5. Paul begins the book of Romans on a very Jewish note, alluding to the Davidic covenant. Paul describes the son as the gospel content because it's centered on him. He uses language familiar to the Jews and the Gentiles, but he emphasizes Old Testament prophecy about the Father's Son tied to the Davidic Covenant. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Holiness because He is the enabling means of experiential sanctification. One four. These truths are rarely included in the Gospel presentation of how one becomes positionally saved. Christ is the most excellent servant to go along with Paul's example. He is designated as, as his resurrection, not at his resurrection, not his incarnation. His resurrection vindicated him through the Holy Spirit. God's declaration of the Son relates to the doctrine of sanctification because of Christ sanctified life and work. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection vindicated him. The Spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, the enabling means of experiential sanctification did this. The word may mean designated or appointed. Because he mentioned the Davidic covenant, he also sent it to the Father's right hand as king, but is not sitting on the throne of David. Psalms 2, 7 says he is begotten. He describes the blessings given to the apostles and the purpose of these blessings. The ministration of Christ relates to the doctrine of sanctification, 1, 5. Experiential sanctification occurs when it describes the benefits given to the apostles and their purpose. The Holy Spirit gifted and let the apostles fulfill the Abrahamic covenant for the Gentiles. 1-5. The Holy Spirit gifted and let the apostles bring about some fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant for the Gentiles. All Christians of Rome are saints and positionally saved since. But God also calls Christians to represent him in their experiential sanctification walk. 1-6 and 7. It is appeal to grow in experiential sanctification and the provision for experiential sanctification comes from God. The audience relates to the doctrine of sanctification. The letter opening connects to the doctrine of sanctification, 1-7. The purpose, 1-8 through 15. Paul begins with thanksgiving and he chooses words that will be repeated in the wrath section of Romans 1. Paul implicitly sets himself as an example before mentioning an earlier age or group falling into idolatry due to ingratitude toward God. The Christian reader hearing about this fall would cheer Paul on until they realize they are no different. If the Christian of both groups do not show their gratitude to God for their shared faith, they are in danger of falling into their form of idolatry. The danger of idolatry is to set up a wrong understanding of doctrine as a proper understanding of correct representation. The Christian reading then and now should ask what the implications of the understanding a misunderstanding have on relationships and their corporate testimony. Paul begins with Thanksgiving 1 8. Paul spiritually served in experiential sanctification and promoted spiritual service to the glory of God 1 8 through 32. Paul describes himself as in relationship with God through the intercessory ministry of the Messiah and he's thanking God through Christ because of the world renowned faith. Paul thanked God for them because they walk in experiential sanctification, influencing those around them, 1, 9 through 10. Paul planned to visit Rome to promote spiritual growth through mutual edification and ministry while collecting the mission offering for the trip to Spain, 1, 10, 16, 15, 17, 16 through 27. Paul describes himself as in relationship with God through the ancestral ministry of the Messiah. When, when Paul hears of this faith, it makes them want to see them bring mutual edification 
in fulfillment of his apostolic commission to the Gentiles related to the Abrahamic covenant fulfillment. Paul wants them to agree on how much he prays for them. Specifically, he prays that he could see them, 11 through 12. Paul's desire to visit, Romans 1, 11. Reason for prayer, mutual edification to occur, 1, 12. He is on a mission to the Gentiles, so he wants to visit them. He senses he is being hindered in praying about God's will. He wants to see them so mutual edification may occur, 113. He wants to see them because mutual edification may occur. Sorry, there's some redundancy in this. He wants more results among the Gentiles, so he prays that the hindrance will be removed, 114. He wants more results among the Gentiles, so he prays the hindrance will be removed. He's in a mission to the Gentiles, so he wants to visit them. However, he senses being hindered in praying about God's will. So there's different ways of saying the same thing. Like I said, these are notes of synthetic summary. Fruit from the Gentiles due to the commission, verse 15. A restatement of eagerness occurs, 115 through 17. Paul is eager to preach the gospel in Rome, 115. Paul boasted in the gospel because the Holy Spirit supplies experiential sanctification power, enabling the positionally saved righteous person to live righteously in experiential sanctification. They can escape God's temporal wrath, which includes letting sin take its depraved course. They are in danger of divine discipline because they refuse to be thankful as Paul was, 1, 8, 9, 21, 25. The theme, 1, 16 and 17, states that concerning Paul's allusion to two covenants related to two groups of people, Paul was eager to proclaim the message of Messianic salvation because it is powerful, because righteousness affects how one lives. Pate takes his part as a historical prologue where spiritual blessing rather than geophysical ones occur and is tied to the restoration in Christ. This is often called the theme of the book, 1, 16 and 17. Verse 16, reason for eagerness, unashamed because of the gospel power. Verse 17, clarification in the gospel, righteousness is revealed. Person of faith, phases. I mean, that's a question mark. Habakkuk 2 4. Imputed righteousness and 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 lie by experiential sanctification. I don't know what lie was. Uh, I'm not sure what that was supposed to be. Romans 1 16 and 17 state that consider Paul's allusion to two covenants related to two groups of people. Paul was eager to proclaim the message of Messianic salvation because it's powerful because righteous affects how one lives. Paul was more concerned about convicting Christians at Rome than explaining how God judges. So this is about 118 to 32. Condemnation by creation, 118 to 32. The need of all people, the guilt of mankind, the unrighteous relate to the doctrine of sanctification. Immoral Gentile Romans address the question of the salvation of the heathen, but only indirectly, as Paul was more concerned with convicting his Christian audience of sin rather than giving an exposition on the issue. If the message concerns how people who are already saved to life, then the topic is expert to sanctification concerning the Abrahamic covenant. The scripture part testifies of God's faithfulness to God and the unfaithfulness of man. It describes God's judicial decision to give them over to specific trends true of Gentile and Israelite history. See Deuteronomy 4. The wrath of God is often assumed to be an attribute of God, but its anthropathic nature lends weight to take it as temporal wrath, rather than eternal wrath. The focus is on wrath on groups, not primarily individuals. Temporal wrath is revealed against the objects that are ungodliness and unrighteous of men that suppress the truth, receive this wrath because they knew God existed, knew a proper way to honor God and give him thanks existed. These are behaviors Paul did and that he wants his Christian audience to. They become foolish. God righteously reveals his temporal wrath against unbelievers and believers because of unrighteousness and ungodliness, 118. These scriptures testify to his faithfulness and humanity's unfaithfulness. The reason for human guilt, 118. The reason for the contrast is that the wrath of God is also being revealed because of unrighteousness and ungodliness. The ungodliness of humankind, 119 through 27, verse 19. The reason they're worthy of God's wrath is self-evident within them. 119, reason they're worthy of God's wrath. 
explanation of the evidence of God as creator. 20, 21 through 31. Reads of the worthy of wrath. They did not worship the right one. Present wrath of God universally ex uh, exchanges given over. The wickedness of humankind. 128 through 32. Then we go into uh, chapter 2. Pay attention to this because this probably will come up in the debate. It came up in the St. Genesis one. Romans 2 is about Paul telling his Christian audience about the moralists and the Jews with the self-righteous attitude toward their moralists mentioned in Romans 1. There is ambiguity and alternation between the two groups that ought to be resolved. It could be titled Paul, the Minister of Reconciliation, Application, Christians should avoid self-righteousness and hypocrisy. Christians should understand the meaning of sanctification in all parts of scripture. Paul set up his audience as hypocrites guilty of their sins. He tells his Christian audience about the moralists and Jews with self-righteous attitudes toward the immoralists. The, the self-righteous will not inherit rewards and rank in the millennial, Messianic and millennial kingdom. God judges all based on obedience to the received revelation. 2, 12 through 16. The hypocrite and the despised, the immoralist of 1, 18 to 32, has no excuse or more experience temporal judgment. Moral Gentiles, condemnation by conscience, God's principle of judgment, 2, 1 through 20, uh, 16. The righteous judgment of God, when Paul mentions judgment according to works, he is being topical. He does not say that the believer and the unbeliever will experience the same judgment, even though both groups' works will be evaluated. God makes such obedience the basis of judgment for both Jews and Gentiles, 2, 1 through 29. Justice, great white throne judgment. It could contrast believers and unbelievers or say God is uh, a just, in other words. Moral law extends from God's nature. Condemnation by law, the Jews and the law, the guilt of the Jews. Their belief is useless in ministry to others if they don't apply it, 2, 1. God determines rewards and punishment based on sin and thought or action. 2, 4 through 11. The delay in judgment is because of God's character in contrast to humanity's sinful features. Uh, that's 2, 4 through 5. Eternal life refers to abundant life and rewards. 2, 7, 5, 21, 6, 22 through 23. Temporal discipline falls on all no matter what age they live under. 2, 12. Under the Mosaic Covenant, God blessed the Gentiles according to their relation to Abraham and Israel. So a person could be saved and be a Gentile. But since the Mosaic Covenant was the law of the land, they had to submit to it in service. To be before God refers to experiential sanctification, where ethical righteous declared righteous when done according to his word while in fellowship with God by the enabling ministry of the Spirit, 2, 13 through 15. The Gentiles were obedient to their life. While Israelites who had uh, more light were disobedient and unfaithful. 2 7 through 2 22. Uh, 2 7 through 23 says, While he recognized the Jews' claim, the Jew is guilty of hypocrisy. Instead of Jewish Christians having an experiential sanctification influence, Gentile unbelievers blasphemed Israel's God. 2 24. Jewish Christians who apply the word of God are examples of those with a circumcised heart. 225 to 27. Now we're finally at Romans 13. I mean, Romans 3, guys. Romans 3 is about Paul asking the question, what advantage is there being a Jew? Then he quotes Old Testament passages to show that Christians are no better than the Jews because the passages refer to their failure to serve and their faithfulness are things Christians are guilty of. Paul explains the transition that inspired to show how the Mosaic Law purpose is upheld by God's dealing with these matters. It can be titled as Paul the Convictor. Christians are no better. Application. Christians should consider the pre-cross privilege of Israel and the post-cross blessings. Let me get a drink of water. Answers to Objections 3, 1 through 8. After convicted Jewish Christians, Paul discusses Jewish privilege to ensure his audience does not doubt it. 3, 1, and 2. The list is continued in 9, 4. The benefit was that God entrusted him with the word of God. 3, 2. However, hypocritical unfaithfulness does not do away with God's faithfulness to his promises. 3, 3 through 4. 
Their unrighteousness lets him show righteousness and judgment. 3, 5, and 8. Though mockers slander, God shows no partiality and judgment. 3, 7, and 9. Condemnation of the guilt of all humanity. 3, 9 through 20. There is none righteous. Gentile unbelievers are also judged because they have not lived up to God's entrusted conscience. 2, 15, 3, 9. Israel has failed at service by being in covenant violation. 3, 10, 18, and 20. Gentile Christians are no better than Jewish Christians because both have not served God. Thus, all Christians are guilty. Justification explained. 321 through 21. Righteousness through faith. Righteousness has been revealed besides the Mosaic Covenant. 321 to 22. Experiential sanctification has always been by faith and righteousness is for all. 321. So the contrast is pre-cross to post-cross. 321 through 326. It excludes human boasting because all have sinned. 323, 27, 31. The cross brings... Here, um, this was what I said at that time. I said the cross brings positional justification. So God gets all the glory. Shema language promotes practical reconciliation. Paul has shown that the Jewish unbeliever and Gentile unbeliever or Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians are no better than each other because all are under temporal judgment. Justification by faith, the description of justification. Justification by faith alone would exclude boasting. If this is the righteous God, faithfulness and spiritual sanctification. Now, so at that time, I thought it was positional too. Christ the truth. Now I'm going to show you why it could even be experiential. Okay. Now, it's been a while since I looked at this, but I'm going to look at y'all's comments before I go further. All right. So, all right. So, let's see. Killers at, uh, yeah. Right, Killer Banana, good. You're pointing that out. Picture, yeah, that's an illustration. Basic Lutheran view, okay. I guess part of it could be, yeah. I bet if it asks the power of God is for, for everyone to believe, so it doesn't mean that it's not enough to believe it, but also, you know, do something with it. Good question. I agree with the view the first John is for However, the only thing that throws me off is the verse, being born by God does not commit sin. Yeah, I take the view, at least for right now, this is this is theoretical, that born of God means being parented by God. And so what that means is that when you're in fellowship with God, you're not living a lifestyle of sin, you're not committing sin. But whenever you're not following the example of God in imitation, uh, then uh, you are committing sin. So being born of God just means that you are representing him by imitation at that time. That's the theoretical view. I have other views too that could be argued, but just want to expand your mind about that possibility. Like how we don't have the sinners, but I guess going to Ridgey Green could be more experiential. Yeah, can. I still do believe the believers are under even temporal right. I still don't believe that believers are under even the temporal right to God. It's love and discipline. Right? It's spirit but Yeah, but here's the question. Is, is temporal wrath of God not the same thing as discipline? Even when God disciplines unbelievers in temporal wrath, is it still not loving? Is it is it not for the purpose of restoration? Maybe not restoration of the individual, but what about the restoration or preservation of the plant, you know? wouldn't call it wrath either well the reason I call it wrath because what's the Old Testament call it God gave the covenant uh, Deuteronomy 28 30 Leviticus 26 as uh, God's loving parenting to the nation of Israel and yet he uses the term wrath think about this the word wrath y'all had parents when parents get angry with you or they're disappointed with you that means something, right? 
And so wrath is just referring to that in a lot of these contexts. Now, the tribulation, I think it, it amps up even more. But, you know, anyway. Griffin, use your promo I wouldn't say Zillow's view. It would throw them off. Yeah, it would. Even though I've alluded to it before in my debate, I think. But love, I definitely spread blessing on us. Yeah. Uh, disciplines us. Yeah. Yeah. You can still thought it was this printer out there, all that. Interesting position. All right, now watch, guys. Now uh, I'm going to go more in in to detail. You know, but I think guys every different display to believe it's true. Yes, of course he does. Working on the disc track. Oh, the disc track's already done. You would you like to hear it? I mean, I I'm going to have to go to praise the channel to do it. No, I can't because it's a stupid beat. But uh, I'm just, uh, we recorded it on Praise's channel. Uh, we're going to upload it on his channel. But he's got to cut it from the video. All right. So here, this is going to blow your mind, guys. And this is, it's been a while since I went through this. So there's no guarantee I can even capture my initial thoughts. But I first dealt with... Uh, Romans 3 recently was whenever I came across a, a, a hyper dispensationalist that was trying to argue that there were two different ways of salvation talked about in Romans 3. Alright, so this is simple guys. All you have to do is view justification is not the same thing as salvation or regeneration. If justification is participating in the Abrahamic covenant for blessings and inheritance, that type of thing like that, then watch what happens to the text. But now, apart from the law, the righteous of God has been manifested. Okay, well, what is the righteous of God that's mentioned in throughout all this? The righteousness of God is God's faithfulness. That even though man is faithless, God is faithful. And how was he faithful? In, in fulfilling his covenants. You know, uh, so N.T. Wright, even though he's wrong about his theology, he takes righteousness of God to refer to God's covenant faithfulness. Okay? But now, so if we read it like this, it might be something like this. But now, apart from the law, God's covenant faithfulness has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Well, in what way? Let's see. Even the right of God's covenant of faithfulness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there's no distinction. Okay? So this is a recognition that Jesus Christ is the administrator of the Abrahamic covenant and that you can receive these blessings if you believe. No distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning, regardless of whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, these blessings are available to you. The inheritance is available. All right. Then it says, being justified as a gift by his grace. This would might be something like this. Being able to experience the blessings of covenant of faithfulness as a gift because of God's graciousness. Though redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, and then the redemption would be saying, yeah, what Christ did at the cross makes it so that the blessings can flow to us as he paid for the new covenant, which is an expansion of the Abrahamic covenant. All right. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness or his covenant faithfulness. Because they had to ratify the covenant in blood. Because of the forbearance of God, God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So this is the idea that, that God was not uh, finished with the people just because they were sinning. Because he's faithful. For the demonstration I say of his righteousness, of his covenant faithfulness at this present time. So that he would be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ. Meaning that God does, God is being faithful and he's able to allow you to participate in those blessings of the covenant 
because of the one who has faith in Jesus, the one who believes in, in Christ. What then is boasting? It's excluded. So you can't boast about receiving the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. But what kind of law? Right? What kind of law? What kind of covenant? What kind of code is in operation? He says, of works? No. But by a law of faith. In other words, this principle is in operation. It was by faith. One participates in the Abrahamic covenant through faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In other words, one can participate in the covenant faithfulness by faith. And that's not based on the Mosaic law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? So they receive the inheritance. Yes, the Gentiles also, since God indeed who will justify the circumcised. Notice it says who will justify the circumcised. So this could be the idea of vindication. That, that Israel will be vindicated in the future because of their faith in God that will happen during the tribulation uh, and the promises that he provides. All right. Or this could be that Israel, God will uh, make it possible for one to participate in the covenant, covenant blessings uh, by faith with the Jews and the Gentiles in the future because they're one. So this is pointing up the idea of solidarity, practical reconciliation. So do we then nullify the Mosaic law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Because even with the Mosaic law, you always had the principle of faith. And the Mosaic law just released the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Which made one... Uh, so then we flow into four. What then shall we say? Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. So according to the flesh... Has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, in other words, if if, if Abraham could participate uh, in the Abrahamic covenant based on his works, then he has something to boast about. But the covenant was given in grace; it was a a land grant, right? But he couldn't. But if but if he could uh, done something to earn it, he still couldn't boast before God because it was God gave it in grace. And it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. What did he believe? That he was going to be given an heir, you know, which means the inheritance idea is associated there. And so this is talking about in his walk. Now, the one who works, his wages not credit his favor, but it's what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him and justifies the ungodly. In other words, if you believe that God gave the Abrahamic covenant in grace and you can participate in the Abrahamic covenant in grace based on the fact that God can still work with you, uh, that his faith is credited as righteousness. And then it goes in talking about David. Now that's sloppy, that's messy, that probably all won't stand up in a court of law. But that may be one way to deal with it. Like I said, that's all theoretical. Oh, I've already charted it out. Um, in fact, since you mentioned that, let me see if I can find some of my charting on Romans 5. Let me see what I got on Romans 5. I got 5 through 11. Why did I say Romans 5? I meant Romans 3. Uh, I have charted it out like when I was teaching Free Grace 102, but you're right. I don't have it on video. Anyway, that's just... 
That makes James make sense. Yeah, and it totally refutes David Benjamin also. So you don't even have to make it about justification before men if you understand the justification is not always positional, right? It says, I typically use the term justification, sometimes it can be experiential, such as James. Yeah, and it can be uh, ultimate also. Uh, I mean, vindication, approval, James 2, legacy, believer, good works of life. Well, that's good, because the righteous God is manifest now, but that doesn't mean the believers had eternal life. But that doesn't mean that believers had eternal life before the cross. Yeah, they did. Believers had eternal life before the cross. Uh, but the righteous of God, it, it doesn't, it's not. How, what makes you think the righteous of God is salvation? If it's experiential or if it's God's covenant faithfulness, then it's not about salvation. But also, he's talking about passed over sins. So. Maybe I get, you get clarification to go. We established a law, and, and I, I explained it this way. The Mosaic law operated based off of principle of faith. You couldn't do the law unless you had faith. Yeah, an unbeliever could do it and receive benefits because of the covenant relationship, but it was for sanctification. Most proper to forget through on this red standard of the law, but I don't know if that's it at all. I think Charles alluded to establishing laws of manifestation God's faithfulness is covenants, but it's not manifest apart from the law. Um, I'm still going to study this up. Well, yeah, of course, and it's all mine. Uh, but Romans 4 still messed me up, though, because if it's about how can we justify the God of God kindly, who don't work? Let me ask you a question. Can an ungodly person participate in the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant? And the answer is yes, because God gave the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham based on grace, not based on his works. Okay? And so even though he believed and he was promised an heir because of that, the covenant itself was given in grace. Okay? But. The blessings of the Abrahamic covenant were only experienced as he was being obedient. Just as Israel has to be an obedient, believing nation to receive the fulfillment of the covenant. So the point is, there's lots of times when Abraham was ungodly. And so if justification just means to participate in the Abrahamic covenant. Then uh, there are certain aspects that a, that a, a carnal person can participate in the Abrahamic covenant, but there's certain blessings where they would have to, there are time release based on obedience. So that's where you come up with two views of inheritance as well. Some things are inherited just because of virtue of the covenant and others are inherited by virtue of obedience. Did not I mean? Okay. I meant the believers did have a turn. Oh, okay, good. All right, good. So I'm trying to think what I want to do now. Yeah, let's go ahead and let's uh let's go ahead and look at my debate with Sean Griffin. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to imagine if I was Wilkin watching this, how I would have uh, uh how I would have replied and answered it. It would be really great if, uh, it would be really cool that if when Wilkin was preparing, that he just searched Sean Griffin's name and Free Grace. Because then if he did, he would have saw all my debate preparation videos. But he probably didn't do that. But that'd be cool if he did. Let me make sure I got the sound on. Our screen share. Crank this up. We've got an epic soteriology showdown between two true professionals, a couple of experienced debaters in the debate world, Sean Griffin and Charles Jennings. 
And so, gentlemen, I re really appreciate uh, the both of you giving us your time for tonight's exchange. I'm really excited for this. I'm going to be paying attention to the comments in the chat. So, y'all going to be paying Y'all should, I'm, um, so I'll be doing that while we're going so we can make this more interactive. I know the audience is as well. As a matter of fact, this is our final debate for 2023. And what a debate to end this epic year of events with. So gentlemen, let's, let's get acquainted. Let's get to know you both a little bit before we get into the opening statement. Uh, Sean from Kingdom in Context. Let's start with you. As always, great to have you. I hope you've been well and a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Donnie. Thanks for having me again on here. It's a debate. It's always fun. I'm excited to see your channel growing. And uh, let me see. Um, I've a, been a Christian since 1997, July 17th. Um, just been studying my Bible ever since. Um, went to Bible college, but did not, did not pursue any type of ministry uh, appointments. Oh, the church or anything. I got to turn the ducks off. Duh. <laughs> One second, guys. I got to turn them ducks off. All right. I got my ducks yeah, so I've in just a row. been studying ever since, and um, I love the scriptures. I think they come alive when we keep things in context. We look up the definitions of the words and and uh, just try to remain faithful to that most basic hermeneutic. And so as a result, it's led me into different types of debates because it, um, in doing that simple hermeneutic, I realized that some seminaries do not teach that simple hermeneutic, and they have a lot of uh, predisposed ideas that they insert. So uh, I don't know if you all know this. And I'll come back to this. Wilkin made a video on Sean Griffin. And it's evangelistic. Okay. And we'll, we'll play that a little bit later on. Or we'll look at it. But that was kind of interesting and preemptive. That he done that. Um, because what that means is that. Wilkin was already getting. Getting it into the algorithm. That uh, he would be debating him. And that where he stood on giving the gospel. You know, Wilkin gave, was a, attempting to give the gospel. I think he gave it uh, with St. Janus too. Wilkin is a good evangelist. Anyway, here we go. Into the text. So here we are talking about the Bible and our disagreements over it. And uh, I'm excited to be here tonight. Oh, Donnie, you're on uh, mute, brother. Sean, I appreciate that. I was saying thank you for the intro. And for those in the audience that want to see more from uh, Sean, do check the description box for a link to your channel, Kingdom in Context. And I'm keeping you busy for 2024, Sean. And you do just a variety of, of debates on a variety of topics. And so I think that's pretty cool. And I do appreciate that. So you got one coming up here, the deity of Christ debate is jesus yahweh you'll be debating uh praise i am and then at the end of the month you'll be uh debating a two-part debate series in a way you'll be debating anthony rogers at the beginning of january on the gospel truth and here at the end of january on the question does the bible teach the doctrine of the trinity so sean again i appreciate your time and i'm looking forward to those upcoming debates charles yes. jennings Oh man, guys, we got a problem. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back. I just saw something on YouTube that uh, we need to look at and be aware of because it this may mean uh, the Free Grace Wars have taken on another front. Uh, let me show you why I'm saying that. She made a part two. That means she made a part one. So Renee Rowland is entering into the hyper grace, free grace wars. But I don't know which side she's on. Okay. So this is immediate. So I'm going to pause the Wilkin, Sean Griffin thing because this is immediate. This is very important. What's so we're going to deal with this. We're going to deal with this. All right. 
So let's bring up the comment. Let's turn it up to 125. Come on, Renee, don't don't go on the wrong side of this because I don't want to, I, I would like for you to be away from Benjamin and away from Greg Jackson, even if you're not exactly where I'm at. Lord, please let that be the case. Good evening. You remember Hitchcock is a good evening. <laughs> good evening, beloved saints. I want to do this video on um, sanctification because there seems to be um, some confusion on it. Um, and I think I understand why people are confused, so I'm going to address that. I had done a series several years ago um, for a viewer, and they had uh, asked questions and had brought every verse that said sanctify, sanctified, sanctifying, uh, and wanted me to explain them which ones were positional like permanent and had nothing to do with our behavior and which ones were expressing the process of spiritual maturity growth and practical living now it's unfortunate um there's a couple of verses not many uh that use the, the word and sanctify means to make holy or to set apart um and god does that for us we're we're not you know we're not holy in ourselves but it also does use it in a couple of verses, and I'll show you those, when it's talking about how we're living. And so people get confused and will either think that they're living in holiness and they're holy because of what they're doing, or uh, that it doesn't matter how they live because they're sanctified by the blood. So uh, both positions, I think, are extreme. And if we want to uh, look at scripture, we have to look at it from a whole perspective. So... Um, Lately, I've been getting a, a bunch of messages saying some people are saying that if you preach that um, a person should live a, a good Christian life, uh, that you're a legalist or putting people under the bondage of the law. I don't, I'm not sure who's saying that, but uh, if they're they're right on the gospel, I'm not going to divide. David Benjamin and Greg Jackson are saying that they're accusing us of Galatian error. But I would say I think that we got to be careful with that because we have to address. So she don't want to divide. She don't want to divide from those people that are saying that. Well, what do you do, Renee? Because they're saying you're not saved. They'll say, I'm not saying you're not saved. After they had just said you're a wolf and, and, and all of this and their statements contradict themselves. They'll say you're not saved. And then later on they say, I'm not saying I'm saved. They do like what Jack Smack does. They get emotional and say things uh, in their emotions that they don't agree with in their mind, you know, and I don't know what to speak in their mind or their emotions, you know, and I know that you can't differentiate, you know, like that. But I think you understand what I'm attempting to say, at least right now. Like I said, this is an unplanned response. As um, the difference, you know, between discipleship and salvation, um, discipleship can cost us a lot. But our salvation cost the Lord. It cost him his life. It cost God his son, right? So um, I want to make certain that I'm clear. I, I, don't, I don't know what everybody's views are on this, but I can only go with what I see in the scripture. So I'm hoping this helps. But the videos I had done, that person is in another country, and they asked me to please remove the videos because their voice was on it, and they did not want, for some reason, did not want people to know. And so I honored their wishes to keep their anonymity and I took the videos down, but it was hours and hours of work and several live streams. So I'm going to try oh. to condense this information and give you enough information so that it, it can make the point. Okay. So there's two types of sanctification. I definitely respect her for honor and that, that wish. Now, I don't like to use the word sanctification when it comes to spiritual maturity because it can get confusing for people. However, in two places at least, and I'll give you those verses, it is talking about practical abstinence from a sinful practice like fornication or abstaining from errors um, that are dire errors, you know, uh, and we'll look at that. Um, so I want to uh, go over the. Yeah, this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you abstain from and more or less. Because I obviously can't do them all because the Old Testament has tons of it, but I'll give you some example of, of each one and hopefully you'll understand. Now, we are not putting people under bondage 
people have the choice. Once you're saved, when we walk in our true identity, as we're being conformed into the image of his son, as it says, whether we want to walk in our identity in Christ, walk in the spirit, or be a carnal person, you know, guided by our flesh, because that's always destructive, you know, because we're responding from our ego, responding from our fleshly uh, desires and that kind of thing, as opposed to responding to the, the calling of that still small voice. Yeah, let me know. That's great if you say that, but, you know, there's there's issues, okay? I'll just say that right now. I mean, I hope that is the case, but there are issues. Holy Spirit that guides us into what is right and what pleases God. Now, the law would require penalty. Do this or be punished. We have been rescued. We are not under the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of death. Okay. Thank God we're not. That was to show us our guilt. It said so that sin is said, what purpose therefore serve at the law. For the record, I consider Bob George, who wrote a good book, uh, classic Christianity, hyper grace in one sense because of his view of first John one nine. He doesn't believe in confession of sin, whether you call it agreeing or thinking or what, you know, uh, I, I have no problem with someone wants to call it agreeing or thinking, but if there's people going around and they're not believing that they're sinning at all, there's a problem there. Okay. And so there's, there's issues and I don't know where everybody lands. You know, I, I'm been in the academic areas of free grace. And so some of the popular stuff, I, I don't know so much about, honestly. So, I mean, what particular teachers uh, uh, on YouTube teach, okay? Even though she's been around for a while, even since Google Plus days, um, still. So I'm not going to be quick to say I'm hopeful, but I don't know yet. It was given so that sin might be exceedingly sinful. It really brings it up to the surface to show you, you think you're a good person? Eh, not really. Look at God's standard perfection. It brings it up to the surface. It shows us, like I said before, it's like a mirror that shows us we have dirt on our face, but we don't take the mirror off the wall to clean the dirt off our face. It, it won't work. So, uh, it is not being legalistic to tell someone to walk in who we are in Christ already. That is just, Killer Banana, there are people that do believe that we're not sinning at all. We've encountered them on there. Go to that guy, the preacher. Look him up on YouTube. You're you're talking about the worst form of hyper grace you'll ever see. And the bad thing about him is you can't debate him because he will not have a moderated conversation so but he's doing a lot of damage just walking in the truth of who god says we are versus walking in our flesh of who we used to be but is now dead remember reckon your flesh dead indeed unto sin because we died with christ and were baptized into him and into his life right by the spirit i'm going to speed this up a little bit more so we should be allowing him to live he said um Nevertheless, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, right? It also says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. So it is a reasonable response to be grateful and to want to sacrifice some of these carnal things that aren't really good uh, as a reasonable service to God but so that the church isn't um, blamed or doesn't look bad, that our witness and testimony is effective and not harmed and uh, to inspire others to be less about themselves and more about Christ and his love for others. So, uh, it Amen. is not legalism. It is walking in who we are. If, if we're put, Amen. I agree with her so far. Putting you into bondage of the law it would be do it or else do it or X, Y, Z do it or God will punish you. That's the problem guys. This, this is where it's probably going to come down to the issue. What, uh, what does divine? What is divine discipline? Does God divi discipline you because of your sins, 
or does he discipline you as child training? You know, I always tell people there was a time whenever I unintentionally broke a window because I was throwing a rock at a dumpster and it went over the fence into someone's thing. And part of my punishment, if you will, was I had or I was supposed to help my dad replace the window, right? That was to teach me a lesson to, okay, you mess something up, you you repair it, whether you, whether you intended to do it or not, you know. And so that's part of discipleship, God's parenting or disciplining. So it's not a one-for-one -one correspondence. You commit this sin, therefore you get this punishment. God always does everything in grace. He even disciplines us in grace. No, God is better than any parent that we ever had. Because, according to Hebrews, it says, your earthly fathers did it this way. How much more were our heavenly fathers? So the Bible makes a comparison with parents, and we, and it's a biblical metaphor, and therefore I make the same comparison. No. Nobody says that. It's your choice. You can allow the Spirit to motivate you and guide you, and you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, or you can continue to walk in flesh, which is dead. You're not in flesh because it died, but you're just walking like the dead guy and not growing into who God says you already are in Christ. So if you know who you are, you can walk it out. So I, I want to be clear. Nobody's saying do this or you're not saved. Do this or God will punish you. Nobody's saying anything like that. But I cannot deny verses that tell us it's what, it's what pleases God. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So let's look at a couple of verses that have to do with practical living. And the word being used is sanctify, sanctifying, sanctified, right? We'll look at this, all right? Then I'm going to go to our positional permanent sanctification. It is God. Let me be real clear on this. It is God that makes us holy, not what we do or how we live. It is God. You cannot be kind of holy. You are either set apart or you are not set apart. You can't be separate and both not separate at the same time. I and I always say it's just like being kind of pregnant. You're not, you are or you aren't. So it's God that does it and we're sanctified. And that's true positionally, but experientially there's different areas as of sanctification. We may be sanctified in some areas, but not in all areas. It tells us in Hebrews, by the offering of Jesus's body, once for all, we're perfected forever. Okay, so we'll look at these verses. This is our permanent positional, cannot be changed because it's God that did it. Just like the utensils in the temple were sanctified. Now, these are inanimate objects. They can't act holy. They are holy because they were set apart for the sole purpose of being used for service of God. You see, they're, they're in use for the service to God. That's it. So they're holy because that's the only purpose they're used for. They're set apart for that. People aren't using them in the temple and then eating dinner with them. You see? So they did that in Babylon. When they took over the temple, they had all this temple stuff made out of gold. And the king, which wasn't getting very long, started using it in one of his parties. And a hand started writing on the wall. And it was basically saying, uh, yeah, your, your kingdom's gone. And it was just a few hours later, uh, they came in and uh, took over Babylon. So, um, so let's look at the verses that have to do with practical living. I really wish there was another word because, like I said, you can't be kind of holy or set apart. But what these verses are saying is set yourself apart from other people by abstaining from what they do. Well, where I look at it is moment by moment you set yourself apart. It's a moment by moment decision. And like right now, this time is set apart to react to this video. Because I'm reacting to this video, I can't react to the other video we were looking at. I know that's not a sinful choice, but it... Right now, you're listening to God's word, interacting with Christians when you could be watching something that you uh, probably is not the best for you to watch. You know, th that's a moment by moment decision of sanctification. That doesn't mean you're sanctified in every area. Just because you're wa avoiding watching something doesn't mean you're not going to uh, that you're not uh, doing something else. I mean, what if you're drunk right now? watching this are you sanctified you're set apart in the sense that you're learning about the bible you're set apart in the sense that you're with christians right now but you're, you're not sober-minded you're not thinking clearly and so it's like okay maybe you're not watching a movie right now but you probably are not 
uh, in the best state to comprehend things right now, you know. And if you're drunk, then that's a sin. Not saying drinking is a sin, but you know, uh, I'm just trying to show you uh, maybe a, a, a brief example of how. Yeah, yeah. What if you're high on weed? Yeah, right. Exactly. That, that's what it's trying to say here, and it is saying very clearly. Or what about this? What if you're smoking weed and you're you're like, you know what? I'm too high right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm not gonna get high right now. I wanna I wanna have a coherent thought and I don't wanna be laughing at the screen and all that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna let my high go down. I'm gonna come off my high and watch this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set apart this joint for later on. I'll smoke this after I finish this. So in one sense, you you are focused on the doctrine, right? And for that moment, you're not smoking weed. And so what that, and, and whether you view weed as a sin, we're not getting into that, but I'm assuming that it's a sin in this situation. Yeah, you set apart the joint. Exactly. You sanctified the joint and you're sanctified from the joint. Okay. But my, so that, that just shows you that sanctification is not just about, it's multifaceted. Okay. But I want to be clear. <laughs> it, it's mini jointed, you could say. <laughs> anyway. Here that sanctification is a permanent positional thing that is a gift of God. It's not us. It is based on Jesus. God is our sanctification. Jesus is our holiness, not us. Okay. So if that's not clear, I, I don't know how any, any. Yes, he's the source. But the question is. Do we have, the Bible tells us to walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's our responsibility to walk. And so I'm waiting for her to explain the mechanism, you know, how, how we're to do that. Some people don't like the term mechanism, but the how, the how that we do it. Yes, he's the source, but how do we do it? Because that's usually where the rubber meets the road. They're saying, not, not Renee, but. David Benjamin, Greg Jackson, they're saying we're guilty of the Galatian error because of how we say the sanctification occurs. And how to make it any clearer. But we'll go and look at one of these verses. So it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll just, we'll, we'll start at 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you or beg of you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now, this is clearly practical living. How you can please God once you're saved as his dear child. Okay. This is not legalism. It says it right here. This is God's will. Okay. And how we ought to walk and to please God. So what? So we would abound more and more. So you'll grow and become greater and more prosperous and you're more effective for the kingdom. Okay. That's why. Not so you're saved. Why? Let's look at it. This you've, re you've received of us how you ought to walk and to please God so that you would abound more and more. That's why. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, is that positional? Is it, that is not positional. Positional isn't a result of your behavior, of doing something or not doing something. Your positional standing is permanent, and it is based on Jesus. This is experiential. This is your practical Christian living, your practical maturity, and how you walk. Okay? Let's see it again. For this is the will of God even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess this vessel in sanctification and honor. So is that positional? No. Now you could use it positionally and say, we want to possess our vessel, this body in holiness, because we are permanently positionally holy in Christ, right? And honor. But this is telling us this is about how we ought to walk. Okay. This is not our position. This is our experiential Christian walk. All right. Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, is lasciviousness, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. So the way you're keeping the vessel in sanctification and honor is to abstain from fornication. Now that is practical, basic, literal fornication, sleeping around. But also we see this used in spiritual ways too, spiritual adultery, be with other gods and so forth, worship other gods. But this is talking about physical relationships okay that no man and why because that's interesting to mention about the other gods and stuff because uh does she believe that you can worship other gods and you're still saved like i believe 
And let it make clear for those that don't know, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying if you, you did that, you, it, it doesn't reverse your salvation. I believe God will discipline you, but uh, how he does it, that's another issue. So we don't want to look like the pagans, okay? Those that don't know God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He, therefore, that despises, despises not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This entire letter are instructions on practical Christian living. Now, once again, you're either holy or you're not. And it's kind of unfortunate that this is the word used because it confused people. But what it's saying here, and it tells us clearly what it means, you're holy in the sense that you're being set apart because you're not acting like other people that don't know God act. You're walking. I agree with you, Killer Banana. Being in the truth of what pleases God for his children so that you abound more and more. It's for the benefit of the church. It gives the church a good name. It 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 just keeps it keeps us separate from how the world thinks and acts. Okay, that's all. That's all. It's not saving anybody, but I cannot deny that these are clear sections of scripture. Thessalonians was written by St. Paul, and he is the one that was very clear that we are saved. Not now, everybody in this Bible taught that. Let me just be real clear on it. The gospel and everyone that's been saved has always been saved by the cross. By the blood of Jesus. The law never saved anyone. It talks about how it took care of the sins that were past. It took care of the sins before the cross. That's why they were held in Abraham's bosom until Jesus rose. Then they were seen walking around Jerusalem and, and heaven was open for them. Nobody was ever saved by the law or works of any kind. I know that's what dispensational teachers teach, but if anything else saved, why did Christ have to die? Oh, I hate that she said dispensational teachers because Dispensationalism does not teach that. Well, only one form, and I wouldn't even consider them dispensationalists. But anyway. It said the law could not, could not bring life because of the infirmity in our flesh. Nobody kept it. No one. Not to God's standard, except Jesus. That's why we must be in him. Okay? So you see. I differ on a few minor issues, but first, I want to focus on the the... The issue. I'm glad she believes in experiential sanctification. That's a good thing. But we got to deal with the how. I'm going to give you one more practical living Christian maturity walk in which sanctify or sanctifying or sanctified is used as they're describing our Christian walk. The rest of these sanctified verses are about our position and have nothing to do with our behavior. So let's go over to 2 Timothy and we'll look at that. And he tells us 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm, I'm down at 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. These two guys uh, told everybody that they missed the resurrection, that he had already come. They missed it too bad. It was stressing people out, okay? And he was eating away at the hope of the saints. What's eating away at the hope of the saints? Oh, I don't know, anti-OSAS documentaries? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I tell you these things that believe on the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life and believe on the name of the Son of God. So knowing you have eternal life, having blessed assurance continues to help you continue to believe in Jesus. And believing in Jesus gives you eternal security because you're trusting him, not you. So their word doth eat as a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, so when you hear that, oh, the anti osas they're showing you the one saved always saved isn't true. And they used all these verses. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand the shore having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the earnest of our inheritance. That's the down payment proof of purchase. I don't care what anybody says. Jesus said he saved me. Who are you going to believe? Let God be true and every man a liar. Why in the world would they try to get people to stop trusting what God says? When he says, when we believe him, when we take him at his word, that what he promised and is able to perform, and we say, yes, we believe that. When God says it, it's as good as done. It is done. He tells the future in past tense because we're so sure it's happening. Why would they try to talk you out of taking God at his word when he says, I count it to you for your righteousness? Because you believe what I promised, I'm counting that for righteousness. As Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God so much that when he asked for Isaac, 
to be sacrificed, he knew because God had promised that the Savior would be born through Isaac. That if he did sacrifice him, he'd raise him up from the ashes. That's how sure he was God would keep his promise. And he counted it to him for righteousness. So, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So if you're naming the name of Christ, stay away from sinful habits. Why? So you abound more and more. Is sin not destructive? Of course it is. He freed us from bondage. Don't let, don't be a captive to your dead flesh. Is what he's saying. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. Meet means worthy of or appropriate for. Just like he made uh, Adam a help meet for him. It's not a help meet. They've made it a word now, but it's a help meet for him. A help worthy or appropriate for him. And prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So we can see this sanctification is a what experiential sanctification it's talking about practical living abstaining from simple habits being different from the rest of the world not arguing and fighting with people being meek and quick to charity loving one another vessels of honor and dishonor so this is clearly talking about that so these are the main two and you know you'll see one or two here and there but most of the time when it says sanctified or sanctifying it is talking about a permanent positional thing but for instance let me show you this in hebrews hebrews uh, 2 11 for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren so this is positional the one that sanctifies us god the lord and the ones who are sanctified us we are one and the reason we're holy is because jesus makes us holy because we're in him and he is holy be perfect in him it's only in him we have these it's only in christ that we qualify we meet these standards these high standards of perfection. It's only in Christ because he's the only one that met, met those standards. So I don't care how good you think you are. I can save you a lot of time and a lot of thought. No, you are not without any sin in your actual life. You are, if you're saved and you're in Christ, sin is not imputed unto you. That means God is not keeping that on your account to be punished for it or to, to hold it against you. on the. That's it. Okay, she said, hold it against you when? Day of judgment. We have On the day of judgment. But what do you mean? Do you mean the judgment seat of Christ? Or are you talking about the great right throne judgment? Because uh, that that passage about sin not being imputed, there's two of them. There's one of them in Second Corinthians, right? God was, God was in Christ reconciling the world to us, not imputing our sin against us. Which, in my particular view, I believe that that's the removal of the barrier. And that applies to unbelievers and believers. And you need Christ's righteousness and eternal life still. So it doesn't lead to universalism. The other passage is in uh, Romans 4, quoting uh, David in Psalms 32. And it's talking about, uh, basically, about God divine, divinely disciplining David uh, until he basically confessed his sin. To get back into in fellowship and restoration and all of that so the issue is is that if a person saying sin's not imputed in what sense are you talking about because in psalms 32 it was imputed until david confessed his sin and he was being divinely disciplined that's my current understanding of that and then it doesn't mean it's a one-for-one -one correspondence punishment or whatever, but the Lord was disciplining him. Now, some will say, well, David might, they, they might say, well, David is the king. And so that's a spe specific situation, specific covenant and operation or whatever. Okay. But still, I think we could draw principle from that. And the thing about it is, is that uh, I think that if you have unconfessed sin in your life, whether you want to call it unconfessed sin or un agreed sin or whatever, I, I think it strains your relationship. You know, it strains your fellowship, in other words. But more stuff to see. We have been saved. But that doesn't exempt us from the natural consequences here on earth 
that can affect the church, affect others, and affect ourselves. And that is also God's will. Okay, so you notice right here, her emphasis is on natural consequences. Some people only view God's disciplining as natural consequences. All right. And I think natural consequences is one way God can discipline us. But I think that there's other ways that God child trains us as well. Yes, killer banana, there is a sense in which we could be ashamed. Because according to First John, it says, uh, so, that, uh, so that you're not ashamed of his coming. So, there is a sense. That we walk as Christ walked. Plain and simple. It's God's will for his children. Notice I said his children. We're already his children. It's not said that we become or, be, or we're accepted as his children. All right, I hope I made that clear, and I will come back with many positional. It says, we're ashamed of him. Well, I think Second Timothy, if we deny him, he would deny us. Sanctification uh, verses in which God. Parents can be disappointed or ashamed of their children. That language is all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, the phrase, you are not my people. I don't take that as about salvation. They're in covenant violation. So in that language, it's like whenever a parent says, hey, come get your son, you know, because they don't, they wanted to separate themselves at that point, even though, of course, that child is theirs as well. They want to put them off on the other parent at that time, you know. God is our sanctification. He sanctified us. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the offering of Jesus' body that makes us holy, set apart, sanctified. Okay, guys. That's pretty good. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, what about part two? And she's doing these in real time, it looks like. Okay. Part two. Okay, so we're going to go over some positional sanctification. And normally when it uses that word, it is talking about a permanent positional state. So <laughs> positional is where we are in God's eyes because of what Christ has done. And it doesn't change. And the cat. Permanently, positionally justified. Declared righteous because of Jesus. Declared holy because God has set us apart himself. So she's only talking about positional sanctification. This is good, but it's no reason for me to go through it. Let me just skim it real quick. He set us apart, devised. So for both, we are God blessed the seventh of Israel. But this 1910 Y experience, that's an experiential sanctification. That's, that changes, right? To God, dedicated to him, right? Because they had to do something and it, in God's presence. So let's let's look at this. Who is making the, and sanctified sentiment to the world is truth so we can see it used in many ways make them holy make them set them up set them apart make them righteous presentable clean by your word right, the sex thing influence John 17 19 God. and for their commend you to God and to the that's positional it's ridiculous give you an inheritance among all them with Christians that are living holy enough lives that's ridiculous all that are sanctified are not all the Christians that are living holy enough lives that's ridiculous give you that's positional. All that are sanctified are not all the Christians that this is has nothing to do with what we're doing. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. This is Acts 20, 32, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's positional. It could be positional. It, it, it just, I would have to look at it. The R. And we, I actually looked at this the other day. Uh, I think it depends on how the participle, because it could be which are being sanctified, and then that would make the inheritance possibly uh, not positional inheritance, but uh, experiential. In other words, related to reward and things. All that are sanctified are not all the Christians that are living holy enough lives. That's ridiculous. Give you an inheritance among all them which are set apart for the purpose of inheritance. And that's a confusing term, because the word sanctified and holy you mean the same thing. And so, uh, when she means that, she means holier, holier thou, 
or a certain expectation. Uh, so, I mean, she's not using clear language here. Um, maybe, maybe if I knew her, of her views and other videos and stuff, maybe it's more clear and she's expecting her audience to track with her. They're God's people. They're sanctified because what? The spirit in them is the Holy Spirit. We've been set apart and made holy. The holiness required for heaven is a gift of holiness, a gift of sanctification based on Jesus's offering of his own body. Tells us that in Hebrews. Acts 26, 18. To yeah, ultimate glorification, yes. There's different types of glorification as well. Open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's that's permanent and positional. It could be, but uh, that's covenant language. Uh, so it depends on how you take it in light of the covenant. So it could be experiential as well. At least my first thoughts on about it. We are sanctified also clearly as I, us into Christ. Do you remember John the Baptist says, I only baptize with water, but the Holy Spirit and with fire, the offering of Jesus' body. Uh, would we have to be how arrogant would we have to be because the holy one the holy spirit dwell yeah that's what ray comfort would say no they're holy because they're in christ our sanct this is a statement of fact people it's just saying the church of god which is at corinth to them that are sanctified in christ jesus called to be saints this message isn't for you no it's positionally the church has been sanctified set apart because it tells us in first corinthians that he is our sanctification those things for us it is you are sanctified, but fully sanctified, set apart. So sanctified, set apart. You getting it now? It's just the Holy Spirit is in us. We're sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Who's that saying? Well, if there's one of the parents that isn't a believer, what about our kids? Are they only half clean? No, they're all clean. Because see, a little bit of Jesus, well, if you can catch it, it'll clean you completely up. He doesn't catch leprosy. Yeah, that just means that they're set apart into a favorable position where the, uh, they get to hear the gospel, essentially. The leprosy catches holiness. Him. The husband, because the one of God's children. All right. If it sanctifies, it makes holy. So I have no idea. Any depth of spiritual truth. They don't get it. Not at all. Now, I read this earlier. First Thessalonians 4 3. For this is the should abstain from morning the time it's used. It's positional and it's a work of God. It has nothing to do with our behavior. So um, here we go. Second Thessalonians 2 13. Now, a lot of people get tripped up on this, and they shouldn't, because all it's saying is that the spirit in us is holy, and therefore we are. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So a lot of Calvinists use that says he chose you. I don't think chosen is for salvation there. It's the service. The salvation, no. And that doesn't necessarily mean that salvation is, is positional there also. He chose the type of salvation. Salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. You Gentiles and you anybody that's a believer, that's how he chose to save. All over the place. It's sanctified by the word of God in prayers. Because it says you get the gospel to him. And while he's telling him all about what Jesus did, what are you done? Said, like if I came out and said, if you don't, live this way and if you don't stop doing that then god's going to do xyz and you'll uh, get some penalty and you won't be saved that's legalism see the penalty language that's my concern i need to i need to, to understand exactly what she means by that but to say who you are in christ is is how we walk this is just so many people have been church hurt it's just messed up Right. And he warned us against that. That is not legalism. Nobody's threatening anyone. Nobody's putting condemnation and death. I just have to admit what scripture is clear about. Sanctification is a gift. It is permanent. It is positional. It is in Christ. It is a work of God. But the word sanctify, sanctifying, sanctified also refer to spiritual walking, like our of verses, to describe our behavior, our practical living. So I cannot deny it when it's right there. That is experiential. That goes up and down. That changes. But our position does not. The sanctification, the holiness required for heaven to be holy because he's holy and you 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 have to be holy to enter heaven is of God. And that doesn't change. He made you holy. He made you set apart. You didn't do anything. You were incapable of that kind of holiness. Okay, you guys.
God bless you. So the thing is, is that it's not what she said in those videos. Let's just type in the word discipline and see what happens. Sword punishment. I don't know how she takes that passage. Um, I know that she don't agree with me on the outer darkness stuff, even though I take a metaphorical view at from my one video, it looks like. I would have to go and study her views. Um, but I'll keep looking for more videos, you know, in the future as they're released. But I'm hopeful based on what I've heard. So y'all let me know if y'all know of anything that... Uh, not what she said in these videos, but what uh, what she said in other videos that help us understand, you know, what she believes. I, I'm hoping she's free grace. All right, so let's go back to the original plan. Oh, praise is given with Kelly Powers. Calling me a false teacher won't be a valid excuse for you on Judgment Day. Well, I'm not, I don't think I've called him a false teacher. But don't make me think about it too much, and I will. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, let's go back to SFT. Oh, I don't need to go to this I can go to my channel. I need the views. <laughs> I don't know my views count. But let me just type in shot briefly. Charles Jennings, good to have you as well. Charles from the Layman Seminary. Charles, how have you been? A little bit about yourself and also a little bit about your ministry. I'm doing all right. I'm looking forward to this. You know, uh, I think that so a little uh, bit about Sean your... and I have some things in common. We're willing, we're, our claim is that we're willing to overthrow any church tradition out there. I believe, as far as about the prodigal son, I don't think it's about salvation. It's it's more about sanctification than it's about salvation, I would say. It's about covenant violation. It's a microcosm of Israel, at least in its interpretation. If it isn't exegetically correct, you know. Remember the goal is in this video is I'm trying to imagine what Wilkin was thinking as he's watching this video when he was thinking about it. Well, when he was either thinking about debating Sean or preparing to debate Sean. So, yeah, here we go. Charles, I think your webcam just shut off. Oh, well, that that was not nice of it to do. But <laughs> well, I'm glad I got a new webcam, so I don't have that problem at least. <laughs> yeah, um, I think you heard me though, so that's good. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. God bless. Okay, God bless. I am looking forward to this. As well, I always love a good uh, soteriology debate. And you both are well studied in this area. And so I really do believe this is going to be an informed debate, a scholarly debate, and an exchange to remember. So Sean, Charles, I appreciate the introductions there. Gentlemen, for the audience sake, let me go over the format. And also we wanna keep it uh, professional in the live chat as well. Looks like we've already got a lot of live viewers. And so let's make sure we're engaging arguments, we're attacking arguments. Yeah, you use Dinoc. <laughs> yeah, good point. And not uh, each other and not uh, the guests, of course. So, okay, we've got a formal debate and it's going to be comprehensive tonight. 20 minute opening statements. The affirmative is Charles, as the question is, is free grace theology biblical? Then we're going to have 10 minute uninterrupted rebuttals. 
where the guests can engage each other's points. And then rather than a real strict cross exam, we're going to have a 60 minute free flowing discussion. And so rather than just strictly Q and A, they can, uh, our guests tonight can discuss each other's points. And then we'll have a five minute closing statement followed by a 30 minute, roughly 30 minute audience Q and A. So please, if you do have a why is YouTube doing this wherever it's like, it's very hard to read now. Is there a setting for that? Annotations, subtitles. Setting. Show video info cards, always show captions, include auto generated captions, audio video. Okay, I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. Charles Jennings, good to have you as well. Charles from the Layman Seminary. Charles, how have you been? A little bit about yourself and also a little bit about your ministry. Right, I'll, I'll I'm doing all right. I'm looking forward to this. You know, a lot of live viewers. And so let's make sure we're engaging arguments, we're attacking arguments and not uh, each other and not uh, the guests, of course. So, okay, we've got a formal debate and it's going to be comprehensive tonight. 20 minute opening statements. The affirmative is Charles as the question. YouTube's glitching. I can't get, what is this thing? Wow. Okay. Is, is free grace theology biblical? Then we're going to have 10 minute uninterrupted rebuttals where the guests can engage each other's points. And then yeah. uh, my camera just shut off again. So if it does, let me know. I don't know okay. why it's doing that. It, 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 I'm not sure. Two minute warning at the 18 minute mark. And that way you'll know to start winding things down. Yeah. Do that for me. Cool. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So the thesis for this debate is uh, free grace theology biblical. My view is yes, it's biblical. Now, the thing to understand is we're going into this debate. This is a system versus system debate. We both like to color. We both like to draw charts and things like that and get the big picture views and be analytical in certain areas. And so, you know, uh, Sean has a rainbow version uh, study Bible of his own. And I wish I could have access to it and know uh, everything that's in his mind about that. But I'm going to do the best I can in this debate. So, as I said, free grace theology is biblical. The reason it's biblical because it takes the promises and warnings seriously. It answers all the things that other systems can. It has, in other words, it has greater explanatory power. It is falsifiable, meaning that you could disprove my three column chart or add more or or you can move the data around within the chart. It generates research and it has multiple working models. Salvation and sanctification is the same throughout history, in my view. Covenants and codes are for sanctification, not salvation. It avoids conflating concepts and picks up on nuances that others miss. Using terms like justification, sanctification, and glorification for each one of the columns doesn't work anymore because those words can be used in different places. It's both analytical and synthetic because it recognizes the worm's eye and the bird's eye view of things. It emphasizes both continuity, the major themes, and the discontinuity, the differences that flow throughout the Bible. It takes into consideration that infiltrators are possible, that there are people that to meet a girl, to get a job, or whatever may say they're a believer, but they're not saved. OK, because they don't actually believe the gospel. They never believe the gospel. So this means that present belief or behavior does not determine a person's salvation. The question is, did they believe the gospel at one point in time? If so, they're eternally secure. One way to put it is that free grace is the most consistent form of eternal. Yes, uh, sanctification. It's the same. I'll, I'll show you a chart sometime why I say that. If Ryrie can say salvation is the same. Uh, and and use his arguments. Uh, I use the argument that sanctification is the same. Um, because uh, anyway, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. Security or OSAS. See, I believe that we cannot know other people's salvation. I can only know my salvation. Charles, I know that I believe. Yes, go ahead. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna pause the timer. No worries. We'll give it one more shot. I don't want to constantly interrupt your your thoughts uh, for, for your opening statement. I don't want to distract you. So I'm enjoying. You're good to go. Me? Yes, I'll start your timer again. Okay. So. so this focuses on the promise of God for eternal life. If a person believes the promise. Now, this is a very important that I argued this way about the promise of God for eternal life. Because as y'all know, this is the GES position. I'm not talking about the provision. I'm not talking about the person in this debate. Okay. I'm not saying it don't come up. Also. I'm making the arguments about the substantival participles right here. 
they're eternally secure. Now, we can know whether a doctrine is false based on what we study scripture. From my perspective, free grace theology is undefeated when it comes to formal debates. Now, um, starting at the beginning, I would say John 3, 4 makes a, uh, 3, 14 makes a comparison between the, the serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness that people were physically healed for versus Christ being lifted up at the cross. And one moment of look at belief in him ma makes you have eternal life. In John 3, 15 and 17, it does use present tenses, but they're being used in a gnomic way rather than a, a continual habitual way because it's emphasizing the timeless truth of it that this uh, this is a promise. Yeah, I know, Killer Banana. Yeah, it's sad. I still give the gospel, but it's sad. To those that I believe in all time. Now, in John 3, 18, it tells us that the basis of condemnation is when someone never believes the gospel. OK, that's very important to understand. Now, I'm going to be given a more conservative free grace theology view of things. Now, this is where I may differ from Wilkins' presentation here. I did a more conservative view. Uh, and uh, I can't remember what I'll say here, but let's see. Which means normally there will be some evidence of growth. Justification is by believing assent, personal persuasion, and confident trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Assurance is by uh, looking outwardly to Christ. No. So I said finished work of Christ here. Wilkins wouldn't say that. Even though he believes in that and would use it as a means of persuasion. Uh, inwardly. One may fail to persevere and even deny the faith. This may be the hypothetical view that SFD holds to or the actual exegetical view that I hold to. So, my so that's interesting. That lets Wilkin know where uh, SFT uh, stands at. Um, but I don't know if he caught that. Most warning passages address regenerate people. A life for Christ is the intended and commanded outcome, but it's not inevitable. Eternal security and eternal rewards are true. So Sean may answer the question in this way. Uh, he would say that free grace theology is biblical, is not biblical because salvation can be lost or forfeited. Now, from listening to a video that I've heard him say this in, it makes me believe that he thinks that not keeping the Sabbath is one possible way one could lose salvation. But Sean is not the judge, the ultimate one that determines that. They're pre well, well, some theology, you know, let them do what they want, you know. Uh, that grieves me, but, you know, I'm just going to keep teaching free grace the best way I understand it. We'll see. That God is from his perspective. But the real issue is that Sean believes individual sins will cause you to lose salvation. But pay attention to my assertion in this debate. No one goes to hell because of individual sins. In other words, this is about how one views the atonement. I can't untangle all. No, uh, he uh, he started explaining that he's not the ultimate judge. You know that the legalists always will use that. Oh, I'm not the ultimate judge. You know, so he tries to be grace. He borrows from free grace. You know, in certain areas. Well, the thing is, is that SFT doesn't believe it's about salvation either. So if they're going against the first Corinthians 927 in that way, then they're going against SFT's interpretation of the passage as well. But, you know, we're just going to keep doing our thing. I love Sean's views, but I can pull on the string and trust God to unravel the rest. So there are two views of atonement within free grace. One of them is Christ's death is only applied to those who believe. The other one is Christ's death removes the barrier. Now, this is significant because this articulation is Sean's law, uh, Sean Lazar's articulation, which I don't know for sure based on certain things I've heard Wilkins say on Grace and Focus, what he believes about this. But this paves the way for Wilkins to debate. It's amazing how God... Because we didn't know Wilkin was going to debate Griffin whenever I debated Griffin. Here for the whole world. The second one is what I'm presenting here. If it it's correct, it shows that no one goes to hell because of sin. This does not lead to universalism because only those that believe receive Christ's imputed righteousness and eternal life. And it explains this view of atonement encounters the other ones.
So uh, I'm depending on Sean Lazar in certain areas here. He developed an idea that was developed by Lewis Bray Schaefer, founder, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, but moving forward. So whenever you're talking about Calvinism or Arminianism, they both have one benefit that's limited, either to the elect or to uh, those that believe, okay, versus the manifold benefit. Now, that's a generalization, but I'm going to work with it for right now. So one benefit is a removal of the barrel. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. That's a legal benefit. Then there's a life benefit that in John 3, 16, if you believe, you receive eternal life. And then there's the benefit for the believer through cleansing and confession of 1 John 1, 9. If we walk in the light, as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all righteousness. When you look at the Old Testament sacrifices, which I do not believe they're for salvation, we see that there's multiple benefits there. So when you're looking at these atonement passages, think about benefit, beneficiary, and condition. Because remember what I'm saying, nobody goes to hell because of individual sins, because Jesus Christ removed the barrier. So even unbelievers do not go to hell because of their individual sins. Now, the reason they go to hell is not because of it's a judicial uh, judgment. It's rather because there's no place for them to go. And I'll explain this in more detail. So when we're talking about the atonement, it's not that Jesus died for some sins of all men. Some people have this view that there's certain sins that Jesus didn't die for. Either he died for all sins or only some. Uh, the other, This is also not the view that Jesus died for all sins of some men, as some Calvinists typically view it. J rather, Jesus died for all the sins of all men. See, hell is a natural consequence, not a judicial punishment. In other words, if we talk about the illustration of a drug dealer who's killed while dealing drugs or in a, in a shootout or something, that's a natural consequence that he reaped. Whereas if a drug dealer is killed for committing a murder, that's a judicial consequence. As I said, this goes back to Lewis Ray Schaefer, and this is uh, articulated by Lazar. But the point is, is that some of the other benefits that include within the atonement is uh, free from traditions as a form of way of life. And so that has an implication for legalism. Now, my approach to studying scripture is I believe there's three columns. There may be more, there may be less, but that's up for you to establish based on your own study of the Bible. But this is what I work with, position, experience, and ultimate. So when That was the holding place is strange to me because why are they judged according to their works? What's the judgment for that's a good question. If if I don't know, it may be it may be like we were talking about the other day, like you live in a on a bad planet, you know. I don't know. When I see a word, I treat it like a variable, a concept, and I try to determine how this word's being used. Is it referring to what God's done in the past for me? Is it referring to what He's going to do in the future for me? Or is it referring to uh, what's going to happen in this temporal realm? To nuance that even more, you'll see this chart where you have two dots here, the blue dot and the purple dot. Okay, the blue is position, the green is experience, and the purple is the ultimate, spirit, soul, and body. You can put it that way. Now, one moment of belief is what makes you positionally, eternally secure. And one moment of when you die, resurrect, or get raptured is what makes you have that glorified body. So let me break this down a little bit. You can see that I got this color coded. So the blue, even on the positional column, the first column, you see, one moment of belief in the gospel makes their spirit eternally preserved, even if they do not temporarily persevere. It sets a process in motion. Notice it's green because it's showing it's the basis also for the experience. And there's also purple in here showing it's the basis for the, getting a glorified body. It's not the walk. It's not the temporal experience that is part of the basis or requirement for receiving a glorified body. So uh, the position guarantees salvation in the body when God brings death, rapture, or resurrection, resulting in the removal of indwelling sin. Eternal preservation is based on positional truth that cannot be reversed. Now, when we talk about the experience, the temporal experience is based on additional moments of belief and unbelief. We call it experiential sanctification, and it cannot be conflated with positional truth. It cannot undo or disprove the positional truth column. I usually take a passage as experiential uh, in a debate to see the explanatory power and to simplify things. Some temporal blessings and rewards are, are received based on one's being in fellowship in their, in their temporal realm. Then we get to the ultimate category. Uh, whenever salvation is of the body is completed, as I already mentioned before. So the, also, this is when eternal rewards are received based on how one lived their life on earth before. So the thing to understand is our fellowship can be broken. That's why there's a dash. Whereas uh, whenever we get a glorified body, we have perfect fellowship with God. Now, we could go into more details about this, nuances and stuff, but it's not just based off of tense. It's not just for stuff of verbal aspect or action start. There's other things involved here. But to simplify things, I recommend this chart that's based off of the work of Lucas Kitchen in his book, Eternal Clarity. He has a column for the never believer and the every believer, the disobedient believer and the obedient believer. And he walks through there. And so I got it divided up in the position and experience. So if you want something simple, that will help in that. Now, to visualize what I'm talking about is that at the moment of salvation, when you first believe the gospel, two things automatically occur. 
One, you're placed positionally in the eternal realm. And two, you're automatically placed in the fellowship with God. The, the fellowship aspect starts out automatic, but then you can fall out of fellowship when you sin. And so it becomes semi-automatic in that we have the responsibility moment by moment to decide whether we're going to walk with God or not. So going forward, I just mentioned that maintaining fellowship is semi-automatic. Now, uh, a basis for this chart, you can go to passages like 1 Peter 1, 3, 8, where it talks about those distinctions. Another thing to help understand my system is that eternal life is primarily qualitative. In John 17, 3, it talks about this, that eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ. See, God disciplines people as a perfect parent, and he does this through blessings and curses. In Deuteronomy 38, underneath the theocracy of Israel, he lists those blessings and curses, which are described by a metonymy, a figure of speech, to say that blessings are represented by the word life, and cursings are represented by the word death. So what happens is that this is the backdrop for understanding all the encouragement and warning passages in the New Testament and the rest of the Bible. And what this means is that God reserves the right to do various forms of divine discipline. So when life or death are mentioned in a particular passage, we have to evaluate it on context as well as blessing and cursing what's going on there. For example, in Hebrews 10, 26, when it's talking about sinning willfully, I believe this relates to Numbers chapter 15, the sin of the high hand, which is uh, whenever you commit a capital crime, there was no temporal sacrifice. Remember what I said, the sacrifice, Old Testament sacrifices were not for salvation. They were for sanctification, fellowship, worship. So all this is talking about is that there's an irreversible consequence that one is under the divine discipline. And we shouldn't assume that just because fire is mentioned in, in Hebrews 10, that it's talking about hell. In fact, God is described as a fire. Uh, various forms of divine discipline happen in forms of fire. Now, whenever I interact with a conditionalist, sometimes I'll use terms like positional faith, positional work, positional obedience. Don't let that surprise you. I'll define those terms if they come up. Now, I'll also, whenever I'm in these debates, I'll, I'll, Often what happens is there's a change from belief as a requirement for salvation to commitment or continuous trust. So watch out for redefining the faith. It may occur. Another thing is that free grace focuses on the object of salvation being Jesus Christ. And what makes it so hard to believe uh, the gospel is the content that Jesus is God, that he's a substitutionary sacrifice that died and resurrected and promises eternal life. Only the Holy Spirit reveals that. Another thing we have to be very careful about is whenever in these debates, there's a reference about sacrifice and service, but the position of salvation is based on Christ's sacrifice and his service on the cross, not ours. Furthermore, I am not antinomian, and I don't believe true free grace is. Well, what if you get saved while you're sinning? That's a good question. So, like, uh, but the question is, are you in fellowship? Like, let's use the smoke the weed example, right? Uh, if you're smoking weed and you flip through the channel and you see the gospel, you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, but you're still smoking weed. Well, are you sinning? Or is sinning like the issue is, do you know that weed is a sin at that time? Are you convicted by the Holy Spirit before or after? That would be an issue, you know? Not everybody knows that smoking weed is a sin before or if it is you know and, and so i mean yeah I, I i see your point yeah and i i've been thinking about that as well so i appreciate it killer banana see it's not from the non-free gracers that my views get challenged or tweaked it's from the free gracers, so i appreciate that uh titus 2 talks about how Grace teaches to deny ungodliness, or in other words, it promotes godliness. So keep that in mind. Now, there's a right, but my point is, Killer Banana, is that if they don't know, it's not sin. In other words, if you're ignorant of it, it doesn't break your fellowship. It's only whenever you know uh, that that it breaks your fellowship or strains your fellowship. Some theology, in some ways, I think you're free grace. You're more free grace than the hyper grace people. That's maybe what I would say because of how you understand certain passages. But no, I, I definitely get challenged more from free grace people on the inside. Well, well, think about it like this, killer. If you don't know it because you're reluctant to read the Bible or you're reluctant to do, you know, then uh, then that's no excuse. 
but if you're but if you're walking in the light, right? If you're walking in doctrinal fellowship and you're convicted of sin, right? Then yeah, you 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 that's your responsibility. So think of it like that. God can't hold you as accountable to something if you were ignorant of it. Now we say ignorance is no excuse, but what they mean by that is you know the law. Okay? So if you know God's standard then there's no excuse. And, you know, I'm willing to think about the possibility of fellowship. You know, what does it mean to break fellowship? Maybe strains the fellowship. Um, grieves the fellowship, quenches it. A lot that I could talk about concerning Deuteronomy 32. It's really fascinating. I think it's key to understanding the book of Hebrews. So I'm just going to hit the high points, mainly where the words in blue are at. So basically what you have is God is a rock or the, the refuge language, striking the rock, those type of imagery, protection and provision. We also see disinheritance language when he says they're not my children. So Israel was in danger of disinheritance or there were being. Dis yeah, and, you know, that may be so. Neon Johnson. OK, uh, Neon, are you asking as a Christian? Or are you asking as a as a non Christian? Answer that question first, and then I can answer your question in in to better better detail or more honed in on what you're asking. It's inherited, but this is not talking as a believer. Okay, I have a question. How does someone get right with God? All right. So now that you answer that question, now my next question is: What do you mean by right with God? Are you talking about getting saved? Or are you talking about right with God in your walk? Talking about salvation. The promised land is not heaven. It's referring to the rich blessings that are above. Okay, in our walk. Well, right with God, we're going to relate to the idea of righteousness. And so this is what I would say. When you do something right, in other words, when you obey God's word in faith, and you're doing it in power of the Holy Spirit, then uh, then that's declared as righteous. In other words, it's rewardable behavior. You did it by the word, in the spirit, and with the right motive, right? And you may not know all that until you get to the judgment seat of Christ. But um, my, some people say First John 1, 9, but that's if it's talking about spiritual fellowship. Is First John one nine talking about spiritual uh, fellowship? And can fel spiritual fellowship be broken, or is it just strain or in strain that's mentioned there? You know. Abundance, as well as ruling and reigning in the millennial kingdom. So there's a danger in the book of Hebrews about this. Uh, there's parental language in Deuteronomy 32, which I see pick up in Hebrews chapter 12. And you see this language of the father who bought you and the nations of inheritance, the Lord's portion. So we have this idea of the Lord inheriting. In Hebrews 1, you have the son inheriting because of his faithfulness. This says that there was no foreign God with them. So this is describing that they came out not in idolatry. And yet we come here and they neglect the rock of salvation. Deuteronomy 32. Killer Banana says, I'm willing to set first John 1 9 as being evangelistic, but think the concept is transdispensation. God is the rewarder of diligent seekers. Yeah, I agree. It, it's transdispensational. 15 and 18. Okay, I was always told that if I confess my sin, I'm right with God. Well, to confess, if you mean agree, yeah, homilegeo, confess, agree. But yeah, so that's. That's always been my conservative answer is that whenever you confess your sins, you're back in fellowship with God. If that's your view, I have no problem with that. But lately we've been dealing with hyper grace people that have a problem with that view. And uh, that's why I answered your question in a very sensitive manner, because I didn't know where you were coming from with that. But yeah, that's fine. Uh, the we're, we're free grace is working on that issue of first John 1 9, 
but if that's your view, then yeah, uh, I definitely that's not going to be a problem. Uh, uh, I think he. Hebrews 2, 3, Hebrews 6, the refuge imagery is full, pulling from this. They forsook, the Hebrew word is not Tosh. Epikata Lepo is the, the Greek word that's used in the sep I've heard his name, but I don't remember in what context. Uh, is that the universalist guy? You gave me some theology. For this, God who made them and scored them, Nava and Aphistimi. So this is the word that's also used for apostasy. So remember, in my free grace view, I believe that believers can apostatize and they're still eternally secure. And, and one good thing about debating a traditionalist is they usually believe that the audience are believers. So it's not an issue of, oh, well, they were never saved in the first place. Uh, it, you don't have to try to uh, argue for that. Instead, it's the issue is, does apostasy lead someone to hell? Well, if my view of the atonement is correct, no one goes to hell for sin. And so what that means is that the sin is an apostasy. So therefore, no one goes to hell for the sin of the apostasy and others like that. In Deuteronomy 32, it also talks about demon worship. They sacrificed the demons who were not God. And, and it talks about neglecting the rock who begot you. That's the how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. But this not God thing is very significant because you can divide everything up into the God world and the non-God world, into God versus Satan. And Okay, no, I didn't I didn't No, I didn't know he was a Mormon. I didn't know that. If I if I ever come across him, I'll listen. All the various flavors of the religions of denominations that are not within God's will, of anything that's corrupt, is just other flavors of Satanism. So when people try to say, oh, that's just uh, syncretism, or that's just this, from God's standpoint, they're cheating on him, it's apostasy, it's rebellion. Now what's interesting in Deuteronomy 32, we have this metaphor, uh, this description of hiding his face and not seeing the Lord. This is also language that's used in, in the book of Hebrews. Without holiness, no one would see the Lord. And Moses was able to see the land at a distance, but he was not able to go in because he didn't view the Lord as holy. And so I think that's part of that motif as well. I'm trying to hit some of the problem passages by dealing with the Deuteronomy backdrop. Fire, burning, consuming that we see in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. I think it's based off a of year um, for my fire is kindled and burns and consumes with it a yield. I don't think it's a reference to hell. There's a couple other passages. The statement about vengeance is mine. I will repay is explicitly mentioned in Deuteronomy, uh, I mean, uh, Hebrews 12. So it's alluding back to this passage. There's so many things to be involved, but basically Hebrews 10 could be alluding to what happened, is, what's going to happen in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. There was actual fire. One million Jews died in those conflicts and stuff like that. And it's been said that this uh, letter of Hebrews or book of Hebrews was a warning to Jewish believers. And as a result, none of them perished in this. So Two kind minutes. of happy ending. So as we're going through here, we see this language being used. And you also see this possession and life language being used as well. I already made a reference to the holy and a distance. So when you get into Hebrews 10, you can see all this. Now in Hebrews 10, it talks about positional sanctification. We have been sanctified. We've been perfected for all time. And then it talks about that whenever it, about forsaking as a, a day is drawn near, this could be related to 70 a, AD as well. But then it says right here, unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. I take that as position of sanctification in that view. So I don't believe that Hebrews 10 or the book of Hebrews is ever talking about loss of position of salvation or even position of salvation uh, in the sense of you got to do these things to maintain it. So th I'm hoping that this will give you an idea of both of the atonement and the implications that no one goes to hell because the individual sins, how that explains the free grace, as well as understanding passages like Hebrews 32 related to sanctification and divine discipline as a backdrop, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 32, as a backdrop for the book of Hebrews. There's more things that we could go into, but that's the gist of what I'm essentially saying. We have language stuff, we have charts galore, whatever we need to get into. I know he has a complex system, I do too, but we're going to seek to clarify things and understand each other so that, so that the next person that debates is at a better position than we are. God bless. <laughs> that's actually Wilkin. <laughs> Charles, thank you very much for that 20 minute opening statement to the audience. I am all caught up on questions to anybody just. Anyway, y'all can go watch uh, that debate if y'all wanna go watch it again. Uh, they give you an idea, maybe like what Wilkin might've thought of my presentation. Uh, I don't know exactly what, uh, what he would think of his opening, but I'm thinking Wilkin don't like visuals. He thinks they're a distraction usually, at least in a debate. So I don't know if he will use PowerPoints. Um, I think I'm going to go look on Praise's channel, guys. Um,
So, yeah. All right. So this plane's about to land. Y'all watch more content. What's your thoughts on Andy Woods? He's the president of my uh, seminary um, via our Grace Christian community. Um, so I have great respect for him. That doesn't mean I always agree with them. Uh, is there any other question you want to ask me? Would you like to come in and ask me some questions before we land this plane? I can give you the link. You got to let me know. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, others can come in too, but we just got to keep, uh, keep things organized. Okay. All right, there's the link. I'm going to go get me a Ramon noodle, just a dry one, so I can eat while I'm talking. Because uh, I'm hungry. I've been streaming since, like, I don't remember what time it was. Oh, my back's bothering me. I'll be right back, guys. Hey, Brandon. Hey, what's up? Not much. So, uh, oh, you so want to get you want? About, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just asking about Andy Woods. I was watching his end time study. I like him. Yeah. So your uh, your dispensational pre trib, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty trivia and dispensational. Yeah, good. Yeah. That that's common ground for us. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's good. Yeah, Layman, do you uh, agree with my title? The title I've chosen. God loves reprobates. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I was saying at Praise I Am's channel. And there were well, like uh, hold on, some theology. Okay. You know that you know this is VR Church, right? The guy that oh yeah, Greg, Greg Jackson promotes and uh, uh, David Benjamin. So we want to try to, as much as we can, oh you yeah. know talk talk about the free grace, hyper grace, war yeah. stuff, uh, yeah, and see where we're at on all that, you know. Um. So. Brandon, you got any questions for me? Yes, or asking, so what's the difference between free grace and hyper grace? What would you say? <laughs> well, still working on it. But what I can tell you is this. Anyone that accuses free grace of the Galatian error is hyper grace. That's my definition. That's my working definition. Yeah, yeah. But what do you think? Galatian era is like when we say Galatian era, what do you think what we're saying? You know what I'm trying to say? Galatian era is is the book of Galatians is more about uh, experiential sanctification than it is about justification. Okay, a lot there are some people that used to make think that Galatians was just about how to get justified, and so they thought that Paul was coming against uh, salvation only. You know, justification, positional justification. But actually, it's about experiential sanctification as well. So that means that there are some people that teach that salvation is by grace through faith, right? For justification. But they think that the sanctification is by works. So the Galatian, so people that think of it like that have committed the Galatian error because they're not realizing that the book of Galatians is referring to sanctification too, because sanctification needs to be by grace through faith, just like justification is by grace through faith. 
I would agree with that. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I right. think what you call sanctification, we just call walk in the spirit. So there's no, I mean, I know we argue about that all the time, right? Experiment yeah, it's it's like the that. same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Yeah. So I would agree with that. So I did change my mind about that because what you guys just call experimental sanctification would just be us calling walk in the spirit, renewing your mind. Yeah, renewing the mind, spirit. The reason we call it sanctification, we I ate killer banana, peaceful banana. Thank you for changing your name to help with the algorithm. Um, so yeah, and, and the thing is, we were watching. I don't know if you saw. We were reviewing a video that Renee Rowland put out. I don't know if you know who she is, but she. Yeah, I know who she is. Yeah. Okay. And see, I watched, I reviewed the video because I honestly don't know where she's going to land in the hyper grace versus free grace wars and stuff, you know, because uh, but because I think she has a different, she has a different view of her Sean one nine, and I think there's some other things. I don't want to speak presumptuously. I got to do my research more. But anyway, she said that there's two past that she believes are talking about experiential sanctification. Did you see me talk about those? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. One of them is in Thessalonians. I can't remember which Thessalonians. It says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And then it, uh, this, yeah, then it says that you abstain from uh, a fornication. So, in that passage, it seems that this is the passage she used. It's indicating that sanctification is being used experiential. Yeah, I know that verse. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll say the way we abstain from fornication, we walk in the spirit. So that you get so again, experimental sanctification. I'll just call it walk in the spirit. That's how we abstain from it. But it says this is your sanctification. What kind of sanctification is it? Well. I still hold the view that you know Christ is our sanctification. So it's saying because we're sanctified, we'll abstain from fornication. All right, so let's talk about this. When the path now, I know you can preach. I know you can preach. I just need you to be concise as possible, though. All right. When it says Christ is our sanctification, what is the meaning of that? Well, that he's our sanctification. You know, when we believe on him, we're set apart. Like he does that. Right. We're set apart yeah. positionally. Okay. But let me ask you a question. Is sanctification a person or a thing? That's a good question. Uh, no, just, um, let me clarify. The, just the concept, sanctification. I'm not talking about the sentence that we just talked about. He is our sanctification. Just the concept. I would say it's a person. So the word sanctified is means it's a person. You got me there. No, that that'd be a thing. <laughs> right, it's a thing. So when we come to a passage and it says he is our sanctification, all right, that's equating two things. We got a person, the he, and then we got a thing. Well, then we got to ask ourselves, what is the relationship of this person to thing? The answer, I believe, is he's the source. Of our sanctification. He's the source of our positional sanctification. He's the source of our experiential sanctification. And he's the source of our ultimate sanctification. I agree with that. I like that. Yeah. I agree with that. Okay. So what that means is you can't use that passage to rule out experiential sanctification. Right, right. I repent of that. I do apologize. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right. So what about the other passages? Can a reprobate still be saved? Yes. What's your thoughts on James 2? What do you think James 2 is talking about? James 2 is talking about how to be useful to God. So you don't think he was contradicting Paul at all? No, absolutely not. Yeah, thank you, Fiji. Uh, well, they were laughing on. at me and yelling. Yeah, sorry. Oh. All right. Well, give me some time, some theology. I'll get to it. Okay. So James 2, okay, when it says, can that faith save you? I think it, it, faith without works is dead. The, what it's talking about being saved from is the, the, the divine discipline that the Lord has them under because of them showing partiality. 
because they're discriminating. They're they're favoring the rich and all of that. And so he says that. And when it says dead, it means unproductive. And so uh, it's not a contradiction of Paul. Paul, Paul, Paul argues in very similar ways in several different passages. Uh, <clears throat> and even if even if James and Paul were saying two different things, that one emphasizing another thing like traditionally it's being called, which I don't take that view. I think James and Paul are, talk, are saying the exact same thing. Okay. But even if, even if you took the traditional view that most people hold to, that Paul's emphasizing one aspect and James is emphasizing another aspect, it's still no basis for saying that James has error in it okay yeah well in acts 15 well why was james um quoting i think it was amos 9 11 when he says and this is why i return with but again the tabernacle of day which is falling down i built again the ruins there if i set it up so why was he quoting that during this time period Do you know what i mean yeah yeah let me explain that i'm going to uh draw to be able to explain this i was talking about this last night um not within the context of grace, but in the context of explaining the difference between Acts 2 and progressive dispensationalism. I don't know if you know the difference between those two. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I won't go into it unless I absolutely have to, but I think I can explain this. Um, so let me give you some basics of how I understand dispensationalism. <clears throat> You have the Abrahamic covenant. You, are you familiar with that? Uh, yes. Okay. So the Abrahamic covenant promises three things. Land, seed, and blessing. Okay. You familiar with that? Yep. All right. So the land relates to what some would call the Palestinian, but it's probably better to call it the land covenant on Deuteronomy 30. The seed concerns 2 Samuel 7, uh, and that would be the Davidic covenant, okay? And the blessing is the new covenant. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. All right. So, do you also understand that in dispensationalism, the church is a mystery? Are you familiar with that term? Yeah, the mystery, yeah. I am, yeah. Okay, so in, in Acts 2 dispensationalism, Based on Ephesians 3 and Colossians 1, the church is not in the Old Testament, the metaphorical body of Christ. Do you agree with that? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay, good. No. So, what that means is that while salvation has been the same ever since the fall, you agree with that? 100%, yeah. Okay. Uh, and you do you agree that there was always a possibility for a Gentile to be blessed, even in the Old Testament? Uh, I had to do more study on that. I would say for now, yeah. Yeah. So, when we were talking about the Abrahamic covenant, right, was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile? He was a Jew. When did he become a Jew? I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Are you familiar that Abraham was called out of, uh, out of Ur of Chaldee, which is modern day Iraq? Uh, no. Yeah. He was living in Iraq. So, some people view him as a Gentile. But regardless of all that, you have the Abrahamic covenant. That's what this big box represents, okay? The Abrahamic covenant is larger than the Mosaic covenant. Okay, because the Mosaic covenant only referred to Israel. But Abraham had other descendants besides Israel, right? That includes Isaac's descendants. That includes, uh, in, uh, you know, you had Abraham, uh, and uh, then he had Isaac, right? And Esau. And then you had, uh, 
and you, uh, oh gosh. Yeah. And, oh, and what's his name? The, um, the one the Muslims say he's from. Ishmael. They were descendants of Abraham. And based on blessing by association, they got certain blessings, okay? So that could be a basis for Gentile blessing. But here's the point. The, the Because the church is a mystery, right? You, have you ever heard of the Peak and Valley explanation of things? Uh, no. Okay. The Peak and Valley thing is that whenever you're studying prophecy, the prophets a lot of times only saw the peaks. But that... Just because this is the first coming here and this is the second coming here and, <laughs> and all this, they didn't see the church because it's like the church is in the valley. It didn't exist. Okay. So what, what happens is they can see Gentile blessing because it says through you, all seeds will be blessed and that many nations will come from you. Right. You can see passages that concern Gentile blessing. That's even tied to after the Davidic covenant. You can see new covenant language. You can see in Zechariah 14 about the nations going up. So even though you can't see the church, you can see how in the in the kingdom, right? Because in the millennial kingdom, you have Jesus Christ as the seed being a blessing in the land. So one way to look at it is, you know how we divided up the Abrahamic covenant into three parts? Yeah. All three of those culminate in the kingdom. Okay, when Christ is reigning. So my point is that they could see there's going to be a, a Gentile blessing, a Gentile gathering of the nations and all of this stuff. And it's going to occur after the Davidic covenant, right? So what what they're doing, and that you'll see this throughout the Bible, it's even in Acts 2, it's in other places. What they'll do is they'll say, okay, based on what we know from Revelation, in other words, from the Bible we had at the time, which was the Old Testament, we see that there's a Gentile blessing. Therefore, what's going on now in the church age is in harmony with this blessing, and so therefore we should accept it. It doesn't mean that what was going on was, a, was the fulfillment of it. Therefore, James was not wrong. You understand? Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. And I can show you where Andy Woods argues like that. I can show you where other people argue like that because uh, we have to deal with those passages because of progressive dispensationalism. But if you're not dealing with progressive dispensationalism, you might not be sensitive to those issues. So right. James is not wrong in uh, the passage. What What's wrong is when we assume how that when he's speaking that uh our interpretation of him is wrong. Okay, where's the exact passage in, in Acts fifteen? Hello I'm right now, yeah, I'm trying to find right now. Verse 16. All right. So I'll start at 13. After they had stopped speaking, who was speaking? Uh, it was, I think it was Paul. And okay. Yeah. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. You see how this relates to Gentile blessing? Yep. Setting them apart? Okay. And look who he says said it. Simeon. <clears throat> okay. Where does Simeon make reference to that? Okay. 15.7. So let's drop back to 15.7. The, the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. So look, the apostles and elders are looking into it. And there had been much debate. Peter stood up and said to them, so Peter Simeon, right, stood up and said, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
So he's talking about Cornelius right there, right? Yep. So, all right. So he's saying, look, we already know Peter's on board, okay? He's the one that the keys were given to and all of that stuff. He's the one that preached Pentecost, you know, all that when the church began. Uh, with the words of the prophets agreed. So he gave support for Peter, who's an apostle, and now he goes to the prophets who agrees with Peter, just as it's written. After, so you see what's going on here? He's saying, look, Simon already talked about this for Cornelius, and the prophets agree, just as it's written. So his point is, is not to show that this is a fulfillment, but rather that this is in harmony with the prophecy about the Gentile blessing, okay? After these things, I will return. Has Jesus Christ returned yet? No, he hasn't. <laughs> okay, we agree on that. And after these things, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle, tabernacle of David, which has fallen. Has the tabernacle of David been rebuilt yet? No. And we're building its ruins and I will restore it. So we know we're dealing with a future time. So James knows the Old Testament scripture. You agree with that? Yeah, he does. Okay. So he's not an all millennialist. You only have pre millennialists at this time. Everybody was waiting for the future of the kingdom. And for 40 days, Jesus in Acts 1 taught about the kingdom. Okay. And they asked the question. Lord, is it time to restore the kingdom? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons, but tarry in Jerusalem, and you shall receive the promise from the Father. So even though he told him about the kingdom, he started the church so a few days later, right? Okay. Yeah. So the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. So notice he's focusing on the Gentiles right here. And all the Gentiles are the nations who are called by my name says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. So this is not saying this prophecy is being fulfilled. Now watch what he says. Therefore, it is my judgment. See, whenever you're doing law, you have what's called precedent. You familiar with that term? No, I'm not. Okay, so whenever whenever you're arguing in a court of law, you, you go back to what is called case law, and you look for what is called a precedent. You're going through, and when you're in front of a court, you're basically saying, what case is similar to this, where the court ruled on this particular situation that I can use as evidence for support for the argument and case that I'm making right now? So what James did was James brought up Peter. James brought up this passage from the, from the prophets to say, therefore, it is my judgment. That we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. He's saying, don't be a trouble to them. But that we write to them that they abstain from things contained by idols. Do you get saved by abstaining from idols? Uh, no, you don't. Okay, so this is about sanctification, the wall. And for fornication and from what is strangled from blood. We know from that other passage, this is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you have stained for fornication. I'm That's bringing crazy. It to <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Yeah, well, I just re I, I repent on my view on James then being in there. That's I just right. wow. Okay. Well, thanks, brother. Yeah, I'll keep going. But then we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and for fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses, from, now look, he's quoting Moses now to support this. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he's read in the synagogues every, every Sabbath. And this is significant that he says this about Moses, because the, the Gentiles would go to the synagogues and they would listen to the word. So God was preparing the Gentiles uh, in all this time, and they would study from the Septuagint, uh, that was the, the translation, the Bible at that time. So what that meant was that the, the, the language was in the Greek. It wasn't just in the Hebrew. He's read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles. So look, we got a repeating idea here. We had the apostles and the elders. 
Uh, where was it? I just saw it. Then the apostles and elders came together. Okay? Synagogues. So there's actually a, a pun going on here. Might even be what's called an ecclesio. But it said, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church. So this means that if you're going to say, if you're going to say James was in error, then you would have to say Peter was in error. You were going to have to say that everyone was in error. Now, this plays into what hyper-dispensationalists or Pauline dispensationalists, better term to use, want to believe because they think the mystery wasn't revealed until with Paul. Now, as far as I know, I don't, I'm not sure David Benjamin and them are, are Pauline dispensationalists. If they are, then they're in contradiction to, to uh, other passages that we can argue for, and that's a different issue. But regardless of that, I believe the church began in Acts 2. Now, and it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch and Paul and Barnabas. Now, this is the thing. If you say they were in error, then you're saying they were in error to choose Paul, which would mean that Paul was not commissioned by the apostles. Now, yeah, there are places where Paul talks about his apostleship is from Jesus Christ and he didn't confer with flesh and blood and, you know, and all that. But here it's talking about commissioning him for the Gentile ministry to any of them. Judas called Barsabas the size leading man and brethren. And they sent this by letter to them. So now we're reading the letter. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren Antioch, Syria, and Silica, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your soul. So who's the we right here? Uh, I don't know. Sorry. It's the apostles and the brethren and the elders. At oh. least that's what I'm thinking of. So that includes James. So this idea that James was in opposition and that he had false teachers coming. Now, what you did have is you had Judaizers from Jerusalem, but that didn't mean that they were sanctioned by James. Okay. Because James is saying it with this we, since we have heard in some of our numbers to whom we give no instruction, had disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls. It seemed good to us. Having become of one mind, right, the, the, are united together to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we send Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word, mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to show you this also. This is a good connection. You see right here, it said, seem good to us. And then it yeah. says, seem good to the Holy Spirit. To lay upon you no other great burden than these essentials. So it's repeating all of this. So this is showing you that when they're speaking, they're speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Seem good to us. Now what someone might say is, oh, well, it seemed that way, but it wasn't actually. But no, that's not what they're meaning here. Because it's, uh, this term also happens, if I remember right, I think it's in Acts 6. Look at this. Whenever they choose the first, what became later on, the deacons, uh, it, it says, let's see. They wanted to pick people, you know, to wait tables, right? Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit of wisdom, right? And then let's see. Uh, it's talking about Stephen and all this. I might be confused in another passage. I thought it said it seemed good to us and the spirit. I thought it was also mentioned here. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, but... This is an example where they do select other people and, and they're doing it based on the spirit, okay? There's no reason to see any difference between what's going on here 
For this statement found approval with the whole congregation, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. There's every indication that this decision here was spirit-led. And there's every indication that this decision here was spirit-led. So James is not in error here. Okay? You keep going. Lay upon no greater burden than these essentials. That you say we already established this is about sanctification or the walk. If you keep yourself free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch and have it gather the congregation together. They delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Why was there an encouragement? Because they understood that in their sanctification. They didn't have to keep the Mosaic law. They didn't have to be circumcised or anything like that. Uh, the reality is, is that they, uh, the Gentiles, were not having to do those things. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. After they had spent time there, they sent away from the brethren a piece to those sent out. So they went into more detail about these issues. And then here's the phrase again, even though this is a text or variant. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others, also the word of the Lord. Now, just for support for what I'm saying, I want to show you something. I'm going to pull up my overview of Galatians that I wrote before all this stuff broke out. So that you can see how I'm saying, you know, I'm not making things up. Are you still there? Yeah, brother, I'm still here. All right, so let me show you how I understand. Uh, I gotta start rethinking my whole position now. <laughs> like, this. Well, I mean, because yeah. well, David on Benjamin it. developed it, man. Well, all right, so look at this. So this is chapter 1 and 2. Paul establishes apostolic authority while standing for the gospel, which initially appears to refer to positional justification, but experiential sanctification is also involved, 1 and 2. Uh, 1, 1 through 24. Paul stands unique among the apostles and the deserters and distortion because of his unique call and commission and his experiences in ministry Depended on God's revelation confirmed by the Jerusalem Apostle. 1, 1 to 24. A false gospel has influenced Christians, which means their view of the means of sanctification is affected. For example, Galatian is written primarily to Gentile Christians that a false teacher bewitched them into believing the law saves or sanctifies them. And I'll show you what my professor said, uh, his comment right here. He said, it's difficult to see exactly what the problem was in Galatia. We can only infer it from Paul's response. However, it seems to clearly involve both justification and sanctification, and the latter is clearly an outworking of the former. So this is Jeremy Thomas, another professor at Schaefer Theological Seminary who works together with Andy Woods. Okay? In fact, this professor... Later on, after me taking this class, wrote a commentary on Galatians. Let me pull it up. How about I learn how to spell the word Galatians? There it is. Jeremy Thomas, Gospel of Freedom. Okay. We may come back to this, but I just want you to see Schaefer Theological right. Seminary in Free Grace is not in Galatian era. In fact, Dennis Roxer, I don't know if you saw, I mean, y'all reacted to it, but I don't know if you thought about what he was saying. Roxer was recognizing that there were some within grace that were making it sound like sanctification was by works. And he called it a faux pas. In other words, a mistake, an error. And he said that sanctification is by grace, you know, uh, faith and grace. So anyway, Paul's uniqueness and two, what'd you say? Did that sound, yeah, I agree. I agree. Paul's uniqueness and two aspects of gospel content, one, one, and five. Paul's apostleship is unique in the truth of the resurrection. 
Paul writes in multiple churches. Paul greets them and includes substitution. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip the parts that are not necessary. Paul addresses deserters for following distortions, and he does not hesitate to place them under the ban because he's serving God. The curse. Anathema doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means you're under divine discipline. Paul places the gospel distorters under rabbinical ban or curse. Paul is shocked at their deserting Christ for a distorted gospel. Paul eliminates and curses anything that contradicts the apostolic preaching. Paul repeats the curse. Watch this. 110. Pleasing men is related to this influence. Paul does not hesitate to say these things because he is pleasing God. Paul's rhetorical question about pleasing men or God. Paul answers that he pleases God as a bondservant of Christ. 111 through 24. Paul explains his unique authority and experiences and how it's based on his unique past, his present commission, and how God received glory for his ministry with little interaction with the Jerusalem apostles. 111 through 24. Paul's true gospel is God given, not based on mere man's authority or claims. 111 through 17. The gospel commission is not based on people pleasing. One eleven through twelve, it is directly from Jesus Christ that Paul did not please men from his initial calling of salvation, even up to Peter's rebuke. Paul gives his past conduct in Judaism and his present call and commission. One thirteen through seventeen, Paul gives his former life in Judaism. Thirteen to fourteen, Paul used to be against the gospel. One thirteen, Paul was deep into Judaism. One four. Paul gives his unique apostolic call and commission, 15 through 17. Paul testifies that he had minimal content with the apostles, contact with the apostles in Jerusalem. It was one was not known by sight by the Judean churches, 1, 18 to 24. Paul first encounters Peter and James after three years of being saved and serving God. Paul gives a parenthetical oath that he's telling the truth. Paul went into the regions of Syria and Silica and was unknown by sight to the church in Judea. Paul explains that they kept hearing the persecutor is now the preacher of Christ, so they glorify God at this. Paul's unique authority gives him the right and the perspective to confront those of the Jerusalem apostles that hypocritically stopped fellowshipping with the Gentiles when James' crew arrived. This perspective is based on his understanding of justification by faith because the basis for experiential sanctification never came from the Mosaic Law, 2, 1 through 21. Fourteen years later, Paul returned to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus and met with the apostles privately to reassure them that they're on the same page, 2, 1 through 10. Paul says no one was compelled to be circumcised. False brethren infiltrated to bring them into bondage, but Paul stood firm. The apostles accept him and tell him to remember the poor. Paul returns to Jerusalem 14 years later with Barnabas and Titus because of his revelation about the gospel to the Gentiles, 2, 1 and 2. Paul did this privately to help others know he was not doing this in vain. Paul explains that false brethren compelled others to be circumcised to bring them into bondage to them. But Paul and his crew never compromised to remain faithful to the gospel, 2, 3 through 5. The high-profile apostles did not give Paul any revelation, 2, 6 through 10. Instead, they confirmed what God was doing and commissioned him to the uncircumcised Gentiles, while God worked in him and Peter, who ministered to the circumcised. James and Peter gave them the right hand of fellowship. They asked Paul to remember an offering of the poor. Okay, 2, 11 through 21. Paul demonstrates apostolic authority by standing against Peter's hypocrisy. Paul's perspective of the hypocrisy of Peter. Peter comes to Antioch because he ate with the Gentiles and then would only eat with the Jews. Paul recalls how he confronted Peter for acting hypocritical. Hypocrisy occurred because of failure to recognize a change in covenant. Paul explains that Peter used to eat with the Gentiles until James, Jewish Christians, came that he feared their party called the circumcision. Paul says the rest of the Jewish Christians followed Peter's hypocrisy, including Barnabas. Paul publicly confronts Peter by asking him how he could compel Gentiles to live like Jews when he lived like the Gentiles. Paul explains that justification by faith is for both Jewish and Gentile Christians because he does not live by the Mosaic Law, which had no power to make one righteous. That belongs to Christ alone. 
Paul explains that being justified by faith is for both Jews and Gentiles. Paul explains this does not make Christ a minister of sin. Paul's view of the current church is consistent. Paul says that if he attempts to rebuild Jerusalem, uh, Judaism, once it's been destroyed in his life, he would be a transgressor. Paul died to the law to live to God. A change in covenant indicates a shift in the means of sanctification. Paul explains his position and experience. Look at that. Position and experience are both by faith in Christ and Christ's faithfulness supply empowerment for daily living. Paul does not nullify the grace of God by teaching that righteousness is through the law or that Christ died needlessly in vain. And then it goes into three. Well, but meant, hopefully uh, this is enough to show you. Of this and I can, uh, have oh, a copy yeah. of that? Yes, yes. I can give you a copy. No problem. So hopefully this demonstrates that neither I nor my seminary are guilty of the Galatian error. Now, we could talk about if you don't want to say your fellowship's not broken, I'm fine with that. I would say that in a relationship, you know, in my relationship with my mom, or my dad when I was a kid or with my wife, there are times when the relationship is closer or farther, you know? And so I think that's what happens. And then far as about divine discipline, I think a lot of it is natural consequences. Maybe some of the passages that talk about the sin unto death or people dying in a certain situation, maybe that only referred to the apostles' time. I'm willing to open that. But I also believe that God is a perfect parent, that even when he disciplines us, it's not to punish specific sins, it's to child train us. Like I gave the illustration of the break, breaking of the window, me having to replace the window, not because that, that was the payment for the window, but it was to teach me a responsibility to, uh, you know, uh, if I break something to fix it, you know, there's a lesson in that. Um, so. God disciplines in grace. God is the perfect parent that disciplines in grace. And it's not about punishment. As far as about the judgment seat of Christ, as far as my understanding, David Benjamin believes in rewards, even though he says Christ is primarily the reward, he doesn't deny rewards. Okay? So uh, hopefully that clears up some things where I'm at. Did you see the chart that I've been making about David Benjamin and hyper grace and the different Views of grace. Have you seen that one yet? Uh, no, I'm trying to catch up. I'm watching your live streams. I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> okay. All right. So give me one second. Let me see if I can find out. Um, because I've been I've been talking to Roxer about this. My professors were really trying to bring clarification in these areas. You know, because we don't want anybody stumbling. Right. I just want to. I do want to apologize. I don't think you're in Galatian era. Then I I will repent of that. I will delete my videos that I have accused you. Of being Galatian there, I will delete all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, and Brandon, uh, by the way, uh, I think the differences are minimal for the most part. And obviously, you said we're not in Galatian era. And but I think that sometimes, like, it's like in a circle. If you go one angle uh, for a little bit, it's not too far. But you go really far with it, I think it create can create some confusion especially among believers yeah i was having issues with i guess the hyper grace camp because they were telling me not to i guess listen to any anything outside of well that's that that's yeah. cult mentality I, you can listen to whoever you want you just have to be able to discern what's true and what's not so what i'm about to show you brandon is a tool that you can make for yourself um Yours may not look like mine, but this is just an idea to think about. This is nowhere near where, where it should be, okay? So what I've put together so far is David Benjamin was part of what he calls a cult at one time. Uh, Watchman Nee, Witness Lee, the Chinese, uh, that particular church. They have some extreme views of the outer darkness, um, I think they believe in partial rapturism. They had a lot of different wrong views, okay? I want you to notice something. On this chart, I don't have David Benjamin as the extreme form of free, of, of hyper grace. There's people way more extreme than David Benjamin, okay? 
I, the, the one area of extreme aspect is when he's saying James is in error. But as far as his other stuff, I'm not saying he's at the extreme. Now, Roxer, uh, which we say Duluth Bible Church, he's not at Duluth anymore, but Stegall, I put them right here. Okay? What, what Another term for this could be called the classical free grace view. Then I have free grace alliance views. All right? So this can include Dillo. This can include Bing and others like that. Then this particular, I started out this chart and I call it free grace continuum, real or imagined, meaning that it, this may not be accurate, but it's just to help me work through this. And so this is about the issues of the outer darkness. And so I made it, I, I'm still not done with it, but so you got the literal extreme view of the outer darkness is uh, a place where believers go and they would go for all eternity or for a thousand years. I reject this view. Uh, I would study it just to evaluate it, but I'm not there. Okay. And then you got other views that may be more graceful than that. David Benjamin's cult, the one he came out of, was on this literal extreme. All right. Then you have the then you have the metaphorical view. I hold to the metaphorical view of the outer darkness, like Dillo, uh, Wilkin. I think Bing does too. So then I, so what I did was I got these extreme categories, and then I have each one of these variables. And so this one believes in a literal outer darkness place. This one believes this outer darkness is metaphorical. Zulip does not believe the outer darkness refers to believers. David Benjamin does not believe it refers to believers. And hypergrace don't believe it refers to believers, okay? Then there's the millennial exclusion view, that you're not even allowed in the millennium. That's the extreme, right? The metaphorical view, they don't even believe in its millennial exclusion, okay? Uh, Julep does not believe in millennial, uh, millennial exclusion. David Benjamin doesn't believe in millennial exclusion. Uh... And I'm even saying this view, hypergrace, doesn't believe in that. Maybe there, maybe you can find some that do. Okay, the literal beatings. I don't think anyone believes that there are actual literal beatings, but let's just assume in this extreme view there were some. You see, the metaphorical does not believe that there's literal beatings. Dulip does not believe that there's any beatings, metaphorical for believers. Benjamin doesn't believe that there's any. And okay, so. Every sin is mentioned would be an extreme view, okay? A more metaphorical view might be this idea. Only unconfessed sins are mentioned. A julep would say no sins are mentioned that I know of. David Benjamin would say no sins are mentioned at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the extreme view is you have to live a life of, of confession. And this would be almost closer to like the Catholic view, except without the priest. Um, the metaphorical view can hold to a life of confession, but it's not that it's not a legalistic approach. Okay, the dual of view recognizes confession, but it's not that God breaks fellowship with us; it's that we uh, turn from Him. That's the way Wilkin puts it. I mean, not Wilkin, uh, Roxer. And then Benjamin doesn't believe that there is a life of confession that I can hear of. Okay. Some hypergraces say, well, we use the word thanksgiving, we're thanking God for that, or we're agreeing, that's all fine. I'm willing to work with that. Now, the extreme view would say a divine discipline for sin would mean a direct punishment. You did this, so you're getting this punishment. Metaphorical view would say, yeah, there's a divine discipline for sin, but it's not a one-for-one -one correspondence. Same thing with Duluth, you know, they would probably say that. And then uh, Benjamin would probably say it's natural consequences. And he might even be, have the idea of the child training idea from what I've listened to him. Now, this focus on the extreme would be punishment. The metaphorical recognizer might be some certain situations of punishment, right? Judith would say it's more parenting. And I'm wondering if David Benjamin says there's no form of punishment at all. Concerning rewards, these would be more like you're earning a job. The metaphorical say, yeah, there's rewards. Uh, Dulip would say, yeah, there's rewards. And then Benjamin would say, yes, but it's primarily Christ. 
and then and then extreme hyper grace would say no reward. Okay, then you have the sanctification by works view. That's the extreme. Metaphorical view is sanctification by faith plus works. Okay. Uh, and then you have what Dula Schaefer classical sanctification by grace through faith, which is the same as uh, Benjamin sanctification by grace through faith. So you would go through the different variations of that. The extreme form would hold to a partial rapture. No, the metaphorical view doesn't hold to that. Neither does Dula. And uh, um, I wrote in here uh, David Benjamin's Pauline dispensationalist, but not a hyper dispensationalist. And then far as inerrancy, David Benjamin's the only extreme one that thinks that James is an errant. Okay. Uh, and then far as about fellowship, can it be lost? You know, some will say, yeah, totally. And then uh, some will say, no, it can't be lost. I think David Benjamin might be there. And so this is what I'm showing you. When you come to a specific doctrine, take the different, take, and you can change it as you go. Deal with each one of these issues and listen to how different free grace people explain things. If you want to use names like Wilkin, Dillo, Bean, or whatever, you can do that. And you can start seeing, based on this, what you're most similar to. And so what you're seeing here is that Duluth, Roxer, my current professor of free grace, the one that wrote that free grace faux pas, is most similar to David Benjamin's view. You see that? Yeah, I do agree with him on, I think chastisement was more like parenting. I do like his view on that. Yeah, well, I, I think that's where I'm at too. Um, but these are some more variables I got to bring through and deal with about this. But I'm just showing you these, make these charts as a tool for you to understand others and for you to understand scripture. Okay? So hopefully that brings some clarification. I know I talked a lot. Uh, Peaceful Banana, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, uh, well, I, I had a question for Brandon. Um, okay, go ahead. So uh, according to Genesis 15.1, do you believe that Christ is our reward? Uh, I got to look into that verse. I don't know what it says. What does it say? Well, I, I do believe Christ, like, well, my point right now, my stance right now would be, there is rewards, but Christ will be our ultimate reward. And we're going to cast our crowns at his feet and stuff like that, yeah. Why do you have to cast the crowns at his feet? Didn't he give you the crowns? Yeah, but I think that's just that he's our everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, but is Christ a gift or is he a reward? He's a gift. So, like, am I guaranteed to get it as a reward? I see what you're saying. I'm at a loss here. What's up? We trying to make point. <laughs> no, I'm just no. It's just um. So he. So he's a you know we receive him as a gift, according to John one twelve. So is so when 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 it says he's a reward, um, like in in what sense is he a reward, right? Rather than just like a guaranteed unconditional gift that you know you get to spend eternity with him and all that stuff is there is, is is there a difference between that you think uh no oh so so it, it's kind of like interchangeable yeah i think like most people for obviously will agree with all of them would say like yeah like he's everything that's like the true reward in a way like we're in heaven with him yeah he like a gift and stuff like that yeah like, i can see how it's caught in cherry and all that yeah yeah like like when parents say like oh my my kid is like my ultimate reward or something like that um you know uh but like on the nature of rewards like uh I, I don't know how often how much you've studied that but like what do you think are the types of rewards you think i think believers get the crowns um yeah, i think we get the, like all the crowns by yeah yeah crown of life and crown of rejoicing which is probably do you, believers do you understand that uh it isn't just about the crowns. Christians are going to rule and reign with Christ. You agree with that? One hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. And do you agree that not everybody's going to have the exact same uh, job position in the kingdom? Like, not everybody's going to have the same rank. Like, the twelve disciples 
are going to reign over, you know, 12 thrones over Israel. David's going to rule over Jerusalem. Our, our Israel, people explain, Christ is going to rule over all of that. Do you, are you aware of some of those distinctions? Yeah, I am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to get, you know, some of your clarification on that. So, um, so even if you throw your crown down, you don't throw your position away in the kingdom. And I'm not when I'm going to say position, I'm not talking about position of salvation. I'm talking about your role in the kingdom as serve as a servant king. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Uh but yeah, the, uh you know, I just wanted some cuz I heard people saying that a lot like Christ is our reward. Um and I'm thinking, well, he's the source of reward, you know, and obviously, like when we get to him, you know, I, I there's like different levels. I will probably say there's different levels of fellowship in like the uh, closest to Jesus, because like he's just one man. You know what I mean? Like you can't like like everyone can't be with him at the same time. Uh, so I, he kind of like has to spread his attention. But yeah, you know, it's it, it's good to know your views on that. Well, he's omnipresent, and so he could probably manifest his glorified body in multiple places. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. But one thing about it, though, is when you're when you talk about the disciples, Jesus Christ had the twelve, but then he had the three. You know, there were some James, James and John. And I can't remember who else. They had the inner circle, and even MacArthur recognizes that and uh then you had the 70 so you had differentiations in his discipleship even while he was on earth in his first coming so why wouldn't you have him in the second coming right well that makes that makes sense i gotta look into it again like yeah. so far i've changed my views on a lot of things during this life well yeah we don't want to overwhelm you but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying the door is open for conversation 100 i want to talk i do want to I guess, like, talk about what I'm hearing, you know, and what I believe, like, all that. But I do want to ask, though, about First John. I know this is very controversial. I know I made a response to your live stream about it. But so here's the issue that I've heard from pastors. I want to say you are free grace that they do make First John 1, 9 legalistic in a way where if you're not, you know, God's mad if you don't confess. Like, would you would you agree with that? I Okay, so, so that, that, that thing, like, God's mad at you, I, I don't know who's saying that. Honestly, like, like maybe some, but I've never said God's mad at you. It's, you know, cause you know, you've had parents, duh. And you didn't always do the things you, they wanted uh, you to do. And so in that sense, they were disappointed in you. Now, uh, honestly, it's actually worse that God's disappointed, you know, with, with you than like angry with you. And like, like when a parent says, I'm not angry with you. I'm disappointed with you. That's honestly worse. But at the same time, you know, you know, when God's disappointed, that means that in some sense he entrusted you with something, right? So if you have a bad ministry, you have a bad stewardship, he entrusted you with that. And he actually like has faith in you to do something with his power, you know? And so in that sense, it's actually like a great privilege, right? Because if he's not disappointed with you, that's actually kind of, you know, sad. You know, it, it's kind of like your relationship is estranged. So, yeah, I don't use that language mad with you. But in terms of confessing sin, I have differing views on that, that I'm kind of fluctuating between. So uh, let me add, let me add this. And when you're talking about uh, God, right, as perfect parent in that language, they mentioned about being disappointed, you know, the. Those are relational terms, but do you believe that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? I do. Ephesians 4, yeah, it says it, yeah. Okay. Do you believe that when you and I have had our doctrinal differences, even though we have no issue with each other as people, but do you agree that this doctrinal issue, this war, if you will, has grieved us, has bothered us, has affected the way we pray, you know? Do you agree I, with that? I would 100% agree, brother, yeah. Okay. So I think that's the purpose of 1 John 1, 9. It's just saying, hey, look, when you're not when you're not in doctrinal fellowship with God, because I think that's the main thrust, but if you want to bring in spiritual fellowship, 
then God is grieved when you're not close to him. Just as a wife is not is grieved when you're not close to them, just when the parent wants to spend time with you, but you're misbehaving, and while you're having that attitude, you they can't bless you uh, to the degree that they want. Let's say you want, they want to take you to Disneyland, right? But you won't, you won't even behave and do and show a little bit of gratitude, you know, during that time. It doesn't mean that you what that you're being obedient to your parents means that you worked for Disneyland. They never said if you be obedient, you'll get to go to Disneyland. But they might test you. They might say, okay, clean up your room, you know, do these type of things to honor your parents because you love God. We're here, put here by you, and therefore you show your love. By being obedient, treat your brothers and sisters right, you know, all of that type of stuff. Well, whenever you do that, whenever you're obedient in those small matters, they're like, okay, he's good in this. So what we're going to do is, hey, we're going to go to out of town for a little bit. We're going to leave you with the house. We're going to trust you with the house. And we don't want you to let anyone else in. We're going to, you know, trust you with this. And then they come home. The house is not messy. You've done well with that. And they're like, wow, our son is really growing up right now. And then they're like, you know, I think that we should plan a summer vacation to go to Disneyland or wherever it is, because uh, not only it, we're not spoiling the kids. I mean, we, we, we've been graceful. We've entrusted them with responsibilities. They've been faithful to that. They've showed their love in this area. And so we want to reward them, you know. See, it's not, it, it's not a working to get something. It's obedience puts you in a position where you can be blessed by God. Does that make sense? That does. I know that's a good way to explain it. I like and, I'm the, and, you know, illustrations are not perfect, but I want you to understand that only people that have problems with this are typically people that are reading their relationship into things. You know, uh, David Benjamin came out of a cult. And so this makes him hypersensitive. And so anything he sees, it, it, it makes him think he's abused. So it's similar to like a spouse or, or, or a person that was in an abusive relationship. Whenever they get out of that abusive relationship and they start a new relationship, they got their wall up and if and if they see any little indication of narcissistic behavior or anything like that they're going to they're going to think that they're with an abuser again you know and there's been people that have been church hurt you know uh, that have been offended and because of this they got their walls up and they're hyper vigilant and as a result they're having a reactionary response to these things and uh that's not spirit led. That's flesh led, actually. It's a defense mechanism. You know, um, I think you've heard me say my undergraduates in psychology and sociology. So there's a lot of things that David Benjamin is doing that is a result of the baggage of him being in a cult. You know, and what he's done, whether he intended to do it or not, is he. You've ever heard about the parent that you think, man, when I grow up, I'm not going to be nothing like that person. Yeah, yeah. My... yeah. And then what happens is they actually become like them, you know, the cats in the cradle song or whatever. So David Benjamin, and I'm talking, this is the serious. I'm not, not denying he's a brother, but he's a problem. And so we're addressing the problem just as Paul in his letters address the problem by name sometimes. So David Benjamin, in a, in, a, in a desire to avoid the cult for himself, to protect his own ego, to protect his own psyche, if you will, has, and his desire to protect others from it, he's end up unintentionally developing his own cult. And now he's too invested. He's got books coming out. He's got whatever the algorithm stuff's coming out. And the chances of him changing his view are very slim. It could happen, but whenever a person has money on the line, you know, uh, and a reputation on the line, the chances of them humbling themselves, it gets very harder, you know. 
Yeah, I, what made me start to question everything though was because with it, I have I have a VR church. I run it. I like soul. Right. I'm a big soul winner. I do that. Right. I love it. And well, what happened was even some. Where did you learn? Where did you learn how to preach? Um, I I actually come from an independent Baptist background. Pastor Stephen Anderson used to be my pastor. Um, I oh. left his church. Um, but yeah. Well, see, do you see the connection? David Benjamin came out of a cult. Stephen Anderson has cult like. Uh, issues. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, Baptists do kind of have that in common. <laughs> yeah. Well, not all. I mean, I'm a, I'm in a Southern Baptist church. I'm not independent, but my point is, is SFT, the guy channels I debate on. He's in in he's in the he's not in the NIFB. He's been in the IFB, you know, and he does evangelism and so winning and and. I don't think that they're legalistic. They can't right. be. I guess what some could do. Is that my own people are saying, oh, that's a demand. Like you can't, the, to, you know, if there was a brothers were fighting in the church, like the staff, it was causing an issue. I said, hey, just forgive, you know, move forward. They said, well, you can't demand him. That's the flesh. I was like, what do you mean? The Bible says, us, you know, fellowship, love one another. And so it started bothering me. It's like, well, you say I can't go soul winning. That's Galatian. I can't do this. We can't forgive one another. And so it started to frustrate me. I was like, I don't know if this is true or not now. Yeah. What well, do you under do you understand that they're telling you uh, how to do sanctification? So what they're doing is saying if anybody else says you're to do this, you're to do that, that's Galatian error. Yet they're telling you to do things. Yeah. But they believe in expert sanctification. They just won't admit it. The yeah. law is that there is no law. Ex yeah, their experiential sanctification is listen to us and we'll tell you how to guide your life. Right, right. And honestly, I, I have been watching your live streams, and I don't see you as like some legalistic guy. You know, I think. You... I mean, we all can be that way, but I'm well, sure. One hundred percent. I try to be gracious. Uh, you know, I mean, everyone's a little bit legalistic, a little bit licentious in some areas. You know. Yeah, I think just, the flesh is legalistic by nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's actually part of the works of the flesh in Galatians five. Most, most of it is religious, really, like jealousy, strives, heresies, uh, and all that stuff. And then it stems into all of those other big bad sins we all talk about, licentiousness, adultery, fornication, um, you know. And and when it comes to your church and like those people saying you were legalistic, well, I, that's the fruit of this kind of teaching because you, you can't accept any sort of mild instruction and if you can't accept any sort of instruction, that's sociopathic behavior. Um, that's not healthy at all. You, you know, like, and, and I'm a stubborn person, and even I need to be corrected on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Brandon, don't you think it, it's really sad that you are willing to formally debate me on this issue? But David Menjum is not, and Greg Jackson is not. They would rather. I do want them, you know, to do this. And when I, when I from this live stream, going over that whole Acts 15, because that was my, like, I guess, like, final, like, see, look, James is in there, right? You know what I mean? Now it's seeing it's like, I'm wrong. And, like, I need to see my whole doctor, make sure I'm actually preaching. Well, I, I don't claim that my view of Acts 15 is perfect, you know, but I'm just showing you using inductive Bible study methods, walking through the text. This is what I was getting right now, you know. Uh, but I, I I'm bet you I'm in the ballpark, you know. And we can go look at commentaries and other things like that at another point. Well, your view on it, I, I it did show me some things that Jane, you know, again, I'm a KJB only guy. I I grew up in the Baptist. I said every word of God is pure without error. For me to even think about James not being error, I felt condemnable. I feel like oh, I shouldn't say that. Like that's God's word, you know, he is, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thankful for that. You know, we want to help you in your journey any way you can. Uh, keep talking to Mark Bailey because Mark is loving. He reaches out to people. He brings people together. Uh, he's helpful. He's available. He can't always sleep at night. So, you know, he's available when I'm not available. Or if I'm at work or something like that, there's other people. Uh, Peaceful Banana, I think, is in the Discord and stuff. And if you want to eventually come into... Well, I do want to rejoin, you know, um, I think, that Discord server I was in before, Amazing Grace. I need an invite to that. I don't yeah. Know. Okay. Yeah, I'll take care of that. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link, right? 
now. But just keep in mind, they're not aware of uh, our discussion right now. They're sleeping. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I'm late too. <laughs> so just, you got to be patient with people, you know, uh, because you you are a soldier, you know. You uh, um, you you preach and you get out there and you're willing to take a stand for everything. And so, you know, I, I'm not I'm not I'm not rejoicing too early. I guess is what I'm saying. Is um, let me see. I gotta find them. The, what yeah. I mean is that it's really hard for me too because mostly all my staff people they listen to David Benjamin. Most all the people come to my church are those people. I got to do some cleaning house if I am going to make a decision. And no, no, and yeah, and I'm not rushing you into that. You know, I think that uh, I tell people. I even told Praise I am before he was ever free grace, but he was considering it, trying to evaluate it. I said, look, man, don't focus on putting a label on yourself. Don't try to rush into a doctrinal position. Just study things out, pray, you know, uh, and then, you know, go from there. All right. So I'm putting it in in the chat, the private chat. You see it? Yep. Hey, NIP, thank you. Uh, I got 5,000 subscribers already. Uh, will Greg right? debate me? I don't think Greg would debate me. Do I have 5,000? I guess I do. Yeah, I didn't even know. Wow. Wait, so Great, now uh, Charlie Michaels will debate you? Well, well, he'll have to now because he said he would. But he made a video earlier that, about that, and he's trying to weed out of it, weasel out of it. But, um, no, Greg Greg never said he would debate me if I reached 5,000. I was making, I was saying, look, just like Charlie Michaels put a number on it, tell Greg to put a number on it. If he wants to wait until my channel catches up to his until he debates me, then fine, do that. But he needs to debate. I think Greg is a nice guy. I think that David Benjamin has been a bad influence on him. I would like to see uh, Greg Jackson, you know, uh, come further away from David Benjamin's view. He may not land where I'm at or maybe where Brandon's at or or others, but still, I I think that he could be helpful. Now, let me tell you something that worries me, Brandon. Yeah. I've seen Greg. I've seen Greg Jackson make statements like this. If you think that he turned, you know, he basically maybe I should just go to his channel and look at his thing so you see an example because I don't want to misquote him. Just here, let me tell you this. Be careful when someone says, if you if you believe this, then you're not saved, okay? Because free grace believes you can fall into false teaching. I you know agree with that. Uh, King Solomon apostated, yeah. Yeah, so be very careful. When you see somebody say, if you do this, or if you believe this, then you were never saved in the first place, or you're not saved. Watch out for that because what we found out is some people in hyper grace, and we don't have a better term yet for it, okay? So I'm just using that. Some people in hyper grace have actually turned out to be lordship because they're using the same arguments that lordship people do. If, you're, if you do this or if you believe this right now, you're not saved. If you don't love the brethren, you're not saved. Yeah, that was the. I'm still looking to that one. That one because like I, in the past, I told you before. I think is that I had in that way deny a brother's testimony in the. I would say in the flesh. You know, I got angry at him, but you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but that's not my current view. And thanks, Doki. Uh, I blinked and you were up another two thousand. Wow. Yeah. With, well, blink again. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, this is good. You know, I, I didn't even plan this stream. I was like, I was working on my paper and I was like, you know, I need to do something different. And I wanted to just think about how Wilkin responded to uh, Zane Hodges and compare it to how Zane Hodges respond to MacArthur. You know, I mean, the, I'm sorry, Wilkin responded to MacArthur and compare the difference to kind of get it in my head about like when I'm writing what Zane Hodges did and what Wilkin did so I can say, okay, you could have, 
he could have done better in this area or could, and so it was edifying for me and then we got into some of the stuff about romans and we got some galatian stuff and you know we saw the opening of my debate with sean griffin who's going to be debating wilkin so you know there's uh um some good things going on you know so i'm thankful for tonight and then Brandon blesses us, you know, with this. I mean, you just and, popped up on my recommended page. I was like, I'll stop by. <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right, some theology. You ready to deal with this reprobation stuff? Oh, okay. Please, well, please deal do you with mind it. if I talk to you uh, off stream for a little? Who, me? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't have to be right now, just whenever. Okay, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, I will say this. If Zane Hodges' view of Romans 1 is correct, it can't be talking about reprobation to well, hell. Yeah, I just feel like you know, maybe maybe it was just in the moment, but they were like yelling at me and laughing at me just because I was pointing out that, you know, it's the same Greek word, uh, a dokimos or whatever, in First Corinthians. Yeah, nice you're absolutely 20. right. And, and, and Paul was saying, I fear that I might be a reprobate. And they were saying, no, that's about his ministry. And I'm like, well, it doesn't seem to be about his ministry. When no, says, it is about his ministry. Well, it is a saying, I, I might be a reprobate. Like, no, 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 yeah. no. Let me clarify that I myself be might be disqualified for ministry. That's what that means. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and people will people make a distinction in, between Romans 1 reprobate and the in the first Corinthians 9 reprobate and also second Corinthians 13 5 reprobate uh which is actually very interesting there's different views on that yeah but the the thing is and this is what I don't like about the reprobate doctrine is that basically they'll say if you are in this sort of really really bad sinful state yeah if you are just like super you're homosexual you yeah. are watching this you're hurting people you're not safe well free grace doesn't do that we don't determine someone's salvation based on their present behavior uh, yeah. or their continual behavior or anything like that. It just means disapproved. Now, disapproved from what? Yeah. It, I mean, it depends on the context. If if uh, if Hodges' view on Romans is correct, which I'm still debating that, yeah. then that's not talking about salvation. That's talking about temporal wrath, right, yeah. for unbelief. Well, for unbelievers, but it could have an effect on believers. And I was like... Literally. That remind me. I wrote a paper on that. I'll show. I'll show you a portion of it real quick. Yeah, and I was like literally screaming that reprobate means like unapproved. Uh, but yeah. they just won't listen. Well, I, I mean, well, in your view, it doesn't. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or an unbeliever. You're gonna go to heaven. Well, eventually. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about it, I could. Give well, I, well, we don't want to. We don't want to talk about universalism. Right? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I okay. just brought it up. One day I'll deal with it, but All right. anyway, this this is one of my papers I wrote uh, in my first semester at Schaefer. I was already at uh, Southwestern before that, but um, let's see, where is that? It's called because I was dealing with the that issue. I don't want that. So I called my paper Free Grace Biblical Theological Sociological Approach to Minister to People Living in Sinful Lifestyles. Okay. I need to know this one. So look at the, I'll give you the structure. So it's abbreviated Free Grace Biblical Theological Sociological, yeah, right, versus the cosmos and amoeba. In other words, the world wants to swallow everything that we share out there like an amoeba. Perception of reality, which is a saying in sociology that even if something, if we're, if it isn't real, but we perceive it as real, it has the same effect. And so I'm talking about how to use that as a Trojan horse for Christian discussion. And I talked about experiencing the sovereignty of God over how God is sovereign over sociology. And then I talk about the approach and structure of the paper. And then I talk about the problem illustrated. I give a worst case scenario of wrongly using Romans 1. I get, these are two case studies, two Christian bisexual women and the two main issues that arise. One Christian transgendered man. Okay. So then I do two Christian bisexual women and sociological functions of the family. So what I did here was I reworked something that I did in my undergraduate uh, for marriage and family class I took. 
And so I, I brought, I had wrote discussions, but of course it was rejected because it, I needed to make something more uh, secular. So once I started seminary, I'm like, okay, let me rework this. And so you have the different functions and all of this. Uh, progressive revelation before the book of Romans in the book of James. See, I've been working on the James stuff for a while. And I actually teach people that you should start when you teach inductive Bible study and teach Christians, you should start with James because it was the first New Testament book written. But uh, um, so then it goes into the book of Romans. It goes into ministry to Christian bisexual women and transgender men. The similarities in ministry to both cases, the differences, the role of sociology and the role of free grace, biblical theology in both cases and the conclusion. So as Christianity encounters people in sinful lifestyles, which is SLS, Christians often misuse passages addressed in sinful lifestyles to evangelize, communicate an abusive false gospel. The free grace, biblical, theological, sociological approach, uh, which I'll just say our approach from now on, uses current sociological language for evangelizing and discipling those in sinful life stories as sinful lifestyles. Sociology is a metaphorical mitochondria inside the cosmos amoeba that seeks to consume Christianity in its meta narrative. So all of this about I identify as this, I identify as that. That's all coming from sociology, which is taught in the colleges. Okay, therefore, the inculcation of our approach is the inoculation against such a system. Our approach addresses four dimensions of discourse: the metaphysical, epistemological, ethical, and social political. While the metaphysical defines reality, the epistemological discusses how one knows the truth. The ethical relates to how one should behave. The social political level refers to how one interacts with the world. Our approach attempts to harmonize biblical theology and sociology. Sociology is compatible with biblical theology when one excludes social constructionism because it is self refuting. If everything is a construct with no inherent meaning, sociologists are making up meaning and sociology does not matter. In one aspect, sociology matters according to W.I. Thomas. Because perception is reality in the sense of consequences. The sociological concept should grant a hearing for the Christian sociologists adopting our approach because if all perceptions matter, so does the Christian perception of inspired revelation. A person's perceptions of the Bible influence how he thinks and acts. The, this author perceives Christianity as true and hopes to arrive at an approach to sociology that supports the truth and avoids sinful abuses. God is sovereign over sociology. This student experienced that truth when his secular sociology professors advised him to take classes useful for ministry. While finishing his undergraduate degree, he took marriage and family class, followed by gender and lastly, deviant behavior. When same-sex marriage was nationally legalized, he was learning it in marriage and family class. He wanted to understand the issue better, so he took gender sociology. His final class was deviant behavior, and he heard speakers from various sinful lifestyles. While in this class, a church friend asked him to contact a Christian friend in the beginning stages of transgenderism. A few days later, this author was asked to write a chapter on homosexuality in a Christian book. He said an undergraduate degree in sociology was sufficient, though this student does not claim sociological specialization. He declined for lack of experience in writing. Years later, after and I did write the blurb for the book, but I didn't write the chapter. Years later, after having taken both Christian framework classes, he returns to the issue. Besides his ministry experience with the Christian transgender men, which is CTM, recently he has encountered two Christian bisexual women who are co-parenting a son while they seek God and heterosexual husbands in a local church. Yeah, this is what shocked me. I encountered two bisexual women that believed that it was sin. They were not participating in the sin, okay? And they were going to a church to uh, help the church, but they were co-parenting. In other words, they were both taking care of one of, the, one of the woman's children. The church's response to that was they treated them like a same-sex couple living in sin, okay? And so that made me examine this. Right. This was not my church. But anyway, this paper addresses these two real life scenarios. 
Our approach involves associating the portrayal of events discovered within the Bible with doctrines as God progressively reveals in Scripture. Our approach appears first to show how this approach engages culture. The biblical theological part selectively traces progressive revelation in James and Galatians that informs our understanding of Romans. I've also written papers on, on uh, Galatians. It will hopefully, uh, uh, or paper, it will hopefully avoid the abuses in evangelism and discipleship that happen when Christians do not interpret and apply Romans 1 uh, properly. Romans 1 describes the perversion of society since the fall of humanity. Family is the basis for society. If the definition of family is incorrect, this will alter the perception of perversions in society. To highlight how perceptions are part of the one's pre-understanding brought to the text of discussion, a Christian sociological defense for the biblical description of the family will precede the discussion of the perversion of transgenderism. Th this approach will lastly show a free grace application for ministry to these two scenarios of how sinful lifestyles affect them. Okay, so here's the problem. This is what I want you to focus on. Trust me, I'm not going to read all this, but listen to this part. The following illustration is a worst case scenario, but it is becoming common. A Christian reads Romans 1, 16, 17, and this passage motivates him not to have shame in believing and sharing the gospel. He sees the gospel as revealing the righteousness of God and the wrath of God. So he includes God's wrath against unrighteousness in his evangelism. He reads in 1, 18-32, eight, the existence of sinful lifestyles results from God giving people over in judgment to those in sinful lifestyles because they reject God. So when he notices someone in a sinful lifestyle, he assumes this one rejects God and that God condemns them unless they repent. He takes passages such as 1 Corinthians 6, besides Romans 1, and interprets that the uh, homosexual must convert to a heterosexual relation for God to save them from his wrath. When this Christian evangelizes, his belief that God has condemned the person in front of him turns into an attempt to vindicate God as righteous by making salvation impossible for them. He may move to the extreme that Christians should not pray for the salvation of those whom God has given over to the condemnation described in Romans 1. When the evangelizer makes the gospel about behavior, rather than belief in Christ as the right object of salvation, it follows God cannot save those he condemns for doing certain behaviors. Thankfully, these evangelists are inconsistent and say salvation is possible when a person repents of the behavior as a condition for salvation. And then I got the statement down there about repentant, a disclaimer on that about salvation in the footnote. But anyway, such a claim is wrong and incongruent with the rest of the teachings of Christianity. In the same book, Paul states that natural man cannot be subject to the law of God. The unbeliever cannot spiritually repent as a, and I wouldn't even argue this way now, but anyway, here it is. The unbeliever cannot spiritually repent as a condition for salvation because he does not have the Holy Spirit. If the unbeliever could clean himself up spiritually, he would not need salvation. The unintended result is this abusive form of evangelism causes the gays to rebel and feel it justifies their revolt against Christianity. In other words, Christian legalism has basically caused everything that we're experiencing right now. Okay? And there's even examples in church history where Christians drew a line in certain areas and because of that it brought persecution on them. And, and I think that's what's happened here is that legalism has caused Christians uh, to uh, draw certain lines, and this has caused the, the the inflamed ones to become inflamed even more. Anyway, assumptions lay behind this behavior-focused evangelism that, if studied contextually, expose it as a false gospel. Therefore, it's necessary to apply this approach to Romans 1, and it's used in evangelism and discipleship. Since God is the God of grace, Christians should graciously apply theology and ministry. Here are two examples that require grace and truth to discern. Two, this is the uh, uh, Christian by women walk into a church and explain they are two best friends, co-parenting a child, but people assume a sexual relationship. Both Christian bisexual women tell the church they recognize God's will for them to have their husbands and for raising the child in the Christian home. 
These two Christian bisexual women apply the African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. And these women are not sinning sexually. Yet these Christians would not call this a family. These two Christian bisexual women are seeking restoration in a fallen world. And the danger is that they may find the LGBTQ community may accept their family. They are not sinning sexually and they're trying to raise this child biblically by denying their sinful desires. And both women are seeking heterosexual men to become their husbands. The problem is that many Christians assume a definition for family that says more about the culture than it does about the biblical description of family. This author claims that sociologically and biblically they are family. This family has experienced judgment by some Christians because they assume they are engaged in sinful lifestyles. The irony is the Christian making such accusations on non-biblical grounds is the one engaged in a sinful lifestyle. The same chapter that mentions homosexuality mentions attitude, sins, and sins of the tongue. While these two do not believe God wants them in a relationship, will they embrace the LGBTQ rhetoric? Two, what if the church disciples these Christian bisexual women may determine whether they become an opponent or proponent of the LGBTQ philosophy and movement? The treatment of this situation will affect the child. Improper reading of Romans 1 could lead well-meaning Christians to reject these people. Therefore, it's vital to understand what the biblical description of the family is. Hopefully, it can give the biblical and sociological basis for evaluating whether this is a family or a perversion. Another example is a transgender Christian man desires to know what scripture says about transgenderism. A Christian reading Romans 1 wrongly would assume this person lacks salvation or they have lost their salvation because they're objects of God's wrath for their abomination. The two women were not guilty of sin, though the church perceives them as such. In this example, however, the person wants to know whether he has sinned. A Christian should not minister to a person who names Christ and recognizes sin exists as if he's a non-Christian who denies sin. The free grace in, the, in this approach can best counsel this person over against the Lordship Salvation approach. Two bisexual women in the sociological functions of family. Are y'all still interested? Y'all want me to continue reading? Yeah, it's it's actually right. very good. Well, for me personally, because like, okay. um, you know, because I... I um, I speak to some people online that mm -hmm. are, you know, they're they're engaged in some like sinful lifestyles, and actually mm -hmm. some of them are homosexual. They're in the LGBTQ, you know. Okay. And, and I tell them like, um, well, you know, to be saved, you know, God is not holding your trespasses against you, right? You know, because he, mm -hmm. he he died for all of that sin, and you know that to receive eternal life, you just have to believe, but after you believe you you definitely should work with god you know and try to find a more profitable lifestyle you know right and right. you know god wants to discipline you he's your you know newborn child and mm -hmm. you know i tell them all that stuff and um i i guess sometimes it goes over their head because i also want to disciple them as well and teach right. them like that stuff and i think the like the lordship salvation approach is easy Cause you just tell them, oh, you just got to repent of all of it, and then you become a Christian, and then yeah, and, just eat, and then you scare them into it. You identify the behavior, therefore they're the elect or not, because if they're not has shown fruit, they're not saved. That's their approach. Yeah. Well, guess what? That's what the reprobate doctrine, in most cases, does. You're doing this behavior, therefore you're you're probably reprobate. You know. Yeah, exactly. And there's variations of it, but. Okay, I'll continue then. Two bisexual women and the sociological functions of family. To highlight how perceptions are part of one's pre-understanding brought to the text of discussion, a Christian sociological defense for family will precede a discussion of the perversions of transgenderism. This portion of this paper seeks to think theologically about the sociological destruction of the functions of family. Secular sociologists study families throughout time and claim their descriptive definition of family is prescriptive. Our approach will arrive at a biblical description of family through tracing progressive revelation. Family has varied compositions throughout time. The family has a specific origin, but diversity is within its structure. 
God determines the family structure and all other patterns are perversions. This author considers this perversion when defining marriage and family. The nuclear model of the human family, original nuclear model, is a traditional model if by tradition one means it is before all the forms, and like in Genesis 127. Non-sexual relationships existed before sexual ones since the Trinity and the angelic realm are examples of non-sexual relationships existing before humans. You get that? Do you hear that, Banana? Yeah. So the point of this is you can't say that someone that's asexual or two people living together that, that aren't practicing sexual sin are not a family off that jump. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now watch this. Thus, the ability to reproduce is not what defines a proper relationship. The spiritual family that all Christians are a part of will outlast the physical family. Marriage is a binding agreement for earth dwellers. Some scholars believe that decline in marriage and family results from the decline in scripture as inspired and authoritative. They point to a paradigm shift change in underlying assumptions from absolute truth to postmodern preference to explain this decline. A vacuum has left people searching for a basis to define marriage and family. This foundation of, of functions of family include regulation of sexual behavior reproduction, social placement, socialization, economic cooperation, care, protection, and intimacy. Regulation of sexual behavior. And I still got this book on my shelf, the secular book, and this is how it evaluated everything. I just took it from, I ran it through the Bible. Christians are part of the family of God in the adopted sense. Certain people within the family regulate social functions of fellowship. At one level, God is the ultimate regulator that uses scripture and delegation of gifted men. God delegates authority to the human government to regulate. Therefore, God is sovereign over those he delegates. And this delegation extends to and over unbelievers. The church does not function like a theocracy. This responsibility to represent God as a delegate differs from Israel. Therefore, Christians should not place unbelievers underneath obligations that Christians can spiritually fulfill. So he should be ever mindful to not impose the spiritual life upon rebellion, non-spiritual people. Attempts to create a Christian theocracy in America cause backlashes still reverberating today. For regular sexual behavior, for regulating sexual behavior, if Christians would say that biblically based scripture for marriage and family as true, but not binding on non-Christians, things would not escalate this much. The biblical description binds non-Christians as the law of gravity binds all the earth. Not believing in gravity does not cause it not to exist. In the same way, not believing in inspiration of scripture does not make it so. While a Christian recognizes God holds all humans to the standard he sets, the Christian cannot enforce that standard on those who deny and or reject it. Therefore, the Bible is the biblical basis for regulating sexual behavior since it is God's so special revelation to humanity. Following me so far? Yeah, I got it. Although, like, like, uh, what's the basic synopsis of that previous part, you know? Well, the, the functions of family that we're looking at, what family does, is regulation of sexual behavior. Yeah. In other words, who has the authority to say how sexual behavior should be? Whenever you try to impose the Christian standard on unbelievers, you, got, you, you went wrong. Because exactly. the Bible's for believers. Re reproduction. Reproduction need not be part of the biblical definition of marriage and family. Productivity occurs in other ways besides having children. Erickson's generativity versus stagnation stage reflects when couples raise their children, they may reach the community and be influential in others' lives. A single person can be productive, and a disciple reproduces disciples. Not all married couples physically reproduce. Christians view reproduction as an essential social function of families, but not always the case. Some people are sterile because they were born into a fallen world. There, the ultimate reason couples cannot have children results from the fall. Sometimes it results from the choices, such as when they take drugs, have a dangerous operation, or prefer an unhealthy diet. These choices may be out of ignorance, not knowing the substance or procedure is dangerous and an event is unexpected or unpredictable. One should not generalize all situations. So arguments against same-sex relationships that say it is against nature, do not reflect that fallen nature includes the sterile. You understand that argument? 
Because yeah, because because people kind of define relationships as like, can you have children or not? Right. Yeah. K. K. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yes. Good. I don't even have to elaborate. Good. Yeah. So, social placement. About the social function of social placement, since predestination is true, ultimately God has decided placement. Yet if this placement is has improved, God has predestined that. While predestination does not mean one should not act, those actions God has predetermined. A non-libertarian free will does not violate or contradict predestination. One may be one may do according to nature. God may act in harmony with his nature of holiness, but he is not free to sin. A view that holds both predestination and free will label compatibilism, it does not violate the law of non contradiction. That's how I was writing at that time, okay, guys? So be gentle with me. You were a compatibilist? God, no, but I didn't. Well, it depends. It depends. If you're saying is predestination and free will both true, yes. But that's not really what they mean. Uh, right. So I still need to develop my rebuttal to their compatibilism but regardless god predestined the beginning birthplace who our parents are in the end our social status but the journey between is that they may seek each other and all that language right and being predestined to glorify it and all that social placement can occur by the family marriage or sexual act social placement begins with birth or adoption because god places the new life in the world the concept of adoption is inherent within the biblical definition of family. God is the father of all creation in the sense of source, and he's the mother of all creation in the sense of nurturing and sustaining all creation. The text uses masculine pronouns for God and never calls God a woman. God acts in expressive rather than only instrumental ways. That's the better term than masculine and feminine. Because all humans are in the image of God, the instrumental tendency associated with males and the expressive procliv proclivity of females comes from the perfect God. Therefore, he is the perfect balance of instrumental and expressive. Scripture contextualized when God enters a covenant or a sacred relationship with a part of a creation as an adoption. God, an entire nation, adopts a king and individuals. Thus, the concept of the family begins on a spiritual dimension. Heterosexual marriage gives sex as the added responsibility to procreate, either physically or metaphorically. So you get that one? How yeah. do you get how do you get placed in this world? Well, God places you here. Well, how does that occur? Depends. It could be through adoption, it could be, you know. Yeah. The last one it gives sex is the added responsibility to procreate. So like God, he determined that you would be here, but the means were through like these specific acts and your parents meeting and all that stuff. Yeah, so the point is is that the family is primarily spiritual. Yeah. The fact that you are also have physical bodies is an added, added responsibility to pro procreate. He told them after he created them, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. But remember, as we saw earlier, if you don't procreate, it doesn't mean you're not a, a real re marriage. You're not a real relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Socialization. The social function of socialization occurs when all forms of social relationships, because humans are interacting with what comes from various ages of socialization. Since the family is one agent of socialization, the ability to associate, socialize with others does not make a sine qua non for marriage or family. God expects parents and the nation to teach their children what he revealed in his word. Since God has preserved his revelation, effective socialization conforms to the principles and practices found with this scripture. So you, if, uh, family involves socialization, but it's not the only agent of socialization, what I'm saying. Economic cooperation. Economic cooperation occurs among groups, including various forms of marriages and families. Since revelation is true, this economic cooperation basis is a concept that both male and female are in the image of God, and he tells both to take care of the earth. Economic cooperation does not do away with the chain of command because the Trinity is an economy of persons, yet the Father is the head. Therefore, it's possible to be equal yet subordinate a role. How each marriage or family works out this depends on the people's strength and weaknesses, talents, and gifts. Man must not always be financially in charge, though he is the spiritual head of the marriage and home. The voluntary submission of women to husbands and in church settings does not imply women should not be in authority anywhere in society. 
flexibility is within the realm of corporation. Care, so that's basically saying, look, just because you have certain uh, Bible teachings about women should not be pastors or things like that, doesn't mean that a woman can't have a job, you know, okay. either secular or maybe even in a seminary or a college. So, so do you think that uh, when it comes to the man being the main financial provider, do you think it's possible that a woman, that he can be the lesser financial provider, but also like have a dominant spiritual role, you know? There? Yeah. Or, or is well, it like diminished in a way? Well, it all depends on the maturity of the woman. Yeah. And what I mean by that, and, and then again, you got to remember that a woman, a, a, a woman, this is just general principles, but deep down a woman wants a man to lead. Okay. Yeah. So if the man is mature and he's leading biblically, there's a greater tendency. If she's wanting to please God, you know, the triangle where you're both down here at the bottom and then the closer you get to each other, the closer you get to God. Yeah. But if one of you's grown and the other one's not, the distance increases. So the point is, is that you're you're mature enough, you don't make as much money, but because you're spiritually mature, she respects you. Because in all relationships, there's a trade-off, okay? Yeah, he don't look that well, but he's loving, he's caring, you know, <laughs> and, and all that stuff. You know, there's, um, you know, if it wasn't for my biblical knowledge, my wife probably would have never married me. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that's the reality, and that's probably what she would tell you. But regardless of that, my point is is that it depends on the maturity of the woman. If the woman's I use God and is renewing her mind and she's been discipled and she understands spiritual leadership does not necessarily equate to you make it more financial because men have different skills. That particular man may have a different experience, you know. Or, or baggage, you never know. You know, there's different things like that. Yeah. And so, um, no, those are good questions. So now we're into care, protection, and intimacy. Care, protection, and intimacy are an essential function because various forms of family and marriage structures supply these needs. Those that lack the biblical foundation would not meet their God-given full potential, though non-Christian relationship structures may make, may make people perceive no lack. Satan's primary goal is to be like God by creating a functional, moral society outside of the will of God. Uh, any dysfunction in society results from Satan's finitude and failure to perfectly rule the world. God has delegated power to Satan, but everyone would describe their stewardship. So that goes back to that whole idea that uh, oh, that's everyone that probably accountable stewardship. That goes back to that idea that People think, oh, a Satanist is so bad, or this is so bad. No, Satan is trying to be like God. The only reason Satanism exists is because uh, he knows that in our rebellion, only few of us are actually going to worship Satan directly in a, in a weird, weird, weird way. Everybody else is going to worship Satan in other forms, you know, because it's going to manifest in different ways. But anyway, yeah. that's bad apostasy. I, I, well, you know, when people say you can't work, become a Satanist, technically, if you're engaging in worldly activities, you're engaging in what the God of this world has created. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Human existence begins with one named Adam. But human society began when Adam met Eve and formed the first dyad. Therefore, the nuclear family first existed in the garden with the first man and first woman. Polygamy occurs for the first time when Lamech boasts to his wives. Polygamy occurs among the patriarchs and kings. Rather than being prescriptive, those passages are not teaching uh, those passages not teaching that monogamy are descriptive. Okay. Not teaching monogamy are descriptive. That's how I was supposed to read. The universal nuclear family is a myth. This is what the book said, so I'm flipping it on them. The universal nuclear family is a myth because history does not reveal this form of the family as universally accepted or manifested. Television shows like The Waltons and Little House on the Prairie hint to other forms of family that debunk other myths such as the self-reliant traditional family. The church and the community help all the families in their towns if the family members are diligent workers. As for the natural separation of spirits for wives and husbands, 
One would expect such Christian-oriented shows to qualify their depictions because the spirits from the from that perspective are not natural. They are supernatural since God determined them. Going back to Eden, both Adam and Eve were to rule as king and queen in the image of God. The word Azer, helper, reflects subordinate in a row as it reflects subordination with the Trinity. Scri scripture calls Jesus and the Holy Spirit parakletos, one called alongside to help. If role subordination, role within the Trinity, does not minish the essence of the Trinity, it does not minish the relationship within the marriage. This is a fallen world where God has decreed that there would be a conflict of the sexes as a reminder of what humanity lost in the fall. Arduous work was not a reality until God exiled the first man and woman from the garden. The first professions mentioned in the text after the fall are shepherding and farming. When so few people on the earth, at least at first men and women, did the same work. As populations increased, society became differentiated and complex, allowing for the accumulation of surplus trade and specialization. During these times, variations on the extended nuclear family were because the lifespan was longer, so several generations would live in the same household or nearby. So families of procreation are usually families of orientation. The makeup of these family trends was from nuclear to extended to multi-generational or to the modified extended family. Colonial family living formed groups and households that included servants and slaves. Abraham purposed to let his servant Eleazar inherit his property if he had no son. Later, Egyptian royalty adopted Moses. These variations of the family found in the first pages of the Bible call for flexibility in the definition for family. The restrictions for the prescription of the biblical family appear in Leviticus 18. That's about the incest and stuff. The restrictions for the prescription of the biblical family. Right, sorry. Sociology often assumes utility is true. If the right thing is determined by if something is beneficial, useful, or functional, it leaves morality based on norms instead. Thankfully, God is absolutely and perfectly objective revelator and ruler. Since natural law is general revelation, unbelievers are necessarily under it. They know God is because the world exists and because humans exist. Humans find evidence for God in their human nature. Since humans are intelligent creations, there must be an intelligent creator. Human nature has changed since the fall of humanity, and this knowledge is through special revelation. God made humans in his image, but God did not activate their conscience yet. As the smoke detector does not activate until it detects smoke, the conscience was not until it detected the change in the relationship between God and man. When God imputes sin to human nature, a change of relations occurred. Conscience was the rule of life for the Adamic covenant until human government by the Noahic covenant. These two covenants tell all humans the concept of right and wrong and how they need a government. The Abrahamic covenant is the basis for how believers in the world should represent in the world where the majority are unbelievers. The Mosaic covenant shown how to conduct a theocratic government delegated through sinful humans helped by the Holy Spirit and special revelation. The church exists during the time of the Gentiles. This period began with the Babylonian captivity and will exist until the return of Christ. Meanwhile, by analogy, the church should function as Paul did. He was a citizen of Rome, a Gentile unbeliever, Jewish, uh, the former theocratic administrators. And while he exercised his rights as a Roman and as a Jew, he was a prisoner physically in ca captivity. The church is serving a prison sentence as pilgrims, yet glorifies and serves God like Joseph, Daniel, Paul, and Peter did. The church operated but did not interfere with the Roman and Jewish government as a group. Individuals have a godly influence on leaders. The church was the cons consultant to the world. It was not the government of the world, like the, uh, like Jiminy Cricket. Like the role of the prophet giving godly counsel to the king is the church's role to government. Prophecy is not occurring, so the church offer illumination, not inspiration. The leadership is not part of a theocracy, but rules based on God setting up human government as an institution. Therefore, the church is not over the government. So natural law, general revelation, the Adamic and human government give unbelievers the right to rule. It does not mean every person living in a sinful lifestyle has rejected natural revelation or natural law, making salvation impossible. Natural law reminds the Christian he should recognize the unbeliever and their former government, but it degenerates. Natural law opens a dialogue about the proper role of the church, and most important, it allows time to clarify the gospel. Humanity does not enforce natural law, yet they recognize it like gravity. Okay? Now, this is where we're getting more biblical in New Testament. You still with me? Yeah, I'm still with it. Uh, although, 
uh, I would have to ask. This is a a side thing in it, but when God was uh, talking about those uh, pay those like polygamous relationships, mm-hmm. like if if the biblical model is typically like one man one woman, did he just kind of like allow that? And he was like fine with that because like it allowed for more people to populate the earth, or was it for kings and stuff? Well, mm-hmm. it, it's de- it's debated. Okay. The reason being is because there's a passage where Moses Moses takes a wife and it got, God actually tells Moses to take a second wife. Yeah. It isn't it isn't like he says, "Hey, uh it isn't oh uh, well, okay Moses, you took a second wife." No, he tells him take another wife. Yeah, that cuz cuz God would never encourage sin, but the thing is is the biblical model for marriage is that well, like is there if is any deviation from that necessarily sin well uh dr sherlin arnold fruit and bomb a couple others were writing a book i don't know if it ever came out where they were uh, several different writers were writing on the issue of polygamy i've had discussions with them about it you know and um I, let me put it this way i don't i don't think you should risk it you understand? Yeah. It, it, one reason is one of the wives may kill you out of jealousy. But <laughs> I'm just saying. Anyway, <laughs> let's move forward. Progressive anyway, revelation. Oh wait, Brandon, you're still here? Brandon, this is good you're here because this is the part I want you to really listen to. Yeah. Okay? Right, I'm still here, man. Yeah. About uh, James. All right, man. good. This deals with James and Galatians. Okay. Progressive revelation before the book of Romans. In progressive revelation, the first book of the New Testament is the book of James. Many Christians allow a particular reading of the book of James to color their interpretation of the rest of the New Testament. They quote, faith without works is dead, and assume that means if a person has not shown the works of repentance after they have positional salvation, they lack salvation. They often use Romans 1 combined with the book of James to teach people that live in a sinful lifestyle lack salvation. Therefore, a misinterpretation of James will inevitably lead to a misinterpretation and application of the book of Romans. All right. James wrote to Jewish Christians in the pre canon church age, and he presents Israel as the scattered servant of God. James is calling his audience to have the blessed characteristics of an eternal perspective, wisdom, joy, and humility, and perseverance because of the recognition that temporal trials are for the glory of God and spiritual growth. They should not blame God for their sin because because they are self-deceived. They do not support those in need during such trying times and not walking in sanctification. Therefore, true religion to James refers to applying Christianity for support of widows and orphans. He teaches the uselessness of believing the right thing, if not correctly applied, should apply to the people. James does not teach how to prove positional salvation, but how useful their safe status should be in ministry. Therefore, the Reformation took these verses out of context. After James authored his book, Paul's book to the Galatians appeared, appeared shortly after. Galatian is written primarily Gentile Christians that false teachers bewitched them in believing the law saves or sanctifies. See, I even had it back then. This is 2019. Paul's arguments relate to the Abrahamic covenant. In the book of Galatians, a false gospel influenced Christians. This false gospel is false news that experiential sanctification occurs through the Mosaic Law. Therefore, one must grasp the relation of the Abrahamic Covenant to the Mosaic Covenant to understand the Christian walk of sanctification. See, walk of sanctification. So the Christian does not lose his inheritance. This audience is in danger of that if they come under the curse sharing and living by false gospel. This curse is divine discipline. Paul expounds in Romans on the argument he made first in Galatians albeit adapted to the situation and audience. The revealing of righteousness and wrath does not necessarily tie to the gospel of how God saves from the penalty of sin. The gospel is broader than individual salvation and includes the second Adam. Its statements about justification refer to the walk and the revelation of God's temporal wrath and righteousness covers general trends. He wrongly uses these passages in evangelism and sinful lifestyles such as homosexuality. If evangelists use scripture not intended for evangelism, they can be guilty of changing the message, laying the wrong emphasis on the message, 
or having the wrong attitude while sharing the gospel. The book of Romans, Paul's audience and argument. Paul writes Romans to Jewish and Gentile Christians for promoting practical reconciliation because Jewish Christians are returning from the expulsion under Claudius. Gentile Christians do not want to welcome back Jewish Christians are in pride of replacement theology or supersessionism or fulfillment theology, whatever term you want to use. This practical reconciliation is akin to Ephesians 2. Instead of the relation of one new man imagery of God's covenant program to experiential sanctification to promote service to the glory of God, he addresses the historical situation by progressive revelation of God's covenant program for nations and individuals in service. He functions as a minister of reconciliation, described in 2 Corinthians 5, and relates God's covenant program to its implications for experiential sanctification that builds on the message of the Galatians. Romans 1 through 3 explain how the covenants are key to understand how the Roman Christians are not more spiritual than the Old Testament saints, nor are superior because they're ethnically different. Paul, a Jewish Christian, calls himself a servant, describes Christ as connected to the Davidic covenant, and alludes to the Abrahamic covenant with the inclusio. He implicitly sets himself an example for the Christian so they will avoid the behavior of those mentioned in Romans 1 and 2. And so a lot of this is similar to what I was reading earlier in the stream. So I'll skip that part. Uh, but I was working on all of that too. Okay, this is the Romans 8 stuff. In Romans 1, 18 to 32, Paul convicts his Christian audience of sin. The topic is experiential sanctification with the Abrahamic covenant. The scripture testifies to the faithfulness of God and the unfaithfulness of man. So it, it describes God's judicial decision to give them over to trends true of Gentile history and Israelite history. Commentators assume the wrath of God is an attribute, but its anthropomorphic nature describes temporal wrath rather than eternal wrath. The focus is on wrath on groups, not primarily individuals. Again, some of this stuff is similar to what mentioned here. Uh, let's see here. I did the whole overview of the whole book. Uh, it's there. All right, so here's the application. Ministry to the Christian bisexual woman and the Christian transgender man. The way a Christian should minister to the two bisexual women and the one Christian transgender man is the same way they should minister to anyone living in a sinful lifestyle. While the behavior sciences are helpful, they do not exist during Bible times. The behavior sciences can help the Christian relate to his audience since they are a cultural expression of society. This expression refracts through every level of society. The Christian should observe the people and the situation and trust the Holy Spirit to illumine his word and help recall what he has studied in the Bible. Therefore, the Holy Spirit and the word of God are the foundation for all ministry to all people groups with various baggage. There's a slight difference between these two cases. The two women uh, are not sinning sexually, but they still have baggage from living in a world of sin. They are in danger of embracing uh, the, the embrace of the LGBT community. The ch Christian transgender man takes part in that sin, but he wants to know what scripture says about the issue. Romans 1 can help minister to both cases if the Christian remembers Paul wrote Romans to Christians to bring practical reconciliation between the Gentile Christians and the return of Jewish Christians. Paul wrote Romans to minister to sinful lifestyles of his Christian audience by using the unbeliever as an illustration to convict the Christians of sin. Their chief sin was pride in ethnicity because the Gentiles thought they replaced the Jews and the Jewish Christians were still proud of their ethnicity. Romans is not a systematic theology, but it traces the progressive revelation of Paul's biblical theology at work. Romans 1 describes general historical trends of depravity in certain groups. Therefore, Paul did not write Romans as a manual for ministering to unbelieving gays or any other sinful lifestyle the unbelievers are engaging in. If evangelists use scripture not intended for evangelism, they can be guilty of changing the message, laying the wrong emphasis on the message, or having the wrong attitude while sharing the gospel. The section about the women discussed in the foundations of faith, I mean not feminist faith, functions of family, in hopes that Christian would allow for a biblical expansion to include this case as an example of a family. The more aware the Christian is about sociology, the better prepared he can be for evangelism and discipleship. No, a person need not be a sociologist to minister, 
but he needs to recognize the unbelieving world is changing society by describing it from the meta narrative which seeks to swallow Christianity whole. The Christian offers a free grace, biblical theological basis for understanding sociology that can help avoid some ministry abuses. The term bisexual woman indicates sexual orientation, not necessarily sexual activity. So these two women of the same sex seek men of the opposite sex for husbands and are raising a child. So these two women are like sisters. If there is no sex or lust above, there is no sin involved. The church should not focus on the sexual orientation, but on their desire to find godly husbands. When God seeks, sends a godly man to a one woman, that woman would desire to marry him and have a place of their own and a child of her own. She would still love that child and, many, and may still consider it her own. The other wom woman will seek the same. As they seek to apply Genesis 2.24, you know, clinging to each other, leaving uh, a more socially acceptable dynamic will exist. Society's acceptance does not determine whether something is a sin. If the church considers these things, they will not push them into the arms of the GLBTQ community. In this first case, the identity is the issue. The treatment of these two women will contribute to how they view themselves and how they self-identify in society. Christians and non-Christians can still abuse these women, but with the word of God in their lives and the conviction and illumination of the Spirit, they can prove spiritually resilient. The minister is to till the soil so he should season his conversation and conduct with free grace. I identity will be discussed more in the following case. For brevity's sake, this paper will compare the two cases were beneficial. Metaphorically, both cases believe Christ is God and Savior. Both need a reminder of the created creature distinction to show God defines reality. This truth will work to inoculate them against the influence of social constructionism on secular sociology. Since there is an absolute objective moral truth, all constructions cannot be correct. Epistemologically, Christians should remind him that God's word is inspired revelation. Therefore, it is how he can know God's will. Ethically, he can align his beliefs with his behaviors. So as he engages the social political dimension, he can accurately represent Christ. Because of misrepresentation by some Christians, it must be clear that people only go to hell when they never accept Christ's payment for sin. Uh, the basis for salvation is belief on Jesus. See, I used to argue that way. I don't argue that way anymore. But anyway, the basis of salvation is belief on Jesus and what he did for humanity on the cross. Based on the first act of belief, salvation cannot be forfeited. Some Christians think gays go to hell because of that sin, because they confuse belief for behavior. Belief in the right person, object, not behavior saves. Since Romans 1 is not the gospel of salvation from hell, the church message to unbelievers is to believe in Christ. Behavioral issues concern those in the church, and statements made about behavior by the church must not muddle the gospel. The Christian minister to the sinful, those the sinful lifestyles, and those in those sinful lifestyles need not memorize and articulate the jargon of behavioral sciences. But the Christians should unpack their implications. Since humans cannot make up reality, they did not have the approval to change their identity, sexual orientation, or biological sex to something different than what God of the Bible had assigned to them. By teaching them the implications of the fall, they can see how their current disposition results from the fall. Sin affects biology and their soul. So psychology and sociology cannot describe humans as they are and use that to determine what ought to be. Behaviors reveal beliefs about sexual identity and sexual orientation. Both do not always go together. A person chooses how they identify, but orientation relates to attraction. A heterosexual married couple illustrates this correlation. They identify as heterosexual and married. So these two have the orientation for the opposite sex. They still choose not to act on attraction to others. An attraction is not wrong from that perspective, but it is wrong to act on that attraction. I'm talking about in a married, you know, you don't cheat, you know, even in a married. So being attracted to other women in a marriage doesn't mean that you're sinning, but you still have the responsibility to remain faithful, though. By asking a person, but you want to say something? No, I was out because I was thinking about that because like, um, you know, because obviously there, I, I think there's also like a point right because like you're married um, i'm pretty sure you know uh -huh. and so uh i'm not accusing you of, any, of anything but like if you look at like uh, another woman or whatever um like 
uh, or even if you're not even engaging with her, I think at, at some point that that does become sin. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Th but the point is, an attraction has to be acted on. Yeah. So, you know, that's the whole issue. By asking a person whether they're transgender Christian or Christian transgender man, they will reveal their perception of their master identity. So I always tell people, like, if I'm talking to somebody, are you are you a, a black Christian or a Christian black man? You know, and if I'm talking to someone that's Afrocentric or whatever, and that's sort of like what this is saying. Are you a transgender Christian or are you a Christian that's transgender? In other words, I'm trying to find out what their master identity is. The Christian transgender man should place his master identity with Christ and what he did on the cross first and recognize other identity expressions are not as important. For example, this author would say he's a Christian sociologist rather than a sociology student who's a Christian. The goal is to think about what they identify with most. Often pride is present. The solution for sin is for believers to trust him to supply all the solutions needed to live on this earth. The Bible should dictate one's response to an issue. So the person in sinful lifestyles need to know God has heard their expression of belief in him and knows the pain of rejection. God guides and comforts primarily through the Bible. He sent the Holy Spirit to live within them forever when one believed in Jesus. After salvation, he is the illuminator of the inspired revelation of God. Sin is like gravity pulling one down, but with the Holy Spirit, he has a higher ability as rocket science or aerodynamics to overcome the law of gravity. This enablement occurs when Christians are in fellowship with them. False teaching or sin breaks fellowship. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If the Christian confesses sins, Christ is faithful and just to cleanse us from all righteousness. God gave the Holy Spirit so the Christians will grow to spiritual maturity. The Christian has three enemies, the flesh, the world system, and the devil. Flesh relates to biological sex, but something more. The world relates to gender, and the devil wants people to identify more with their sex and gender than with Christ. Humans are more than a biological being or a social animal. They are spiritually created in the image of God. Churches do not always deal with these three enemies correctly. The sin nature in the flesh has resulted in death, and sickness in this world. None of the existed until Adam and Eve sinned. Sin has affected biological makeup and society has the wrong view than what God intended. The devil, used all, the devil uses all this to his advantage. Since the three enemies are the problem, God supplies three solutions. He gave the spirit to overcome the flesh each moment. God gave the Bible to show his intentions for Christian society and he defeated the devil first at the cross. God has given the Christian his word to navigate everything in his life. It is the final authority in the Christian's life. As a misunderstanding of the plan of God leads to misunderstanding among believers, it causes a rebellious response from the world. The world has a choice to reject the true gospel for its content, but the believer's responsibility is to make sure the content is correct and shared in the right attitude. If the Christian does not get it right, the world prosecutes the Christian. God uses it. So he didn't say persecute, it said prosecute. Because that means we, we brought it on ourselves. God uses this process to discipline a Christian and Christians that misrepresent God's word, worse than the hardships they face. See, people think, oh, well, America's judged because of all the transgenderism and all of that. Maybe, if you want to take it that way, maybe the judgment was lordship salvation. What do you think of that? What if the apostasy was lordship salvation and the reaction to that apostasy is from the unbelieving world, primarily all this other stuff? Yeah, that that's probably my theory, like because because I think that the main apostasy was going into legalism and then the yeah. world started becoming more licentious because of the legalism to combat right. it in a way. And then right. that's kind of the judgment on the church, really, because it, now it's surrounding the church. And what would the Antichrist do? He will set up a, wor a world peace, you know, that type of thing. He will look like a hero. He will, he, and and he'll, he'll he'll try to set his order about. Now I was talking about that earlier. Um, but anyway, God uses this process to discipline a Christian and Christians that misrepresent God's word worse than the hardships they face around the world. But the times that ignorance has passed, those who engage in careful Bible study are in a superior position to represent God's word in evangelism and discipleship. Conclusion. Many Christians confuse the gospel about belief and behavior. At the cross, no sin is worse than another, but different sins have different consequences in life 
and eternity. Because of this confusion, people engaged in sinful lifestyles need free grace. And to understand the gist of biblical theology, to apply sociology and ministry properly. Being aware how the sociologists shape the world can help the minister show only God may assign biological sex, sexual orientation, and sexual identity. God only approves a heterosexual marriage, but the two women that seek that, talking about the bisexual women, one hopes they will identify more with Christ and his church than the LGBTQ community. If the Christian transgender man does the same, he will come to his senses. Both the, the women and the man need to understand the implications of their faith and that their identity is in Christ. If, they find, if the women find their identity within Christ, they will continue to seek other Christians rather than the LGBT community. May they find free grace believers. If the Christian transgender man finds that his identity is in Christ rather than the results of the fall, then he will continue to seek other Christians. May he find free grace believers. Free grace can provide any Christian with any baggage with the best opportunity for discipleship. Once these people know they're saved and secure, they can focus on living the spiritual life. The Christian transgender man will have a more difficult time than the Christian uh, bisexual women because he has begun changes to his body. For the individual the student encountered, he began dressing as a woman and was about to take shots. Since they talked in 2017, this person has continued to live in a sinful lifestyle. But this approach reflects a person's choice to identify with a sinful lifestyle rather than Christ and his church. So that person chose to identify. This student does not know the intricacies of ministering to these people living in sinful lifestyles, but it rests in the fact that if a person has believed the gospel, they are safe and eternally secure, no matter their behavior. It is his prayer that these two cases will come to their senses so they will not lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ or experience divine discipline. When facing sinful lifestyles, one has to face himself. Overt sinful lifestyles get all the press, but covert sinful lifestyles that include mental attitude sins and sins of the tongue are listed in the same portion of scripture. May the Christian not live a sinful lifestyle of sin, of self-righteousness, legalism, and poor representation of Christ. With free grace, the greatest potential for that experience is possible. Sinful lifestyles go beyond these two cases. Paul wrote to confront the sinful lifestyles of prideful and self-righteous Christians. These things stand in way of practical reconciliation. A person in a sinful lifestyle has no choice to be born into a world affected by sin, but he can accept the reality of his fallen nature and take upon the provision offered in salvation and for the process of experiential sanctification as the free grace, biblical, theological, sociological approach is applied to him. And that's it. Yeah, that, that was cool. Because I think what happens a lot of the time and with those two cases yeah, if they believe they're eternally secure. But what happens is that, you know, you, you have the flesh and the flesh is uh, molded and adapted by the world rather than renewed by the spirit of their mind, you know. And so what happens a lot of the time is that it, it depends on what you identify with, because the world has created this system of like 72 different genders. And now you can just pick and choose which one you're each day. And yeah, but but watch this. They learned it from the Christian. Let me show you why. Yeah. What denomination are you? Uh, I mean, I'm, I probably most aligned with Baptist. Right. Okay. You don't have a problem. You, you have no problem identifying yourself, right? No. How many times have you heard Christians say, I don't like labels? Uh, Probably more times than I can count. Right. And, 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 and I say that I got it from the Christians, but the reality is they got it from postmodernism because postmodernism, one of the key characteristics of postmodernism is the objection, rejection of labels because they, because their assumption is, is that you can't, uh, there's no absolute truth. There's no objective reality. So what happens is this is Christians don't think they can find a church that is doctrinally correct, that is hermeneutically correct, because in times past, all they did was go to denominations, Baptist, Pentecostal, you know, Assembly of God, and all this. But when you go to these different churches nowadays, you can find different doctrines across. 
And so they're like, well, these, these denominational terms are not working anymore, you know? So we need something else. And so they're like, you know what? Let's just throw labels away. So no one wants to label themselves as anything, you know? And uh, it's it's postmodernism. Yeah. God is the God is the one that labels things in Genesis one. God is the one that assigns Adam Adam the responsibility of labeling the animals. Systematic theology, biblical theology, the chart that is all part of God's mandate from the garden. It's our responsibility to classify things. And if we don't classify things, you know what's going to happen? People are going to make up their own reality, and that's exactly what Romans one's talking about. Yeah. Are they? Are they? They knew God. They were not thankful, and they didn't glorify him as God. So God gave them over, and they started worshiping all those things. That's a horrible paraphrase, but that's the point. That is social constructionism. They're building their identities. Their identity is their idol. You understand? Yeah, I, I get it completely because. Uh, well, at, this was a few years ago. I was in high school and I was focused a lot on politics and Ben Shapiro and and uh, like, you know, I think it's like TPU, something like that. And they were like these uh, conservative uh, guys. I agree with them on, on a lot of issues politically, but like their issues on transgenderism, a lot of it was that people want to not to be unique. A lot of it is just finding an identity within yourself, because if you identify with one thing, you kind of become part of this collective. And, Ooh. you know, in a postmodern society, especially in America, you want to be individualistic in a lot of ways. But that hurts because now you're self-reliant and also you just make up your own reality. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, you know, uh, I, God has shown me great favor through the sociology department. I'm friends with the chair of sociology. I don't agree with that person, but I'm friends with them, you know, and uh, it, it just, it just helped me. And then uh, Dr. Dean, he, in one of his pastor states, we were going through reading books on a, uh, 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 gender assignment, uh, all that stuff, uh, the the sexual, uh, the um, people that had the surgeries, you know, all that stuff. And uh, and then also on, uh, oh, what do you call it? Not liberation theology, uh, social, social justice, that stuff, you know, all that relates to sociology. So I used to get so frustrated sitting in class because I wanted to graduate because it was like, man, it, 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 I felt like, I'm like, you know, it, it just like, it was just, it was vexing to my spirit to hear all that stuff. And I got sick of sociology, you know, um, because I was seeing how it was being used. Because if you think about it, every nurse, every teacher, mm -hmm. almost everyone that goes through college has to at least have one class of sociology, you know. Yeah, I, I actually went through a sociology class when I was taking engineering. Right? Yeah. You know, yep. it was crazy. Yeah. You, you usually have to have at least one class. And that's all it takes, you know. And you are inoculated, inculcated by a whole worldview. And, and what's interesting, sociology is fed, sociology and psychology is fed by anthropology, right? Anthropology is fed by evolutionary theory. A lot of this whole red pill stuff, this Andrew Tate, all this advice are given by Whitman stuff, it seems like, oh, it's conservative. You know, it's getting back to traditional values. No, a lot of it, even some of the good stuff out there, it's assuming evolution theory. And, and um, that's... If you if you believe in evolution, right? Humans were animals at one time. Then what? what, what okay, we're well fine. Who cares if you change change your form? Well, you've been changing your form for millions of years. <laughs> yeah, like because you know if 
you know, you're a transgender, it's just like, well, I mean, you were probably a fish three million years ago. So who cares? Right, and like, right. you know, Andrew Tate, he gets his theories, and there's a lot of like these kinds of guys. Like they get their theories about um like their alpha, sigma, beta. That that's well, first of all, that's a false uh, I know. system made from like this guy who was studying wolves in packs, but that's not actually how they work. And so they yeah. made it to be like, you know, there's different types of males and what women want in a male. And and like the different types of women that don't want different types of males. And so basically they've just created this sexual social hierarchy that really just favors them. And that's entirely based on evolution and it's just anti-Christian. Right. Uh, I, I totally agree. And the, the funny thing about it is, you know, in my sociology classes, we talked about all that, you know? Um, so it's not all bad, you know, but the, the reality, this, the, here's the one that will get you. Check this out. You know who else who assumes the evolution? Uh, well, Spiritual evolution? Yeah. Covenant theology. Well, well now I want to know in what way. Because probably yes, but... When did the church come into existence? Well, for me, it came into existence in Acts 2. Right, but when did they say it came into existence? Um... Well, I don't know exactly. Probably the church is like all believers throughout all time. Technically, right. it came from the covenant of redemption from eternity. Right. Time. Yeah. I mean, that would be logically what they would say. But uh, believe it or not, some covenant theologians would say, oh, it began with Abraham. Or, you know, but logically, you take it back to Adam, right? If Adam was a believer. Yeah. Okay. So what that means is that the church is changing form throughout time oh so it's so it's evolving throughout time for like six thousand yeah. years yeah so you got you got adam right under the covenant the adamic covenant or whatever then you go then you go to noah then you go to abraham then you go to israel right and now israel becomes what we are now and then somehow in the future we're going to become something else yeah, so well well that's weird because then it wouldn't actually end at the church. So the church isn't all believers throughout all time. It's some kind of kingdom that's within your heart or something. Um and then it's gonna evolve into something else uh into eternity. Yeah. So that's so, what. Yeah. Now there's a lot of implications of what I just said, but I'll I'll let, I'll let that rest for now. Yeah. But uh um well guys I I didn't know this is going to turn into a celebration stream, you know, of, uh, but that's what it's kind of turned into, you know, 5,000 subscribers. And how long has this stream been going? Eight hours. Eight hours. Seven that's hours. crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that passage and I'd be exposed. I'm too tired to interact with it, but the word, Kahal in the Hebrew just means congregation or assembly. Ecclesia, the same thing. It's not a technical word. When I'm talking about the church, I'm talking about the metaphorical body of Christ. Um, the church didn't have a head until Christ resurrected. And, and you know, NIFB exposed. The link is there to come in. If you want to debate when the church started, just come in. Okay, but, but uh, if you do that, Peaceful Banana is going to take the lead. Because I'm tired, and I want to see what Peaceful Banana has. You know, he better throw a banana peel or something to get you to strip up or something if he's going to call you out. But but um, if, if you want the answers before the text, in, in Acts 1, G, well, first of all, it goes back to Max U16, when he says, on uh, when he talks to Peter, and Peter asks him, uh, or he asked Peter, like, who do you say that I am? Peter says, uh, you know, some say that you're Elias. Some say that you're John. Uh, and Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And he said, you're the Christ, the son of God. And he's, and then he said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. And then he says, on this rock, I will, I will build my church. That means, and that's a technical term for like a body of believers 
that are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and John 1. And that baptism happened. Uh, he said he was going to happen in Acts 1 when he said many days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Right. So that didn't happen before the cross. And John 7, 38 to 39 says that the Holy Spirit was not yet given in the sense that it wasn't indwelling believers. Right. So you can't make that argument. So I already gave you the answers to the test. If you have refutations for that, just come into the chat because I, I already know. And also the church, the church is not a nation, according to Romans ten nineteen. I know you're going to argue that, too. But yeah. So um, if you take the approach that you just did, I just want to point out this. Yeah. Uh, the, the Matthew passage says, I will build my church, which means future. And the passage you just mentioned, it's in the past. So you have to solve that contradiction. Is it a Wait. contradiction? Wait, uh, which one? In I, I'm talking about NIFB exposed. So what? He, he's quoting a passage to say that the church existed in the Old Testament. But you yeah. just quoted a passage to say that the church didn't exist because it was future. Yeah. So what is it that that word? Yeah, it's like you said, it's not a, in the Old Testament, that concept of a body of the body, uh, of Christ, body of God. And St. Ambrose doesn't impress me. He got his hermeneutics wrong. And uh you probably would agree. I bet you don't agree with all the church fathers and stuff, uh, all the history and everything. There's probably a breakdown somewhere. They 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 were getting interpretation wrong in the first century, so they're definitely going to get it wrong after that. Yeah, you know. And if you're talking about that word church, it, it just means congregation, you right. know. And you, and you go into the original Hebrew, that's really what it meant. You, we uh -huh. and we see this mystery in Daniel nine, where it's kind of like in the parentheses, where he cut, he's cut off from his people. He makes an end to sin, and and he establishes a kingdom of everlasting righteousness. That kingdom is postponed for now. It was offered in uh, the beginning of Matthew, ended in Matthew twelve, and in between that is what we call the church age, two thousand years, right? So it's kind of like a parentheses. That's why it's called the mystery. Do you believe Melchizedek was Jesus Christ? No, no, I don't. I don't, I, I don't believe he was pre-incarnate. It was. It was making a comparison. Pre-incarnate Christ occurs in the Old Testament, but I don't believe Melchizedek one is. No. Yeah, but there, but there are similarities because Melchizedek has no past. Uh, he has no father or history we know of, and it also says. I forget where exactly I could look it up that his goings are from everlasting. This is talking about. No, Jesus. no, that's Micah 5 2. Oh, yeah, Micah 5 2, that his goings are from everlasting. Right. So, so, so Genesis 18 isn't Jesus either. Yeah. I didn't. No, that's not what I was saying. If you're talking about the Lord and the two other people, no, I believe that that is the pre incarnate Christ there. But I don't believe that Melchizedek is the pre incarnate Christ. The reason we believe Genesis 18 is that because the word Lord is used in all caps, that, uh, if I remember right, and the two angels walked on and, and, and the Lord was still talking to him. So that's the reason we make that decision. Yeah, and Genesis 19 says that the Lord rained fire from the Lord out of heavens. So, I mean, you know, if you want, you know, I, I don't know if you're doing a Trinity debate, but that's the perfect verse to prove that Jesus is God and that there's a Trinity um, from the Old Testament, even, um, you know. Okay, good. Yeah, we're in agreement. Yeah, I, I just, um, I've examined it uh, in years past about Melchizedek. You know, the Jews believe that uh, Melchizedek was Shem. Um, uh, hey, Simon. Hey, Simon. Uh, uh, well, well, I think Praise I Am would win for the longest streams, but uh, just we're just gentle. Hey, we got blessed with Brandon coming in here, and then uh, yeah, I, we we've gone all over the place tonight. Yeah, and then but it's started, uh, it's all came together though. It's kind of amazing. It's providential, yeah. I'd say, because. Uh, 
Praise the I Am was talking about the reprobate doctrine. Um, and we heavily disagree with that. We don't believe that future behavior proves or disproves salvation, anything like that. So then we, you know, went into this whole essay that he created about people living in sinful lifestyles and how to minister to them using free grace theology. Um, and, you know, how to disciple them, evangelize them, all that stuff. And, oh, I don't have a setup to join the, well, I mean, do you have a computer or a phone, good working phone? I mean, if you can't join, you can't join, you know, that that's fine. Well, I, I appreciate you being around. Uh, 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 and I'll be exposed. He, he'll engage with some of these other guys, you know, that in some of the comments and, uh, even though I, I wish he was a dispensationalist, you know, still, I appreciate what he's doing. What? Wait, what's his um, soteriological position? I don't know. I really don't know yet. But I see from his engagement with other people, he knows how to challenge them. Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're a good challenge in IFB. I love sharpening iron. Um because I want to get out bad arguments so that I can make the good arguments better. Um, you know, and, and that's my argument for why the church didn't exist in the Old Testament. And if you have anything to counter that, um, feel free, probably in the, in the comments of uh, this video that's going to go out. And and yeah, but I probably got to leave soon. But uh, it was I'm I'm fixing to land the plane too. I'm I'm exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank y'all guys. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Brandon. Some theology. Thank you for hanging out, even though we don't agree on everything. Yeah. Are you? You're welcome. Uh, I yeah. I still wanted to talk offline if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, meet me in Discord. I'll, I'll message you. I mean, we'll, I'll, I'll connect with you there. I'll do it right now. All right. God bless, guys. God bless. Right. Bless. Just check out more content.